on implementation of genomics and clinical practice, lessons from the inherited disorders. She is Dr. Aisha Abid from uh, the National, from the Sin Institute of Urology and Transplant. She is currently as a, working as an associate professor and has a PhD from the Karachi University. She has a very impressive portfolio, which will take a very long time. So I'll just summarize that she has done, she has over 15 years of experience and she has done remarkable work on the genetic uh, the causes of uh, the retinal disorders as well as her work involves um, retinal dystrophies as well as uh, the transplant, uh, something to do with the transplant. Okay, I'm not an expert there. So uh, I invite you, and she is also uh, actively involved in uh, many research uh, projects uh, internationally as well as nationally. And she is uh, a key a per -per person in uh, supervising and advocating for the undergraduate and the postgraduate students. Dr. Aisha, over to you. Assalamu alaikum all and a very good morning. Uh, it's good to be a part of uh, this great event and I'm research excuse me uh the implications of their research uh, in social ethical and legal aspects of acquiring and in understanding the human genome sequence so uh, uh uh, after the agp we came to know that a human genome uh, reveals uh, an individual's uh, ancestral lineage, which is a function of a migration and interbreeding among populations. So we also uh, learned that there is uh, no gene for uh, race in human genome. But uh, these uh, ancestral lineages that emerge uh, because, of the, uh, because of the presence of these uh, uh, millions of variations in the human genome throughout the uh, 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 genome that arise through uh, independent mutational events during human evolution. So uh, right after the Human Genome Project, several other uh, population-based uh, projects were uh, launched like uh, HapMap projects and Thousand Genome and, and now there are a whole list of projects that have been uh, 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 analyzing the genomes. And the main aim was to, uh, to, to uh, see the haplotype blocks of common and uh, rare single nucleotide variants and structural variants in different human populations that have uh, uh, their influence in the causing human diseases. Their aim is to understand how genetic variations contribute to health and the disease. <coughs> so this leads to the uh, introduction of of, of genomics, 
a whole uh, new uh, field of uh, science into mainstream health care that is set up to provide new diagnosis, uh, prognosis, and treatments uh, forming that are forming the foundation of very personalized medicine. This uh, genomic revolution is critical to the personalization of healthcare, the prediction of disease, and the, uh, and the prevention of disease. Okay, what do these uh, variations do? Uh, actually, uh, when we uh, talk about these millions of variations, there are certain variations uh, who have uh, has a, a larger effect size and their uh, pathogenicity criteria uh, is that they have 100% uh, penetrance. So when we talk about these variants, uh, they usually uh, uh, cause monogenic diseases and they have uh, very negligible uh, frequencies in rest of the general populations. But, uh, and there is a direct relationship between the prevalence of uh, these variations and the pathogenicity uh, towards the uh, causing a disease. As uh, the disease, uh, as the uh, allele frequency of these uh, uh, variants increases, their uh, pathogenicity it decreases and their effect size also decreases. And they became the basically, basically they became the risk factors uh, that are uh, associated with certain common and complex diseases like diabetes and uh, hypertension, etc. So after uh, a couple of years of uh, uh, genomic analysis and genetic screening studies, uh, we came to know the, that majority of studies of genetic association with the disease have been performed in European populations. They are uh, basically uh, have uh, European ancestries. Uh, those uh, contributions were of uh, uh, European ancestries. This bias has important implications for the risk prediction uh, of disease across global population. For instance, uh, as clear in this uh, picture, you can see that uh, by the mid-2021, uh, uh, more than 80% of uh, the contribution uh, towards the genomic uh, association studies was uh, uh, the, the, the ancestry of uh, European individuals. Although uh, they, they, now they try to uh, diversify the genetic association studies and uh, are trying to incorporate or accommodate other uh, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic populations as well as uh, we can uh, appreciate uh, the, the, the contribution is rising uh, uh, towards the uh, different uh, disease, uh, different uh, ethnic populations like East Asians they are creating their own uh, genomic association studies uh, by, by sequencing their own genomes. So we have to basically diversify uh, uh, these <coughs> association studies. It's not working, is it? Okay. So the lack of this uh, ethnic diversity in human genomic studies means that our ability to translate genetic research into clinical practice or public health policy may be dangerously incomplete. For example, attempts to use uh, the estimates of genetic risk from European-based studies in non-European uh, like ourselves in, in, may result in an accurate assessment of risk and lack of interventions in understudied populations. So in, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> soon we realized that uh, the association studies that were carried out in uh, European populations were failed to replicate when we tried to uh, see the, the same association in other populations. So there, then we tried to, uh, I'll give you a few examples where we, uh, see that uh, the association studies are basically population specific and we need to uh, do some association studies for our specific populations. It's not working, please. Okay. There is an example of uh, uh, the uh, 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 deletion variation in um, MYBPC3 cardiac myosin 
protein uh, which is uh, found in uh, basically subcontinent in Indian subcontinent, it has a prevalence of 4 to 5 percent allele frequency in general population in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and to some extent to, uh, to Indonesia and Malaysia. And the studies shows that this variant increases the risk of cardiomyopathies uh, in the carriers of this variant, this 25 base pair deletion variant, uh, by 5 to 6 fold. And this uh, variant is not uh, identified in any other population. Another, another example is the uh, variant haplotype in apolipoprotein, which is uh, uh, known to be associated with kidney disease in African uh, Americans. As you can see that this uh, uh, variant uh, rose in the um, Western Africa uh, after the selection pressure against the trypanosomal infection, but uh, the, the association studies uh, say that it has uh, the association or, or uh, risk association with kidney diseases, hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases only in uh, African Americans. So when we talk about uh, the monogenic diseases, again we have a different architecture, uh, 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 different from the uh, rest of the uh, European, mostly European populations, and we have certain uh, genes and uh, variations or disease-causing uh, pathogenic variations. We call them mutation uh, that are uh, that are population-specific, ethnic-specific, or most probably uh, they have found an effect in our population. Uh, these uh, these uh, basically founder effects are, uh, are as a result of uh, bottleneck uh, effect in genetics in populations when uh, populations are confined to uh, uh, to uh, isolated uh, geographical regions. But here in this case, in our population, in uh, practice of uh, thousands of years of consanguinity uh, made us to have uh, homozygous variants in uh, pathogenic homozygous variants in frequently um, in our uh, ethnic populations. So this, uh, this homozygosity of uh, pathogenic variants uh, provide very uh, good opportunities to, to see the uh, disease causing mutations in our population and we have done, we have, uh, I, I, I mean the research uh, teams in Pakistan, several research teams in Pakistan, uh, have done uh, tremendous jobs in the identification of these disease-causing genes uh, for mon mon monogenic diseases. For instance, uh, several research teams have worked on the uh, hereditary hearing loss, several uh, new genetic mutations and uh, genes uh, uh, have been reported uh, from Pakistan, uh, again, same uh, goes to retinitis pigmentosa, uh, some certain skin diseases. We have done uh, tremendous work in this regard. Uh, and we have found uh, certain variations and certain genes that are only specific to our uh, population. For instance, uh, this uh, GJB2 gene uh, is uh, mainly identified in Pakistani population and a variant is a frequent variant or prevalent variant or recurrent variant is identified in more than 50 percent of our uh, patient population. Similarly, uh, uh, deletion mutation in LIPH gene is identified in uh, more than 50 percent of our patient population. There is an, another example where we uh, uh, see the comparison of disease-associated mutations and disease-associated genes uh, in uh, other world population uh, as compared to Pakistan. There is a whole list of uh, uh, mu genes that are uh, known to cause, uh, frequently cause uh, early onset nephrotic syndrome in, in children. So uh, according to the literature, it is reported that all of these genes uh, uh, have a allele frequency of more than 
in early onset uh, nephrotic syndrome. But uh, this data belongs to European population. Uh, when we do our analysis and we, when we compare our data with other uh, populations, we see a very low prevalence of these uh, specific genes in our population as well as uh, China, Japan, and uh, Korea also reported the same prevalence. Even the African reported that they have not any uh, disease-causing mutations in uh, NPHS1 and NPHS2 gene specifically. So uh, either we talk about uh, monogenic diseases or uh, multifactorial or common diseases where we have uh, uh, our own uh, basically genetic architecture and own uh, disease genes and mutations that we uh, have, we, we are sharing with certain other populations. So when we talk about uh, the inherited conditions, what are the challenges uh, we are facing? Uh, so despite the shreds of evidence for diagnostic utility of genetic testing uh, in clinical practice, it is not used as diagnostic means in routine uh, uh, clinics in our country. These, uh, there are um, listed some of the barriers that we are, uh, in uh, we are having in incorporation of genetic testing in routine uh, medicine. Uh, one is genetically li limited uh, literacy among the general population as well as uh, the medical fraternity. We are, uh, the, the interpretation of identified uh, genetic variants is uh, another challenging task that we uh, uh, need to uh, see. Uh, lack, of, lack of perceived benefits, uh, for instance, carrier screening and uh, reproductive options, what we have uh, or what we can offer. Need of genetic counseling, we need to have uh, proper channels for genetic counselors. And incidental finding are uh, again uh, challenging for uh, whole exome and whole genome sequencing. So there, here is the model uh, uh, how we can implement uh, the current genotic, genomic technologies in routine clinical practice. Uh, we have uh, NGS data, okay, fine, and we uh, this data coupled with clinical data, we need. Uh, uh, I would reiterate uh, that we need uh, exact, accurate clinical diagnosis to interpret and to relate the uh, or associate the uh, the uh, NGS variant identification to uh, certain disease. Too. So this uh, NGS data coupled with clinical data can be used as a source to guide and monitor personalized treatment, prognosis, and surveillance in patients and, uh, and of course, uh, family members' extended uh, career screening can be used in uh, counseling. So what are the modalities that we can uh, offer uh, for, from genetics to genomics uh, to, to the clinic? There, uh, we can uh, uh, perform single gene sequencing, uh, but in cases of, uh, since the, there is a great genetic and allelic heterogeneity exists uh, in the disease uh, genes, so we, we usually perform small panel or even large panel sequencing to uh, uh, get the disease genes uh, or the uh, causative mutations. If uh, our disease genes are not identified through these known uh, uh, gene screening, we can have whole genome and whole e exome sequencing. Uh, these, uh, this, these modalities, whole genome and exome sequencing, they have um, uh, extra depth to the uh, clinical diagnosis. For instance, uh, we can identify uh, the structural, large structural variants and uh, copy number variants uh, through this uh, uh, whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Uh, the challenge is data analysis, uh, especially in case of whole exome and genome sequencing, we have a huge amount of data that we need to analyze properly. So uh, here is... Um, a uh, model of uh, disease where we uh, do uh, clinical uh, massively parallel sequencing for uh, management of uh, patients. It's primary hyperoxaluria. It's a rare uh, heterogeneous uh, disorder of glycolate metabolism 
and uh, it is classified into three types, type 1, 2, and 3, uh, caused by mutations in three different genes. Uh, and uh, basically, this molecular classification is important for uh, patient management since uh, clinical criteria are not very specific when we talk about the three types, and management is uh, slightly different for each uh, type of uh, primary hyperoxaluria. In majority of the cases, diagnosis was made only after renal transplant rejection. It's an, uh, another problem. Uh, late diagnosis and uh, uh, no diagnosis is another problem. So we basically carried out this mutation analysis of uh, these genes. We established uh, as a molecular diagnostic tool. Uh, and soon uh, when we acquire uh, NGS in our lab, we, we, we shifted to uh, the NGS for NGS amplicon sequencing for uh, the molecular diagnosis of this gene, the three genes. So here is an overview of what we do. Uh, we have basically uh, sequenced or uh, screened a large cohort of patients. Uh, besides uh, Oxal uh, Europe group, they are, they are uh, big consortia in, in stone diseases, Oxal Europe and uh, rare kidney stone consortium, which mainly composed of European populations. Uh, this is the largest uh, cohort uh, from this part of the world, from Asian side. So what we do, we uh, collect uh, patient samples uh, with clinical presentation. We try to acquire as uh, many clinical uh, uh, information as possible. We perform genetic analysis, we do uh, variant analysis, and uh, uh, genotype phenotype correlation, then we, uh, uh, results are uh, back to the clinic for, for, for uh, the uh, patient management. So what we identified, uh, the pathogenic variants uh, were uh, found in 30% of our cases. Can I have one, one or two minutes, one please? Minute. <laughs> okay. So we, we perform uh, NGS, but before NGS, we uh, do simple RFLP analysis uh, to, to reduce the cost of NGS analysis of our samples. Uh, this RFLP analysis is performed for recurrent uh, mutations that are uh, highly prevalent in our population. So, and uh, we do uh, variant analysis uh, for, those, uh, for those variants that are novel in our population. We have to uh, perform uh, their validation. There we, have, we check population allele frequency. We, we, we do some family, familial segregation analysis if it's uh, going with the, uh, with the disease phenotype and some functional bio or in silico analysis. And we uh, report them back to the clinic. So I would skip that. So here is the model uh, where we uh, implement those uh, genetic results in uh, routine clinical practice. We have four types of uh, uh, patients uh, after the molecular diagnosis. There, there are pH negative. It's a lar large proportion of patients. Uh, uh, they are basically a candidate for um, another screening for large panel screening or exome and uh, uh, genome sequencing. PH1 positive patients, basically they are uh, qualified as the candidate for combined liver kidney transplantation because only kidney alone transplantation is not recommended because of the recurrence of disease in such cases. Uh, PH2 positive cases are candidates for kidney alone transplantation. Um, and PH3 positive cases. Uh, there is not any report of uh, transplantation in PH3 positive cases in the literature, but we perform uh, uh, kidney alone transplantation in, in a uh, case of PH3 positive individual, and uh, this guy is uh, doing fine uh, with uh, three, I guess three to four year of follow up. So uh, we report uh, this. Uh, uh, patient with uh, PH3 positive and kidney transplant, successful kidney transplantation. Obviously, we need to have uh, donor testing since uh, we are doing liver kidney, uh, living related kidney uh, transplantation, so we need to have uh, donors 
uh, without the mutation. Can we, can we wrap it up? Sorry, down, okay, please? fine. Okay. That's it. I, I, I stop here. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. Um, I'm sorry, we are actually running a little over time, and I would request all the speakers to please be mindful of the time. Uh, if you can focus on the right side of your, the top of the screen, there is a timer uh, prompting you the time, so that will help you in the time management. And with that, I invite the next uh, speaker of today's, who is uh, Dr. Zishan Ansar, and uh, he is the uh, assistant professor and the section head of molecular pathology at the Department of uh, Pathology in Al Khan University. And he will be talking about the prudent use of uh, molecular diagnostics in, in heme oncology. Dr. Zikshan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bushra, and good morning, everyone. I hope I will be on time. <laughs> so I will be discuss the whole molecular uh, diagnostics. Okay. Okay. So I'll discuss the concept of molecular diagnostic, the functional knowledge. Uh, I'll discuss specific assays and the future of technologies in molecular diagnostics. But I will not discuss every essay and I will not create you the expert of molecular heme pathologist or molecular diagnostic and I will start with the you know the history of different discovery in molecular diagnostic is a 20 decades history it start from Mendelians uh, then PCR and the revolution I think it start from the 2000 the genome projects and then uh, different platform of sequencing it's like uh, Apple and Samsung you know the competition and then why we need to do these uh, diagnostic testing at genetic level because we we need to know the information of diagnostic we need to know the the prognification information we we need to know the predictive marker and we need to follow these marker as a residual disease and we we need to classify their disease and characterize the disease and that's how we we, we follow the course of the disease uh, so first of all I like to discuss the few technologies and then sorry oh. okay so I'll start with the karyotype. It's a beginning. It's a whole genome test. Uh, we need live cells, but the metaphase arrest is very important. Uh, resolution at the megabase, and it's usually not useful for the solid tumor, but useful for the you know the liquid tumor like uh, the bone marrows of myeloid neoplasm, and if you have. Uh, you know the high resolution you can easily pick the abnormalities and but if you will discuss the fish it's a specific target sorry it's moving very fast sorry ye thoda sa mujhe piche kyun nahi ho raha ye aur aage ja raha Okay. Next, you then be Next. Okay. Okay. So in fish, we are targeting through a specific probe of a specific area of the chromosome. So and we have a different probes, which is fluorescent bind probes. There are the enumerated probe through which we count the number of chromosome or the target we want. We have a fusion probe where we 
are targeting the translocation between the two genetic material or the two chromosome. We have a bigger part probe where the multiple partner with the one driver gene we pick easily. So these are the basically probe name. We, we have a whole genome, local specific. In clinical services, we use uh, the local specific enumerated and the centromeric probe usually. In PCR, again, it's a very sensitive test. Uh, it only for the specific region, we can quantify that region, but the limitation is that we have a limited multiplex. So this is how the molecular, you know, diagnostic tools is evolved from who means the chromosome and they exist uh, as, a, as a land of, uh, or the, as an earth to the area where we are living, like the whole genome is a globe, then the specific target is a streets and the, the area where we are living in the, in the, you know, in the region is our DNA is sequence. So they have a different sensitivity, uh, depend what we need to uh, analyze. Uh, I'll not discuss this one in detail. Then the Sanger sequencing uh, is, is a sequencing, but the, the, the limitation of Sanger sequencing that uh, we cannot sequence the long reads, so it's a small read or small region. And in, in germline you can, uh, or the in constitutional, is not a problem, but uh, while you need to sequence any new plastic or clonal, uh, you know, uh, specimen, you should have the uh, at least 20 or more than 10 percent celerity uh, to to pick the variant. So in 2000, uh, you know, one and uh, now the in the era is the long sequencing and the NGS and the other future diagnostic plans. So we now have the NGS, the third generation sequencing and uh, the deep machine learning, which is, uh, you know, the new future of diagnostics. So the, in NGS, we have the long reads uh, we don't have like Sanger sequencing the specific region to sequence uh, and it gave us, you know, a uh, chance to analyze the big genes. So I'm not discussing detail. I think you all know what we can do in sequencing the whole genome, exome, targeted, but ideally in clinical setting, the diagnostic setting, we use to have the targeted panels mostly and this is how the NGS basically is uh, compared with the other tools. It is scalable, uh, you can sequence the large, uh, you know, the long reads, more sensitive uh, and, you know, you can detect the novel variant. So this is the one slide which I choose myself that any tool you want, you know, if it is, you know, the fast uh, and uh, is like a restaurant. So if you want it fast, uh, so it could be uh, expensive if, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, if it is a good condition, you know, the good outcome you need. But if you need a cheap, so then, uh, and you need a fast result, then, then you know, the outcome will be, the, you know, not good. So this is how they are, you know, uh, preparing or the establishing the tools. So uh, especially the sequencing, <coughs> the, the results not immediately present, it takes time to prepare the <coughs> and this, uh, the specimen and then run and then analyzes. 
So we have a different application on NGS. You can do the whole genome, whole exome. There is a panel of different genes. And then you can also use for the copy number and sometime the complex clonality, you, you use the NGS. And there is a comparison about these tools or the platform we use. So, so in cost-wise, the whole genome and the whole exome is expensive. Uh, the sensitivity-wise, these uh, mutational panel is more sensitive because we have a specific targets to pick easily. The coverage, definitely the, the whole and the exon and genome sequencing. But you can, uh, you know, uh, follow up as a um, uh, minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease by these targeted panels. Uh, as as a, you know, as Dr. Aisha already discussed about the constitutional or germline, we can sequence the long uh, or the big gene like CFTR for cystic fibrosis and the other panels uh, for the constitutional disease and the heredity uh, cancer panel like BRCA and associated heredity cancer syndrome. Uh, for for somatic or the tumor associated gene, so you can pick the novel uh, gene in the, you know, uh, these tumor. Uh, you can uh, pick the actionable mutation. You can uh, use it, the diagnosis and prognosis, and you can establish the different gene panel. There is a comparison between the Sanger and the uh, uh, NGS. So definitely, uh, the the uh, the long reads you can pick with the NGS. Very con uh, you know quantitative, highly complex, faster, uh, and analyze uh, its analysis is more automated than the uh, the manual by Sanger. So this is another very you know important uh, the sample. Sample is always, uh, you know, problem for pathologists. So we have the nucleic acid uh, for NGS and uh, for karyotype, we have the, the specimen and we process uh, these, sorry. Okay. So we have a two type of uh, specimen. One is the liquid and one is the solid for uh, these tools. Uh, the important thing about the tumor especially, that we need the cellular area of the tumor. We, we don't need the collide, uh, the non-cellular area of the tumor to have a good result. So this is very important uh, for everyone, especially the interventionist and the histopathologist, that, and I think, I think we, we should establish the one thing that for the molecular testing, we need this specific isolated block other than the histopathology and the histopathology marker. We don't need, you know, and we don't need to wait. The histopathology report will come and then we, 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 we report after their sectioning or the dissectioning processing. So this is another, so the cellularity uh, is very important and their percentage is very important for especially the solid tumor. And similarly, uh, for the hematological tumor, if you have the more uh, nucleated cells uh, the, and the cellularity is high, you have, uh, you know, uh, you don't have a problem to analyze or run the test. Uh, but if you have the low cellularity, hypocellular tube means uh, specimen, then there is a, you know, problem to process the, and that's why if, if this is, uh, you know, I pick because of, if the clonality or the mutation uh, percentage is high, you can easily uh, pick, but if the percentage of mutation or clonality is less, then, then, then you need the depth of reads. So third generation, I think 
with the time we will know what happened in the these diagnostic i will not discuss this but i will discuss the guideline there is a lot of literature but the best i think uh, still you know, i found the the combination of cap asco and the amp uh, you know uh, paper which i think published in 2015 and they 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 basically classify these variant especially for somatic the the pathogenic <coughs> uh the vus and the benign and they found, means they classify the tier uh, tier 1 which is fda approved more established prognostic and uh, you know diagnostic significance the tier 2 is potential diagnostic and the prognostic is significant and the tier 3 uh, which is for variant of unknown significance where the literature is not that much supported for the variant similarly if you compare at the constitutional versus somatic you will have more you know information about the the therapeutic and the prognostic value of the variant and this is how we we should uh, you know interpret and uh, you know uh, put in the report the gene name its transcript id the position of change Uh, at protein or DNA level, and the valley, uh, variant allele frequency and the SNP, uh, you know. So these these you know uh, all component is very important to know for physician. It's all information for therapeutics and the uh, and the prognosis of the disease. The, there is a general limitation, like first of all. <coughs> you need to have uh, establish a new lab for the ngs uh, the small uh, batch size is not cost effective uh, you need a special person is special staff which have the computer and the biological science background and the technically you you can miss the the, the large deletion uh, on ngs the large copy number or other structural variant can be missed and uh, there is uh, some time you need to repeat the sequence uh, during analysis uh, there is uh, the new uh, you know uh, things the circulating cells circulating tumor dna so it is not established yet especially for for the bone and the cns tumor but uh, there is uh, establishing you know uh, to means the kit available for the lung breast and the colon cancer they are doing uh, you know uh, circulating tumor cells is but but the problem is the heterogeneity and the variation between the uh, the baseline and the you know the follow up uh, changes within the both circulating and the uh, tissue uh, results of the mutations so that's why you know still we don't clear that the all tumor shed their dna into the blood uh, with the appreciating amount uh, the discovered mutation is not necessary it come from the tumor interest the resistant mutation is not present in the subset and the tissue uh, testing seems like to be remain the first line although there is a great possibilities for the liquid biopsy for surveillance so in conclusion the hematological <coughs> neoplasm is genetically heterogeneous disease it's a more complex disease molecular testing is important for accurate diagnosis prognosis and it has potential uh, for the therapeutic targets and gs testing is changing the paradigm for molecular testing in these patient and with the time it should be possible for to apply ngs for routine diagnostic thank you So in the end, oh, I like to thank my all, you know, and acknowledge my all uh, colleagues, seniors, and the staff of molecular pathology at U. S. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sishan. That was wonderful, and thank you for being on time. And Thank you for being on time, and uh, that was great. Uh, and uh, with that, I think we will take the questions at the end of the three talks. Uh, rather, we also have a pre-paper. 
Next, I invite my colleague, Dr. Salman Kirmani, who is a clinical geneticist and uh, is heading a clinical geneticist and a pediatric endocrinologist, and he is the chair for the Division of Women and Child Health at Dal Khan University, Karachi. He is, will be talking about uh, more on the NGS reporting and the clinical implementations, uh, the ground realities. Dr. Salman. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone and thank you so much uh, for being here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting us uh, uh, to this talk. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, it begins with the patients and ends with the patients. So uh, we're so glad that uh, the Pakistan Association of Pathologists have invited uh, three clinicians uh, to, you know, be part of this uh, process and we really truly appreciate that. Uh, so it's a hard act to follow. I think Dr. Aisha Abid really gave us a wonderful, wonderful insight on the journey of, uh, you know, molecular medicine from its outset. And then Dr. Zishan uh, filled that in very nicely with how specific genetic technologies have, have evolved over time. So I'm going to try and round that up with, uh, you know, really bringing it all back to the patients, to the clinic, and how we can fill in the gaps and how we can make the life easier for the molecular pathologist by connecting everything back to the clinic. I think the difference between a good lab and a great lab is the communication it has with its clinicians. So uh, with that, I have no financial disclosures, no conflicts of interest. Uh, and, and really, I'm going to try to outline, number one, you know, to, to help uh, from the laboratory as point of view, what's the right test? I think there is a responsibility that the laboratory has, that when a sample comes in and a test has been ordered, to at least have some double checking up front, has the right test been ordered? Uh, and then obviously the interpretation, which is a uh, back and forth between the clinician and the uh, uh, lab. Uh, and then you know, in the end, the goal being to present useful information to clinicians and patients. So I'll begin with a case and this is a, a, a young female who started having walking difficulties since her teenage years and, you know, multiple neurological evaluations showed that there was a sensory and motor polyneuropathy. Uh, on clinical examination, there was clearly ataxia, nystagmus or coordination disorder and, you know, imaging studies showed demyelination. Uh, this was a progressive course, the patient was getting worse and here's the family pedigree uh, that shows you uh, that this is a consanguineous family, uh, the parents were second cousins, and this is the only occurrence in the family so far. So the possibility that this, this disorder in this young person is genetic is, is, is quite high given the constellation of symptoms, and I'm, I know all of you are already thinking of a, of a differential diagnosis. So, you know, as clinicians, in addition to that, you know, our, our question is what's the inheritance pattern? You know, is this autosomal dominant? Is this autosomal recessive? Could this be X-linked? Although this is a female, unlikely, you know, or could this just be a sporadic occurrence? We don't know. So I think when you ask that question, what's the best test, you have to bring it back to say, well, what's the molecular mechanism of the disease that you're thinking? And it becomes very challenging when it's just not just one disease, but multiple diseases that are on the list. So when you talk about this, you know, sort of a hereditary ataxia type of presentation, you have a whole slew of molecular mechanisms that could be at play. You could have nucleotide repeat expansions, you could have single nucleotide variants, you know, missense variants, nonsense variants, etc. You could have copy number variants, so, you know, deletions or duplications, even small insertions, deletions could do this. You could have variants in non-coding regions, even mitochondrial DNA variants will present like this. Uh, so, the big problem is that all of this variation is on the background of multiple genes and you've got more than 500 genes uh, to look at. So then the question becomes even more tough. What is the best test to do? Well, what are your choices? So you could go with PCR-based you know, nucleotide repeat expansion and although technically this is one of the most simplest tests available out there, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, not a single clinical lab in Pakistan offers nucleotide repeat expansion testing for any disorder. And, and you know, that's unfortunate. Sanger-based single gene sequencing is obviously possible, but how will you do it for 500 genes? Just not cost effective. Uh, you could go for a SNP-based chromosome microarray, and that will answer your question about copy number variants, but not about, you know, uh, single nucleotide variants or uh, nucleotide repeat expansions. 
The NGS panels could be used and you could certainly design a panel that could cover the 500 genes. The problem would be it would miss the nucleotide repeat expansions and it would miss a number of the intronic variants. You could go for whole exome sequencing, but the same limitations would apply. You could go, you know, you would still miss the intronic variants and the nucleotide repeat expansions for obvious reasons. Uh, and obviously you'd have to do separate mitochondrial DNA sequencing if that was on the list. And then finally, when all else fails, you go for WGS, right? That, that's really at least currently the be all and end all, although probably there will be something that trumps this as well. So whole genome sequencing is what we decided to do, and this was outsourced to a clinical lab in Germany. And you can see the result on the screen. The patient did turn out to have a you know, trinucleotide repeat expansion in the frataxin gene. This is Friedrich's ataxia, which is probably for the uh, you know, experienced clinician the number one disorder on the differential diagnosis given that clinical presentation. But the fact that there were so many other possibilities and the cost of clinical whole genome sequencing versus sending out a nucleotide repeat expansion study abroad is actually ironically quite similar. Uh, we decided to go for whole genome and here's the result. If we had gone for an NGS panel somewhere, this would not have been picked up. So, so that's important uh, to, to recognize. So the take home message is that when you've got a differential diagnosis list that spans multiple genes, multiple molecular mechanisms, currently whole genome sequencing is your most cost effective test and this is you know, very rapidly coming into the clinical realm. It used to be purely a research tool but multiple labs in the North America and Europe are offering this clinically and I hope that that revolution makes its way to our part of the world as well and that we start offering uh, uh, things uh, of a similar nature. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about a different case and now this is really where the crosstalk between the clinician and the lab uh, uh, you know, really help solve the problem for the patient. So this was another family that we saw. It was a young uh, baby who had had basically congenital glau glaucoma and was rapidly losing vision uh, in one eye, had already lost in, in the other eye. She was born to consanguineous parents, as you can see. And in addition to her, there were multiple other family members who were affected with the same phenotype. Uh, so clearly, we knew this was a genetic disorder, and based on the fact <laughs> that, you know, it seemed to be that these were unaffected parents, although in one uh, uh, of the parents, as you can see, uh, there was a parent affected as well, and we sometimes do see that in highly consanguineous families, uh, you know, but here at least there was an unaffected sister and an affected sister. We knew we had to, you know, figure out what this was. So we sent an NGS panel, uh, uh, you know, for uh, congenital glaucoma. It was a relatively small panel, but we got one hit but it was a variant of uncertain significance. And if there was one thing that we could make, you know, completely disappear from this world, I wish it was variants of uncertain <laughs> significance, but unfortunately they are here to stay and we have to figure out how to deal with them. Uh, and the more sequencing you do, the more you'll have to deal with them. And in, uh, you know, the, one of the uh, ways we can fix it actually is to sequence more of our population because that is probably the biggest reason we see it, that you know, we, our population is still uncharacterized and we don't have reference data on what's normal. And Dr. Aisha very uh, you know, uh, uh, clearly showed that, that more work needs to be done in our population and her work uh, with her colleagues has certainly shown that. So anyway, how do we sort this out, right? This was a homozygous uh, variant of uncertain significance. So the lab actually, uh, you know, goes through this very organized process and many uh, organizations such as the American College of Medical Genetics has actually laid out criteria of how to establish this, right? So here's the, the uh, you know, variant as you can see in the gene and it's a single nucleotide variant that causes a missense change, uh, changes one amino acid to another. It is homozygous. And we do know that this gene is associated, but again, that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because you only looked at the genes that cause glaucoma, so you know, you're not there yet. So here's how we break it down and here's how the lab report comes out. Here again is the sort of summary. And if you look, it says that the sequence change you know, replaces one amino acid for the other and it talks about you know, one is being as neutral and non-polar and, and, you know, so, so, and the other one, so, so basically the, the structure of the amino acid is a bit different. One is neutral and polar, the other is neutral and non-polar, so you might think it probably could make a change in the protein function. 
variant. How does it, you know, uh, fare in the population? Uh, basically, there is, it is not present, so it's quite an extremely rare variant. Uh, it has also not been reported in disease population, but that again, like I said, for our population variants may still be possible. There are databases out there. We look at ClinVar is one such database, and it does contain an entry, and it's very useful uh, for us to look at ClinVar and to see what details are available. And then there are some in silico analyses, as all of you are aware of, that give some hint. But again, uh, you cannot rely purely on this. You have to put it together with the clinical data. And as you see in this example, it does show that it could disrupt the protein function. So as we look at this in more detail, you know, we know that missense variants uh, have been known to cause this type of disease and your in silico tools are showing a deleterious effect. So you've got some computational and predictive data pointing towards this being pathogenic. It is absent from the healthy population, which is helpful. Again, we don't have our population-specific data, but whatever is out there shows that. So you, so you have that evidence. And it is reported in clinical databases. So there is some precedent of other people seeing this when they've looked at this disease. Uh, and so you've got some evidence there. And then what you need now is a little bit more phenotype-genotype correlation, which in this case, again, seems to fit. And the mode of inheritance also seems to fit with a recessive disorder. Now you have to say, OK, what about the unaffected people in the family? Can we test them to see what's going on there? And that's exactly what we decided to do. And we tested the unaffected sister, and we tested an affected uh, individual. And lo and behold, the variant was segregating with the people with the disease. And the, the person without the disease was only heterozygous for the variant, not homozygous. So again, leading more evidence so if you now put it all together, you've got the segregation data as well. Uh, and, and you know basically, it sort of brings it all together. And it shows you that this variant is likely to be pathogenic. And it's very important. You know, ClinVar is a database that any lab, anywhere, any, even a clinician has uh, uh, you know, access. And you can go up there and upload your, your, your data and tell them what you've seen. I think it's very important to do that. And if you use a clinical lab, then talk to them. They can actually upload that data on your behalf so that they, you know some information that they don't. That then becomes part of an open database that goes all over the world and anyone can see it. That's really the only way to fix this problem. So the take home message here is that res result interpretation cannot be done in isolation. It has to be done in conjunction between the molecular pathologists and the clinicians. And you need to make those appropriate correlations to get the right uh, classification of the variant and bring useful information back uh, to the uh, 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 patient, which is where it's needed more. So I'll stop over here, and I'd like to really thank our lab. Our, our lab colleagues are fantastic. I have learned a tremendous amount uh, from our uh, AKU lab colleagues, and as we uh, attend these conferences and interact more with lab colleagues elsewhere, uh, I'm just uh, really uh, very, very hopeful that I think we're just at the cusp of breaking the bubble of, uh, you know, uh, and really, really uh, hopeful that we will be doing in-house uh, testing and in-house bioinformatics and in-house analysis of this NGS data and really make testing affordable and accessible uh, to everyone in Pakistan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salman, for a very insightful presentation on the clinical application of what we all see in the results in the form of our testing we, which we offer. And now we have the free paper, which is a recorded uh, presentation uh, shared uh, by our, to us by, us, uh, by Dr. Afshin Raza, who has uh, who's from Hamad Medical Corporation, Doha, Qatar, and she has a presentation on, her paper was selected for a pre, pre, free paper on the pretreatment serum profiling of immune checkpoint mediators at predictive biomarkers of response to a known cell, small cell uh, lung cancer patients treated with NTPD1 and PDL1. So long title.
stimulatory receptors that regulate the T cell activity. So if an antigen binds to a stimulatory receptor, it usually causes the T cell activation. But if an antigen binds to an inhibitory receptor, it usually causes T cell suppression. Uh, suppression. And you can see in the picture over here that the red ones are the ones that are inhibitory receptors on the T cells that bind to their ligands. And as a result of which it can either cause suppression or activation. So cancer cells are able to express inhibitory ligands, that is PDL1, that can bind to the co-inhibitory immune checkpoint receptor on the T cell. And as a result of which the immune suppression occurs and the tumor cells can then escape the immune response. To counter this, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are monoclonal antibodies, have been generated. And these basically target and block the interaction of the inhibitory receptors on the T cell, PD1, with the inhibitory ligands being expressed on the tumor cell, the PDL1. And as a result of this monoclonal antibodies interacting with these receptors and ligands, it leads to a higher anti tumor response and, low, and it lowers the tumor immune escape mechanism. So FDA has approved a number of immune checkpoint inhibitors, and but the most common ones are known as anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL-1. However, the response rates to anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 treatment is very low. It's approximately 20 to 40 percent in non-small cell lung cancer. And these patients do not have a very, um, uh, they don't have too many options for treatment because they don't have EGFR or ALK mutations. And that's why immune checkpoint inhibitors were like a paradigm shift in treatment for these patients. So having a low response rate is, uh, is not good for these patients because you're not able to uh, uh, treat them with other types of treatments. So there are a number of factors that have been identified that cause this low response rate. And as you can see in this picture, there are the tumor cell can actually uh, secrete some uh, growth, uh, some factors, some cytokines, some chemokines, or as I said, some immune checkpoint uh, ligands that can lead to tumor immune suppression and uh, sub immune suppression as a result of which the tumor cell can escape. So we don't have many uh, biomarkers that can be used or non-invasive biomarkers that can be used for uh, discriminating responders and non-responders in anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 treatment. So our main aim of, the, uh, of this study was to determine the expression of pre-treatment serum biomarkers as predictors of response in non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1. And the main objective was to look at the differential expression of immune oncology and circulating tumor biomarkers in responders and non-responders, and then correlated with treatment or progression-free survival in patients. So we took serum samples from 31 advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer patients before treatment. And the tre patients were on different treatment types. So 14 patients were on anti-PD-1, three patients on anti-PDL-1, and there were 13 patients who were on a combination treatment with chemoimmunotherapy uh, and chemo and immunotherapy both. We used immune oncology multiplexing kits to see the expression or concentration of serum biomarkers and basically these immune oncology multiplexing kits are targeted towards T cell exhaustion or stimulation markers, natural cell markers, and circulating tumor antigens. As I said, the treat, uh, sample was taken before treatment, so the treatment response in patients was assessed via imaging or PET CT and the clinical picture of the patient and then correlated with the biomarker concentration. So we, as I said, we use the immune oncology checkpoint uh, uh, biomarker kits. So these kits are actually, and then we use the Luminex Bioplex 200 system. So via this system and these kits, we are able to see a number of analytes and test them uh, with a single serum sample. So the, the analytes that were tested were, uh, are shown in this slide. So I'll come to the results now. Because we said earlier that the patients were on different types of treatments, that is anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 monotherapy, and some were on combination chemoimmunotherapy, we, were, we wanted to look at discriminatory biomarkers in these different treatment groups. 
So we took, uh, uh, we were able to see that in anti-PD-1, anti-PDL1 monotherapy group, the immune inhibitory marker serum PD-1 was down-regulated in responders. While an immune suppressive serum biomarkers S108, A9 was significantly upregulated in non responders. So, this also correlates with the clinical picture of the patient and identifies that these are discriminative biomarkers for anti PD1, anti PDL1 monotherapy group. We then compared the serum biomarkers between responders and non responders, irrespective of treatment types. And the objective was to look at generalized biomarkers of immune modulation and treatment response to immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. And we were able to see that in responders, there was a significant down regulation of immune inhibitory biomarkers, that is, serum CD80, serum TIM D4, and CEA. And this, as I said, these correlated with the clinical picture of the patient, so it identifies as the predictive biomarkers. With any biomarker, it is optimal to know the cutoff value of uh, uh, them to discriminate. So we, we did the receiver operator uh, characteristic curve, and we were able to see that an op optimal cutoff value of in CD80, it was 91.7 picogram per ml. In TIMD4, it was 600 picogram per ml. And CEA, it was 1614 picogram per ml, uh, with a sensitivity and specificity of 70 to 80 percent, respectively. We then wanted to see if these cutoff values actually correlate with the progression-free survival of the patient. And for that, we did the Kaplan-Meier log rank analysis. And we were able to see that serum CD80, 90, less than 91.7 picogram per ml, and CEA less than 1614 picogram per ml, significantly associated with better progression-free survival in patients. We did not find any significant uh, association of TIMD4 with progression-free survival. So just a quick recap, the, patient, uh, the markers that we found to be down-regulated in responders were actually more, of all of the these markers are involved in inhibition of T cell activation. And, uh, and because we saw them down-regulated in responding patients uh, and the clinical picture of the patient, we are able to say that these markers can be used as predictive biomarkers and response in patients who are on immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So I would like to conclude that there was a significant downregulation of immune inhibitory serum PD-1 and significant upregulation of immune suppressive S100 A8 E9 in responding and non-responding patients, respectively, indicating that these are discriminatory markers for anti-PD-1, anti-PDL1 treatment. Uh, the generalized biomarkers that are uh, that can be utilized as predictive biomarkers are CD80, CEA, and TIM24 in responders. And the cutoff values of CD80 less than 91.7, CEA1614 picogram per ml is associated with progression free survival in patients. So we will, uh, I would like to conclude that serum-derived non-invasive early biomarkers can discriminate responders from non-responders to help manage treatment in patients who go on immune checkpoint inhibitory therapy in non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afshin. That was really great. And I think uh, we are uh, very on time despite starting 10 minutes late. Um, and uh, I thank all the speakers, uh, including Dr. Afshin from Doha, uh, for wonderful presentations. It was very uh, illuminative and uh, very informative. It started well with the great work that Dr. Aisha has done uh, highlighting. Yeah, and I really loved uh, your title of Genetics is White. Uh, so we really need to add some color of brown to the genetics, and uh, it was uh, uh, nicely concluded by Dr. Uh, Kermani, the importance of uh, the clinical application and giving it a clinical meaning. Um, our lab colleagues, Dr. Zishan, has really um, uh, highlighted the different various tools we have. Um, for various genetic testings, and uh, it was also highlighted by Dr. Salman that the selection of the appropriate test, perhaps with the help of the pathologist, molecular pathologist sitting in the laboratory, can help both the clinicians as well as the patients, and uh, also help us in generating the very needed data. 
So um, I would welcome questions. I think we ha can take a few questions. Yes, doctor. Thank you, sir. I have a question um, to both Dr. Aisha and Dr. Salman, and it's related to the sequencing data that you've generated, and it's absolutely really, really important that we have data from our populations in there. Can you tell us how many um, new variants you yourself have reported? Dr. Aisha, why don't you go ahead? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? We're talking about informing the public databases about genetic variants in our population. So sort of reducing the VUS and adding to reference genome data. So how much have you contributed from your work so far? I think it'd be really important to know. So uh, there are certain base databases like Dr. Kermani uh, 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 told you. Uh, like ClinVar and uh, locus specific databases, uh, we have uh, deposited our data in locus specific databases, but not in the ClinVar yet. We are going to definitely deposit our uh, uh, novel variants that, that are uh, basically classified as likely pathogenic and pathogenic in ClinVar, definitely in the near future. That's we really, are, we are, really we are good going to uh, deposit definitely. Uh, thank you so much, Zara, for asking that question. And, you know, the honest answer is that probably 10 percent of the work that we do probably makes it all the way to publication. Uh, the rest is just all private within our own, you know, computers and, and databases. Uh, as we gather more, as you know, the, the bar for publication is also high, right? And we want to publish high-impact uh, publications. So, for example, our breast cancer data is very robust and we've got you know that those publications out there but a lot of the novel variants are for rare diseases or ultra rare diseases where a single case report or you know case series of two or three make it so we've presented them at international meetings but you know most of it still remains hidden from public view uh, and i think uh, for some you know like for cah for example there are international databases that you can deposit your data or be part of in national registries but if i were to be very honest probably less than 10 percent of our work actually makes it there so I think that is uh, a great question and a great reminder for all of us uh, of our work getting published and uh, re re like recorded in a place where we all, not only us, everyone uh, working on this area have access. So uh, I can tell you, Zara, that uh, as you know that I basically work in for the inherited metabolic disorders, so I have published uh, a big cohort of pyotinidase deficiency and I have published a big cohort of over 100 patients of glycogen storage disorders, as well as my work on uh, cobalamin C, which is a complementation defect, and a whole group of over 50 different disorders of LSDs, comprising of over 200 different patients, um, is in progress. Uh, so it, uh, like Salman has said, the problem with publication is that you need to have a big pool one case report or few case reports in the form of case series where you may have only one or two patients with a novel variant does not make through to in the form of publication. I can have uh, the privilege that I, my cohorts are big, so it is easier to get published. Yes. Thank you. Um, Zara, extremely important question. And I think this is why this forum is so important, because what it's doing is it's bringing different institutes together. And what we've seen highlighted from Dr. Aisha's work, work that Salman has been doing, work that Dr. Bushra is doing. So here now is an opportunity for people to come together and to actually make a working group and try and help each other publish this data. Because if you have two cases, Dr. Aisha has two more. This is the idea behind actually having more meetings like this and AMPP being a platform 
for people to develop group, in working groups and collaborations. I have uh, to make a comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a really extremely important discussion uh, about publishing. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Ahmed, uh, CEO of Alpha Genomics Islamabad. Uh, here's a question about publication as well as reporting data for public repositories. For example, if you have big cohorts of studies, if you have funding to study a big number of people, then probably you must publish your data. But if a person himself sends, uh, uh, sends out a sample for sequencing uh, based on the recommendation of the clinicians, then probably that particular data of a patient, uh, that's much more meaningful if it could be reposited in an online repository instead of just waiting for a publication purpose. Because to make it online, to make it available, the data, that's much more important than publishing. Maybe uh, there are some, uh, some, some cases in which you can make a small case study, a case report, and publish in bioarchive, something like that, instead of a peer review publication. But to make it uh, available for common people, that's, I think, much more important than waiting for uh, accumulating good number of samples for a big publication. Thank you. you are absolutely correct, but uh, I'm afraid, uh, sir, for that also we need human resource. Um, neither the people sitting in the laboratory doing the work um, who, are, who know that they are sitting on a you know, like rich data, but they don't have the time or the resources to upload that on such repositories. Same goes for the clinicians. So I believe uh, coming together for such kind of work is the solution which we have at, play, at present. Any more questions or comments? We have a question at the end. <coughs> As um, it, uh, I, I don't know. OK, uh, I'm Dr. Ahmed from Department of Genetics, Karachi University. Um, you might call my comments a question or suggestion. Uh, we have been talking about it that um, uh, our population uh, is not represented well. Uh, we need to uh, gather data from our population. So um, what are we doing about it? Um, at the clinical level, yes, we are doing, but those are just the chunks. What we need is a bigger, bigger pool of data. And I think um, we need uh, someone to step forward to take it seriously. It's not a small project, it's a, it's a larger project. And the uh, second thing is that, yes, at the level of publication, we do suffer because of uh, small sample sizes. But when we talk about collaboration, sugar coatedly, we don't trust each other. We, uh, we, yes, at the forum, we talk about it. Collaboration on the ground, we don't trust. We have um, ethical issues. We don't have professionalism. So we have to work it out as well. Thank you. Please come to the session this evening and tomorrow where we're going to be talking about ethics and we're going to be talking about professionalism so that you get, so th this is why we've put this into the program to actually try and address some of your un uncoat and maybe recoat the, the, that, those layers, okay? Thank you. So do we have any more questions? Uh, yes, Dr. Sir. Thank you. It was a wonderful session. My name is Dr. Zaheb. I am from Dow University of Health Sciences. Well, my question is from you, uh, Dr. Bushra Froze and Dr. Salman Kirmani. Uh, you are from the clinics. You are seeing a lot of patients in the clinic with rare disorders uh, now. So is it the right time to establish our own genomics lab in Pakistan? Can one say? We would really love to have that, but I'm afraid neither Dr. Kirmani nor I am capable of establishing that, what you have suggested. So we have wonderful colleagues here. Uh, sitting in um, what Natasha has said, um, I believe, I think we really need to come together. And I understand the apprehensions which we, all of us have in our hearts. If we don't verbalize it, we have it there. So, uh, but uh, it is possible. Now, FISA is, uh, uh, has worked on a multi-center neuromuscular uh, paper. It is between two provinces, and I'm sure there are more patients in other places too. So it, we have to start from somewhere. So Dr. Saman. So I'll just say that the time was probably about 10 years ago. We're about 10 years behind on where we should have been. And I completely agree with all the comments so far about cooperation 
I think the, the, the only way this will be cost effective for our people is if either this becomes a government funded initiative and heavy subsidization is done not only to buy the machinery but then to run it and to maintain the facility. Uh, you know, uh, or we get some type of research grant uh, and a consortium is established and then that uh, research grant funds the initiation of it and then somehow you come up with a workable model and as the cost of sequencing continues to go down, uh, as new sequencers and new parts of the world are coming into the market, we may be able to establish some partnerships there. Thank you. Just to add that, um, unfortunately, I didn't see many of you in the inaugural session yesterday. We had a fantastic speaker from Genomics England, um, and it was an introduction as to the importance of genomics, population-based genomics, gen genetic epidemiology, and uh, it informed us how much investment the UK government has put into genomics. And uh, it brought to light the diversity in data and the need to have more data from South Asian populations, which in the British South Asian populations, the Pakistani cohorts particularly, have a lot of VUS, they have a lot of uh, unique disorders. And they, she ended with a description of a study where they have got international money to work with uh, Pakistani group on, um, I believe, in neurological disorders. So those kind of things are happening. And I think the take-home message from this morning is that this is really exciting. The more people who are interested, the more people will want to come together and cooperate. So we really need you. Uh, we need your, uh, your excitement, your initiative, because um, that those are steps in the right direction. So try and work with people who are already somewhere along the way and we can do more together. Thank you. Uh, now I would like, uh, before the end of the session, I would like to ask Dr. Zahara and Dr. Asghar to kindly uh, hand over the sheets to the speakers and the chair of the session. Dr. Zahara, Dr. Asghar, please. But please. Dr. Salman Kirmani. Last but not the least, Dr. Zisha Anand, sir. <laughs> Dr. Bushra. Uh, have a break for the tea and uh, hopefully all will gather around 11 to start the uh, session in time. Please process for the tea.
Uh, welcome back here. Our next session is uh, genomics and surveillance. And uh, uh, we have two keynote speakers, Dr. Zahra and Dr. Uh, Masab Umair. And uh, the ch uh, chair of the uh, session is Dr. Saeed Khan. And Dr. Saeed Khan uh, uh, is, uh, is associate professor and head of molecular pathology at Dow University of Health Sciences. Ambassador to Pakistan American Society for Microbiology, American Society for Microbiology, Vice President of Pakistan Biological Safety Association. Dr. Said is also heading the public health lab at uh, Dow University of Health Sciences, which has contributed signific significantly to the surveillance of infectious disease in Sin. May I request Dr. Said to please take the seat of chair and start the session? So we have a good session before uh, tea and after ha having wonderful tea I think we will have even more a better session uh, with a lot of energy. So the first speaker is uh, Dr. Zara Hassan. Uh, she has a long uh, contribution uh, in molecular pathology and molecular biology. Uh, she is professor at Aga Khan University. Uh, she has a vast experience uh, in the field of uh, molecular biology and molecular pathology. She's been working on a uh, host uh, pathogen association. Uh, and she worked a lot on TB. And currently, uh, in the current pandemic of uh, COVID, she performed uh, tremendously well in leading from the front. So without wa wasting further time, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Zara Asan uh, to present her talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. Assalamualaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. 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 one in the audience
Um, so welcome to our session, which is now focusing on molecular diagnostics for infectious diseases. I'm just going to take you through a quick overview of um, the potential capacity we have based on the new diagnostic applications available and how it can really be impactful in the current era. So when we talk about what do we need the molecular diagnostics for with regard to infectious diseases? There's some basic challenges that we face. The first one is we want diagnosis to be rapid. We want to know what's in there, what bugs are in there. Uh, they could be identification of uh, acute or chronic diseases or viruses. When it comes to bacteria, we want information regarding antimicrobial resistance as we know more and more about the impact that um, antimicrobial resistance has in our environment. You know, we know that there's this whole one health process where the resistance travels from the environment to animals to humans. There's a real push to try and understand and quickly diagnose antimicrobial resistance so that appropriate treatments can be given. Um, there's also the awareness now that we have the ability to identify genetic sequences of whole organisms. There is an understanding of how um, we can use that information to inform us. And we know that just as we heard this morning about how not all nucleotide changes in human genomes result in something that is pathogenic, we know that in bacteria also. We have genetic changes that are polymorphisms, that are related to families, lineages, that can be used for speciating. Um, we know that some of those changes result in pathogenic changes, adding resistance when they are linked to antimicrobial resistance genes. But how do we diagnose them? So our first efforts over the past three decades were based on simple target identification through PCR. And you know, in our last conference in 2019, we were still talking about PCR-based diagnostics mostly, but now I'm really happy to see that our focus has expanded beyond that because we realize there's a lot of complexity. Complexity comes from the need, need to identify multiple targets, multiple genes, not just in one organism, but we may want to be able to run multiplexing. Multiplexing so that we can differentiate in one sample when it comes to clinical diagnostics. You may want to identify whether it's a, different, a virus or a bacteria or a parasite. So this has become commonplace. And in routine diagnostics, many of us are already using that the simplest level. For example, you get influenza tests and they are differentiate influenza A, B, H1N1, herpes simplex viruses. You will hear about syndromic panels, that's coming up. So meaning if you have a respiratory syndrome, a neurological panel, these are multiple targets in there for different viruses and bacteria, all trying to improve the efficiency of testing, but they're expensive and they're used for complex testing. I'm not going to go into that. but. I want to focus, I want to use an example. I will use three organisms today to highlight the points I'm trying to make. And one of them is that there's a real need to identify, rapidly identify treatments for diseases that are difficult to treat. So TB is one example where you need six months of four drugs and in that time drug resistance can develop. So it was a game changer when there was a combined test that identified resistance to rifampicin and identified MTB in respiratory sample, that was the gene expert. And that was a game changer. And really, about 10 years ago, we thought that this TB expert would reduce the MDR cases and rolling out TB expert globally would reduce TB burdens in countries like Pakistan. This has not worked so well. And the TB in the pandemic, we have seen that the cases have gone from a lot and, and mortality went up to 1.5 million from TB. One of the reasons that it's difficult to treat TB is because the drugs work at different parts of the bacterial um, genome, its cell wall, 
they uh, you know, affect gyrases. And we know that each of these drug targets can mutate because the TB genome changes. It was first sequenced in 1998, and at that time, it was the first pathogen genome that was really important. And again, we thought that all the answers would be in that. But 25 years later, we're still trying to understand it. But what we do now moving forward is that there is a need to look at multiple targets. So it's because now we know that it's not enough to look at one gene. We know that many drugs are, are, are required for that treatment. We know that many sequences need to be analyzed for each for example, new drug, bedaculin, for example, I'm jumping to new drugs. New drugs are really hard to come by, especially in TB. Bedaculin was thought to be the drug treatment for MDR-TB, and that would solve all the problem of MDR-TB. We have seen in Pakistan that we have bedaculin resistance in naive patients that have not received bedaculin resistance. So there is a lot of drug selection pressure. There are uh, mutations in genes conferring resistance. And we are now moving towards identification, the need of identification of these mutating targets or these relevant SNPs as early as possible in order to guide treatment better. So um, over the last couple of years, the WHO has now first put together um, MDR-TB mutation database, collecting data from all over the world because like humans, bacterial lineages also vary. So a lot of SNPs had to be related to how many of them are really robust. How can you um, reliably use sequence information to predict drug resistance? This question has not been solved, but all of us working together add information through our studies when we match the genotype-phenotype comparisons. Um, in our workshops on Thursday, we introduce tools, bioinformatics tools, and I bring that up here because it's important for us, even if we're not doing our own sequencing, it's important to understand the power of those tools. Information is available online. Um, databases like ReSeq TB, um, allow you to put data into software tools like FIRES that will actually give you a list of the drug targets that can predict mutations. Um, machine learning is very important because in a lot of cases, the software that's available will I allow you to identify resistance based on known targets. But there is a lot of learning available, so there needs to be more and more focus in the bio bioinformatics space in machine learning for young people who are interested in setting up new algorithms to predict resistance based on sequence variations. Um, I put across an example related to MDR um, typhoid. Now, typhoid is an, a very old disease, and in 2016, we had an outbreak that started in Hyderabad. Uh, it was identified by the AKU clinical lab as in the first extensively drug-resistant isolate. And sequencing of the genome informed us about the type of the isolate, which is the H58 isolate. It was linked to a Bangladeshi strain. And more importantly, it, it told us what kind of genes were present, both in the chromosome and in the plasmids that were conferring resistance. So this was a beta-lactamase conferring plasmid gene. It was Q, um, the, uh, the QNR-S um, gene was present in the chromosome, conferring fluoroclinolone resistance. And we had the BLA-CTXM15 in the um, plasmid. And this was likely transferred from an E. coli species. So now learnings like that really inform us about the kind of transference that can be about mutations and um, genes that can jump from one species to another. This kind of information is important because it informs us about new and emerging drug resistance. It gives us about cross-species genetic exchange and public health guidance can be given based on the kind of in, uh, information we can gain. 
if we know what the sequence information is based on circulating pathogens. And this is applicable, for example, um, in many cases, they are new molecular mechanisms. So the in, we, we did a study on Klebsiella. In Klebsiella, there was drug resistance to cholestin that was not related to the common MCR gene. Um, but in this case, it was likely because of a lipid biosynthesis pathway where the ARA A gene was, um, was mutated. So there are many examples in which whole genome sequencing of pathogens can really guide treatment. They can tell us about circulating strains and they can also um, now be aided through metagenomics. Okay, so metagenomics is the study where you can look at multiple organisms in a sample at the same time. And it's particularly important for studying environmental samples. Information like this will help us guide on identification of new pathways that may be targets for development of new drugs. Okay, I'm going to use SARS-CoV-2 as an example in the last few minutes to just say that now over the last couple of years, our lab has contributed to both diagnostics and also provided information on the kind of strains circulating in the population. It is through bacterial genomics that we established our NGS pipelines and then our teams here, you will hear about them in more detail, have allowed us to inform on variants in the population to inform the public health response. Many of us have worked on COVID here. And I'm going to use a couple of cases to explain the kind of information we can provide. So when the variants um, first started at the beginning of um, January 2021, the alpha variants, we were able to do a couple of things. We did um, studies and samples from travelers, and it was showed that the evolutionary analysis that can be done using um, sequence data from viral genomes can be linked back to populations and it allows you, it forms you about transmission rates in the population. We had one case in this study where the person had a strain that matched a strain from Bahrain and then we went back and we looked at their flight data and that person had been in transit in Bahrain. So, you know, how interesting is that? It can inform on introductions, how, how viruses can be introduced into populations and tells you about their transmission. Um, Another thing we did was we followed um, viruses over, over two years and we saw how the variants moved from alpha to delta to beta through the different waves of the COVID pandemic. Um, phylogenetic analysis allows us to study the changes over time. These, as you'll see today in our uh, talks later, will tell us about mutation rates in the population. They will tell us about associations as to how does the virus stabilize, how does it change, and how does it adapt to the period. So there is an enormous amount of information that we can gain by whole genome sequencing of pathogens. And it is up to all of you in the room to try and really maximize your efforts. A lot of the information is public. GISAID has thousands of strains available. And these are from different species. The software is available. So you can ask really important research questions even if you do not have the ability to do sequencing in your own labs, and we need that, because not everybody can do sequencing here in Pakistan because of resource limitations, but I think that it's important to ask the right questions. The information is out there. So the way forward really is, while we develop laboratory capacity, the available genome data can help us ask informed questions to study disease transmission, to inform on outbreak investigations, you know, and if we have this information, we can save our resources and sequence really important pathogens. What we have shown through the pandemic is it's not important to sequence everything, but if you want to monitor, for example, we, once we identified alpha variants, we used a PCR-based approach to follow it 
to track it, for contact tracing. So there are a huge amount of opportunities to study, uh, to use NGS as a starter tool, and then to build using the bioinformatics and computational um, teams uh, and really build those teams. So we're happy to speak to people who may want to work in this space. I want to thank our Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, our section of molecular pathology, our, um, our researchers here, Asghar Nasir, Ali Raza, Javeria, Najia, Kiran, um, Maliha, we're all here, and, and our funders who have over the years helped support us with grants that we have used to put together uh, first the training for pathogen sequencing for bacterial genomes and now for a virus study. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much Dr. Zara for sharing uh, interesting information regarding the role of molecular pathology and surveillance and diagnosis of pathogens. Uh, we will move to the next session. We will take questions at the end of the session for save time. Uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Masa Bomer. Uh, from National Institute of Health, uh, Islamabad. Uh, I think we have recorded presentation uh, for him because he is not available here in Karachi. So he, he will be sharing information regarding how to use the NGS and genome, genomic surveillance of virus, uh, viral diseases. So please uh, play the presentation. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum to all. I am Masab Umair. I'm working as senior scientific officer at NIH Islamabad. Uh, before I start with my presentation, I would like to apologize for not being able to attend the conference. Uh, I will give a very brief overview of how we have used NGS uh, for genomic surveillance of different viruses at NIH. So uh, we use uh, next generation sequencing uh, during the first wave of COVID-19 uh, in Pakistan. And uh, using that, we were able to detect uh, G614, uh, G614 variant uh, from the country. Uh, this is basically uh, the first variant of SARS-CoV-2 that was uh, initially detected and that had uh, the, uh, the higher transmissibility characteristic. Uh, G614 was uh, uh, basically first identified in, uh, back in March 2020. Uh, uh, in Europe and then uh, it later spread to other parts of the country. So uh, genomic sequencing uh, of Pakistani isolate showed that uh, three of the isolate, they belong to 20A clade uh, according to the next strain classification. And these three uh, Pakistani viruses were highly similar to strains from Oman, Slovakia and USA. And uh, the other two Pakistani isolates, they belong to the 19B clade and they were closely uh, associated to strains from India and Oman. So uh, in notably, we found that uh, uh, the 320A strains, they had that D614 mutation in the spike protein uh, that gave the virus that uh, extra uh, transmissibility characteristic. Uh, apart from that, there were three other unique mutations that were detected uh, in, in, the, in the 320A clear isolates. So before March, the D614G was only uh, isolated in 10% of the sequences that were submitted to GSID. But between April and uh, May 2020, uh, almost 80% eight, almost of the sequences that were submitted to GSID had, had this mutation. Uh, okay, another study that we did using the next generation sequencing uh, was to explore uh, the circulating strains during the second wave uh, in Pakistan. Uh, for that, we used the OXO and Nanopore technology and uh, our phylogenetic analysis revealed uh, co-circulation of four different lineages of the virus and the predominant lineage was B11250. Uh, that original, originally ad, uh, was identified in UK and Bangladesh. We also found uh, B1261 and this was initially detected from Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, we also found a, uh, a single case of B1 and B6 lineage. And uh, our phylogenetic analysis showed that these viruses were basically 
uh, had origin from USA and Saudi Arabia. So uh, we have also used uh, NGS for detection of different variants uh, in patients or in travelers that were returning from different parts of the country to Pakistan. So uh, before at the start of the third wave, uh, we screened 78 travelers that uh, were returning from UK to Pakistan. And uh, among these 62 uh, travelers were found positive for SARS-CoV-2. And among the 48 cases, uh, there were 10 cases that had the spike in target failure. So a spike in target failure is basically uh, due to uh, a deletion in the spike gene at position 6970. And this was basically the uh, characteristic mutation or a deletion uh, of alpha variant. And uh, so we used that as a marker to detect uh, B117 or the alpha variant in Pakistan. And, and initially we carried out uh, uh, the whole genome sequencing of the first two alpha variants and uh, we found that they showed 99.9% homology with the UK variant prototype or the alpha variant. And uh, phylogenetic analysis revealed uh, two uh, independent reductions and, and, and our two uh, UK variants, they were uh, highly similar to strains from Luxembourg, Spain, and USA. Uh, we also used uh, a spike gene target failure marker as well as in, in, in combination with partial gene sequencing to detect the alpha variant or the B117 uh, during uh, or before, basically before the third wave in, in Pakistan. So uh, uh, during January, February 2021, uh, we had uh, 2,650 positive SARS-CoV-2 samples, and among which 30% of the cases had that spike gene target failure. So all these cases were further confirmed through partial sequencing, and we found the characteristic mutations of alpha variant, that is the N501Y, A570D, P681H and uh, T716I. Uh, one of the uh, strengths of using uh, spike gene target failure and partial sequencing uh, for us at that time was that we were uh, able to very timely identify the upsurge of, uh, upsurge of alpha variant in Pakistan. So if you look at the graph, uh, you can see that uh, the alpha variant it started increasing uh, in the first week of February, and it, it con continuously increased in the uh, in the coming weeks. So, using this uh, data of our lab, we were able to timely report uh, the increase or a possible surge of COVID-19 in Pakistan. And if you look at the third wave, basically it started uh, in the first week of March. So. Our lab data using the spike in target failure and partial sequencing showed that uh, showed at least three weeks uh, before the start of the third wave that uh, the, the, the alpha variant is increasing in Pakistan. And, and phylogenetic analysis of this alpha variant showed homology with strains from uh, reported from different European countries. We also carried out whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 during the third wave. So uh, between May and June 2021, uh, we selected 2,562 positive samples. And again, uh, we found uh, spike gene target failure in 12.7% of the cases. But here in this study, our aim was not to uh, sequence or explore the genomic diversity of alpha variant, but we were more uh, concerned with what else is circulating in Pakistan. So we selected a subset of samples from uh, the non-SGTF uh, cases. And among that, we found uh, the dominance of beta variant, which, is, uh, which, was, which, which was basically at that time a variant of concern. And it was detected in 46% of the uh, cases. Similarly, delta variant and gamma variant were detected in uh, during that study. Uh, we, we found that the Beta variant cases were mainly from, from Karachi and Islamabad, 
whereas the delta variant cases uh, in this study were mainly from Islamabad followed by Rawalpindi and AJK. And uh, the stains that were sequenced uh, during this study, they showed high homology with stains from uh, Asia, Europe and North America. Uh, we have also carried out uh, genomic uh, uh, surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 during the fifth wave of the pandemic using the NGS. And as we all know that fifth wave was caused, uh, sorry, this is about the fourth wave. So uh, as we all know that the fourth wave uh, was caused by the Delta variant in, in Pakistan. So we selected uh, 140 samples and we subjected them to NGS. And among these, 97% uh, of the cases were Delta. We also found uh, three cases of Alpha and one case of Beta variant. Uh, among the Delta sublineages, uh, the predominant sublineage was AY108, uh, followed by AY43 uh, and AY127 and AY125. Uh, most of these cases, most of these Delta cases were reported from Islamabad. Uh, followed by Karachi and Rawalpindi. And uh, phylogenetic analysis of these Delta variant uh, showed uh, introductions from different countries such as Singapore, United Kingdom and Germany. And uh, this is about the fifth wave. So uh, we, we, uh, we have carried out uh, uh, genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 during the fifth wave as well. And, and as we all know that the fifth wave in Pakistan uh, was caused by Omicron. Uh, so our sequencing results showed that uh, the fifth wave was basically initiated by the Omicron subvariant uh, BA.1. And, and, and it was however uh, replaced by BA.2 uh, during the mid, mid, mid part of the fifth wave. And uh, Islamabad was basically uh, the, the city where highest number of BA2 cases were reported as compared to BA1. And uh, phylogenetic analysis of these two subvariants showed uh, homology uh, with strains reported uh, globally from different countries. So one other thing that we, we, we made sure that we uh, follow was to share uh, the data of our genomic surveillance uh, with the relevant authorities uh, and at relevant platforms. So uh, we have been sharing uh, genomic surveillance data of SARS-CoV-2 with the Ministry of uh, National Health Services Regulations and Coordination, with NCOC, with WHO and other stakeholders. And we have also uploaded all the genetic data on GSAID. Uh, we are maintaining a next gen build that is uh, maintained by Department of Virology. And we, we also uh, have uh, compiled the genomic surveillance data in form of situation reports. And we, we publish it on uh, the NIH website uh, after every two weeks. Uh, and, and in case of any unique findings, we, we, we have written different preprints and uh, we have also published our findings in, in, in the form of research articles. So this is uh, just uh, um, how our situation report looks like. Uh, basically it contains uh, genomic surveillance data of SARS-CoV-2 from the whole country and as I mentioned uh, it's, it's available at NIH website and anyone can get, access it. Uh, this is the next train bill uh, that is maintained by our department. Okay, uh, apart from uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, we have also used next generation sequencing uh, for characterization and for uh, basically genomic surveillance of other pathogens such as dengue, uh, CCHF and some other viral gastroenteritis uh, viruses. So um, uh, what we did uh, between uh, during the 2022 outbreak of dengue, uh, we, we were able to sequence eight uh, Deng2 uh, viruses from Pakistan and our whole genome sequencing data showed that all these Deng2 viruses uh, clustered into the cosmopolitan lineage uh, and genotype 2. Uh, and as we all know uh, as that cosmopolitan lineage is, is also uh, the common lineage found in Asia and Pakistan. 
Uh, our cases are DEN2 sequences. They showed a 97% amino acid similarity with DEN2 viruses that were reported uh, from Pakistan during 2009 and 2013. Uh, however, since 2013, uh, whole genome sequence data of DEN2 uh, is not available from Pakistan. So we were not able to compare our viruses uh, with those. Uh. So we, we also have used uh, whole genome sequencing uh, to uh, to explore the genomic diversity of Crimean Kongo hemorrhagic fever viruses from Pakistan. Uh, previously, uh, studies are available on the genetic diversity of CCHA viruses from Pakistan. However, uh, all these studies were basically uh, they were based on partial sequencing of the small segment. So we, we uh, using the NGS, we were able to sequence all the three segments of the virus. And our, uh, genomic, our whole genome sequencing result showed that uh, the three isolates uh, that we, we detected belong to the Asia 1 uh, genotype. And, and they were highly similar to uh, CCHA viruses that were reported from the neighboring countries, India, Iran, and Afghanistan. Uh, interestingly, we, uh, we found a resorted resort, uh, uh, virus uh, that had uh, Asia 1, Africa 2, and Asia 1 genotype of, uh, uh, of small, uh, medium, and L segment. So, uh, 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 to my knowledge, I think, I think uh, this is the first uh, uh, resortment uh, virus. Uh, that uh, has thank you, Masaf, for sharing the interesting uh, genomic surveillance data. We are running short of time, so we will move to the next uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Bilal Ahmad Khan. Uh, he will be presenting uh, his research uh, on novel mutation in chikungunya virus, which affecting the replicative fitness. So over to Bilal Ahmad Khan. Okay. So today we are going to talk uh, about a novel mutation that we have identified during the Chikungunya outbreak in Pakistan. So basically, chikungunya virus is an alpha virus that belongs to the toga viridae family, and it, it was first identified in 1952 from Tanzania. And the virus, uh, this virus also has classical febrile illness symptom, including the fever, back pain, polyarthralgia, headache, nausea, and vomiting. So basically, it's 11.8 uh, KB single-stranded positive sense RNA virus that has three structural proteins, a core protein, and four non-structural proteins. Phylogenetically, this virus has been uh, classified into three genotypes, uh, that it's ECSA, Asian, and West African, since uh, its emergence. So the viral genome encodes surface protein E1 and E2. And these proteins are inserted into the viral envelope and fo uh, form the outer protein of the virus. E1 is basically a fusion protein and E2 is an attachment protein. And mutation in these proteins alter the virus replication. And these proteins are also, also serve as a target for the humoral immune response and drug development. Since uh, re-emergence in 2002, uh, the chikungunya have become a global public health concern and it has caused uh, several epidemics of severe magnitudes. It has also re-emerged in the Indian region after 32 years and several point mutations in these structural proteins were proved to be the main drivers of these severe epidemics. In Pakistan, we have uh, seen the first outbreak of chikungunya virus in December 2016, uh, in which uh, there were like more than 30,000 cases were reported based on the clinical symptoms, which were, uh, and a couple of thousands were also confirmed based on the PCR investigation. So however, there was one study reported back from back in 1980s in Pakistan that has identified some anti-chikungunya antibody in rodents and Human sera, however, uh, 
uh, we have not reported any uh, confirmed case before that. So the outbreak was expanded by mid-27 to the rest of country and cases declined by the end of 2017. But uh, there were only very limited data available on the molecular characteristics of the chikungunya strain from Pakistan. So this study was aimed to identify and characterize the mutation in the E1 envelope protein from Karachi and reconstruct the phylogeny to determine the possible inception of this outbreak in Pakistan. Uh, so basically we have collected around 32 positive chikungunya positive PCR positive samples from Department of Molecular Pathology, Dow University of Health Science, uh, RNA was extracted, then cDNA was synthesized and E1 was amplified by PCR and which is then sequenced by using the big determination method. So I will discuss rest of the methodology with the results. So when we compare our sequences with the S27 prototype sequence, we have uh, found that uh, there were like 12 substitution in comparison with the S27 protein, uh, but uh, only seven of them were unique in this study. And interestingly, as these were the sample from the late outbreak of Pakistan, we have uh, particularly found one mutation uh, that at the position 407, that is M407i, which is more than half of the samples, which were not reported from the samples during the early outbreaks. We have also done the phylogenetic analysis uh, by using the Bayesian phylogenetic method for that we have downloaded 270 sequence from the globe based on different geographical locations and time frame. And the uh, phylogenetic reconstruction showed us that these uh, strains belong to the ECSA, IOL lineage of the chikungunya virus, uh, which, is, uh, which may be evolved from uh, the ancestral strain that has caused the uh, Indian chikungunya outbreak of the Delhi in early 2016. So next we were interested in characterizing the mutation that we have found in more than half of the samples. Uh, for that we, we have used a wild type chikungunya plasmid that is SL07 and we have uh, cloned this particular mutation in this plasmid by using site directed mutagenesis the plasmid were linearized and electrophoreted into the Vero CCL81 cells. After that uh, incubation of uh, two days, the mutant virus were rec recovered from the culture and then the RNA was extracted and Senga sequenced to confirm the mutation in the uh, recovered clone virus uh, that we and this electrophorogram shows that uh, we, have, we were able to successfully clone this mutation in the wild type virus. And then we have titrated this virus which were found to be 2 log 6 uh, that were enough for doing the further studies. So next we want to assess the replicative fitness of this particular mutation in comparison with the wild type because we were interested in assessing if this mutation has uh, gives virus any replicative an advantage over the wild type virus. So we mix the wild type virus with the uh, mutant virus in the ratio of 1 is to 1 and then use a 0.1 MOI to infect the Vero cells and the AG2 cells, which is the cell line for um, Aedes aegypti, and the C636 uh, six cells, that is the cell line for the Aedes albopictus cell line. So, Bilal, you have the last minute to finish. Yeah. There. So, these cells, uh, after infection of these cells, we have recovered, uh, we have collected the viral sample after three days, and then Senga sequences, sequenced it. So this is one of the established method for doing the virus competition assay in which uh, after the infection we uh, collect the stock culture and sequence it. So at the uh, site of the mutation it should show uh, the double peak in almost equal 
concern, uh, at the equal length, that will indicate that the, the mutant virus and the wild type virus is in equal, is in equal concentration during the infection. And after three days, we again collect the sample and Sanger sequence it and then measure the peak height. So the please relative... Conclude. Please conclude. Yeah. Okay. So our results showed that after the computation assay that the, this mutation has replicative fitness advantage in Vero cells and in AAG2 cells in comparison with the C6 and 36 cells. So the conclusion was that the phylogeny reveals that this, this outbreak was caused by the IOL strain of the chikungunya virus and this study also find that this particular mutation has replicative advantage in comparison with the wild type, at least in the cell lines that really need to be confirmed in the, by doing the in vivo studies in the mosquito or the animal uh, models. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bilal. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Maria Zahid. Uh, she will be presenting uh, subgenomic analysis of HIV-1 in Pakistan, which uh, revealing the new uh, circulating recombinant form. Maria, please restrict to seven minutes your presentation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon to everyone. Um, can you show the slides? My topic for today's presentation is subgenomic analysis reveals emergence of new circulating recombinant forms of HIV in Pakistan. HIV uh, belongs to a retrovirality family with a single standard positive sense RNA virus and uh, causes acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It has three ma uh, the, ma uh, the whole gen the genome of uh, HIV uh, is uh, uh, up to 9.7 KB with three major uh, genes, GAC, pole, and envelope and several other proteins. If you look into the prevalence of HIV, HIV has become one of the world's deadliest virus and uh, claiming more than 25 million deaths over the past three decades. United Nations programs of HIV and AIDS reported that 38.4 million people are living with the AIDS across the globe, whereas 65,000 people died with the HIV-related illness and 1.5 million people acquired HIV at the end of 2021. If you look into the prevalence of HIV in Pakistan, 0.21 million people are estimated to be living with HIV. More than 53,000 people are registered with a National AIDS Control Program, and only 32,000 people are receiving treatment, according to National, uh, Pakistan AIDS Control Program. HIV has two types, HIV-1 and HIV-2, whereas HIV-1 has uh, HIV M, uh, N and OP, whereas uh, type M is further divided into s several uh, subtypes and uh, circulating recombinant forms and unique recombinant forms. These circulating and unique recombinant forms are circulated among the, around the world and uh, we can see that subtype B and subtype A are more prevalent around the globe. In Pakistan, HIV-1 subtype A seen to be more prevalent among IDUs, infection drug use, injection drug users. However, HIV-1 epidemic in Pakistan is still considered to be in its early stage, as during the last two decades, HIV-1 epidemic is mounting in high-risk groups, increasingly engaged in high-risk activities. Antiretroviral therapy is uh, given for the uh, patient to treat with the uh, uh, for HIV, and it has five major classes, nucleoside reverse, uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse tra transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, integ and integrase inhibitors, and protease inhibitors. These combination of drugs are given for the first line of the, for the treatment of uh, HIV. But the virus can develop resistance against these medicines due to spontaneous muta muta uh, mutations in the HIV genome and can cause antiretroviral therapy to become ineffective. Worldwide, antiretroviral therapy has reduced the morbidity and mortality with HIV. However, increasing drug resistance is increase, limiting the treatment option. These mutations renders the antiretroviral drugs to become ineffective. Now, updated data is therefore uh, necessary for the, to study the pattern of resistance and sensitivity of virus against the drug being administered. So the objective of the study is to detect HIV subtypes using gene sequencing to analyze the genomic mutations in pole gene, 
to investigate the HIV drug resistant pattern using bioinformatic tool and to undertake the phylogenetic analysis for geographic linkages of Pakistani HIV strains. For that, we have taken uh, the samples from molecular pathology section of Dow Diagnostic and Research Lab, followed by RNA and viral uh, DNA extraction. RNA extraction was uh, further uh, uh, used for the quantification, whereas DNA extraction was done for the amplification of whole gene, and uh, sequences were, sequencing uh, was performed, and sequences were aligned for genetic analysis and followed by the mutation analysis and Shen and entropic analysis. Coming towards the results of the study, uh, our demographic profile shows that the age group of 20 to 30 percent was uh, highest, whereas the majority were male and married. Uh, uh, the, quanti uh, the quantification of 70% uh, of the patients were done, and 2% uh, egg growth gel was showing the to nine, uh, 941 base pair product of the uh, HIV samples. If we look into the genetic diversity of HIV, phylogenetic analysis reveals that when we have compared the sample R sequences uh, with the already referenced sequences available on the database, subtype A1 was seen to be more common, whereas other subtypes like uh, circulating recombinant form 2AG, 11CPX, 35AD, and 10CD was also observed among the population, study population. Our uh, geographic linkages showed that majority of the sequences uh, from our study population were uh, clustering with Uganda and South Africa, and many other were also from other, uh, other uh, regions of Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look into the antiretroviral drug resistant mutation, majority of the patients were showing an NNRDI resistant mutation with major mutation of E138L and uh, uh, other were showing the high level, low level, intermediate resistant among the population. Drug resistant mutation showing the, uh, for the NRDI drugs showed that two of the uh, groups from the NR, two of the drugs from NRTI drugs are showing high level of resistance, whereas two of the other drugs from NNRTI are also showing the high level resistance. We have also observed very, uh, various uh, minor mutations. The genomic variability shows that the uh, few of the sequence regions showing the high genomic uh, variability uh, when we have performed the entropy. Coming toward the conclusion, as uh, subtype A is predominant in Pakistan, however, there were several other subtypes that are emerging to be prevalent in the country, such as subtype B and subtype 01AE. Our, uh, our study showed that there were few emerging subtypes that are now being reported in the last two years that uh, and becoming more prevalent, like sub CRF11, CPX10, CD, and 35AD. The study also suggests that these new subtypes are circulating in the country or might be due to uh, infected personnel of HIV are traveling around the country and uh, involving in high risk activities. Due to change in the pattern of diversity and selective pressure, the virus has evolved itself that result increase in the drug resistant mutation. The ART is now causing high level resistant, uh, resistant and the patients are with no, with no effect. We have reported major mutations along with a few mu minor mutations that may cause uh, distinct changes in the pattern of drug resistance. Recently, our lab has got the mobile lab, uh, mobile BSL2 lab that is functioning in uh, remote areas of SIN and providing the facilities uh, at the uh, flood uh, and COVID sections. I think sections. we have finished the time. So thank you, Maria, thank for you, sharing the uh, results regarding HIV sequences in Pakistan. Uh, we have to move to the next presentation by Elvina Zehra from AQU. She will be presenting on molecular investigation of dengue-like illness resulted in detection of dengue and Zika virus. Elvina Zehra. Please uh, keep in mind you have seven minutes to finish the presentation.
So this is uh, Dr. Elvina Zahra working as a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Aga Khan University in Department of Pediatrics and Child Health. Today I will be talk talking briefly about the dengue-like illness that we witnessed in November 2021. In November 2021, um, there were uh, reports, multiple reports of a mysterious virus spreading throughout Karachi uh, that was causing dengue-like symptoms in people. And the people, when uh, they were tested for a viral antigen or antibody against dengue, they tested negative. Different speculations were made at that point. Uh, this uh, this uh, causative agent being called a novel or new variant of dengue, or sometimes it was thought that it could be some other arboviruses, or it could be simply false positive, uh, false negative cases of dengue itself. On the main uh, lookout were uh, Zika and chikungunya viruses in uh, other arbovirus category because of the overlapping symptoms of all the three uh, viruses, chikungunya, Zika, and dengue. These three viruses have many commonalities and uh, a couple of differences. Uh, we have seen multiple outbreaks of uh, dengue in Pakistan since 1995. It was first reported in 1995, and uh, since 2010, we have uh, seen multiple outbreaks of this infection. Uh, chikungunya has also caused a massive outbreak in uh, Karachi in 2016 and 2017. Zika, although, has not yet been reported in Pakistan. Uh, but the zero prevalence studies about uh, Zika have uh, reported, have indicated the presence of antibodies against uh, Zika virus in our population. So it can be said that it, uh, this virus may also be around and may have been, uh, the infection may have been going unnoticed. One uh, major uh, commonality between these uh, three viruses is the, they all are vector-borne infections. They all uh, are vector-borne diseases. And uh, the vector is the uh, same for all these three uh, diseases. And that is Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. So whenever there is a massive outbreak of dengue, we should be watchful for, uh, for chikungunya and Zika viruses because they may also get co-transmitted alongside dengue. Uh, we also saw some unknown viral disease cases at Aga Khan Hospital. Uh, so uh, we wanted to have uh, access of more of these um, uh, samples. So first of all, the collaboration was established between Aga Khan University and Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Training Program. And uh, collectively, we were, uh, with our collective efforts, we were able to identify and collect 10 such samples with unknown viral disease. With these samples in hand, uh, we had three priority areas. And number one was to get these samples screened by viral metagenomic sequencing to identify whether actually there was a new causative agent, new virus, or a new variant of dengue. Uh, for that purpose, these samples were, these 10 samples were shipped to University of Washington where viral, met viral metagenomic sequencing analysis was conducted. Uh, our second priority area was to identify PCR-based method that we can use for rapid and accurate detection of uh, not only uh, dengue virus, but also Zika and chikungunya in our lab. For that purpose, uh, literature, extensive literature search was conducted and a ZCD assay was identified, uh, which is a multiplex uh, PCR-based uh, detection method for uh, simultaneous detection of uh, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus. And our third priority area was uh, to collect more such samples to generate a pool of these samples so the, this can be worked out in future. For that purpose, uh, the eligibility criteria uh, and the inclusion-exclusion criteria was uh, similar to that of dengue. Uh, these cases were uh, the patients were included in this study with dengue-like symptoms who had tested negative for a dengue uh, test, whether uh, NS1 rapid antigen test or IgM test. This was a basic workflow uh, that, that in was initiated uh, from a whole bed collection and the viral RNA was extracted from plasma and RT-PCR uh, was uh, performed for identification of dengue and Zika and also uh, for RNA-SP as an internal control. 
Uh, metagenomic sequencing is also part of the work plan, but since it is an ongoing study, it has not been performed on all the samples. Ten samples that we shipped for to University of Washington has been sequenced via metagenomic sequencing, and the rest of the uh, work is to be done in coming months. So we had 30 samples in total uh, that range from 1 to 63 years of age, a male gender predominated, a slightly predominated female gender, and the total days of illness were ranged from 2 to 14 years. Uh, this, uh, and the second, uh, the fourth, uh, pie chart shows the dengue test distribution. Since we collected only the dengue negative test, uh, the majority of the samples of the patients had only NS1 negative detection. However, only 27 per uh, percent cases were such that had both uh, NS1 test and uh, IgM uh, test results available at the time of recruitment in our study. These are the results of uh, dengue detection, dengue virus detection by uh, multiplex PCR. Here you can see that uh, in 57% of our cases, we were able to identify signals for dengue. And in this 57% dengue positive cases, a major pool, about 65% uh, was of uh, of the uh, uh, cases that had a high CT value, and CT value was more than 35, which indicated low viremia. And this was also justified by seeing the days of illness because the active uh, window of dengue detection is uh, normally, ideally, five days and not more than. Uh, Alvina, please conclude. You have the last minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one slide. So uh, the dengue window is uh, not more than, uh, identification window for dengue is not more than seven days. So this can be justified that because we had uh, patients coming in after, uh, after even 10 or 14 days, so the viremia had mainly subsided, but we were still able to detect the virus. One, there was one interesting case where alongside dengue, we were able to identify a very low signal, amplification signal for Zika virus that is indicate, being indicated here. Uh, for further confirmation of it, we ran a uniplex PCR for Zika virus identification. And here you can see the uh, slight peak of Zika virus for confirmation of it to make sure that this is a signal from a specific amplification and not a non-specific amplification, gel electrophoresis was performed. And as you can see here in third lane, uh, our sample of stress interest is uh, giving a faint band as compared to the uh, positive control band. But the position of both bands indicate that the amplification signal was actually the true signal. And we were able to identify uh, Zika virus. However, due to co-infection, uh, it is, it is uh, hypothesized that the viremia of Zika infection was very low. Uh, this is Alvina, we don't have the whole day, so uh, please finish it. Okay, I will just highlight one uh, result here. This, this is a comparison of PCR-based results and metagenomic analysis that was performed on our samples. Uh, the uh, sample number five is our sample of interest. And here, although it was concluded by University of Washington as a dengue case, but some 400 reads were still identified for Zika virus for this particular scenario, which uh, kind of confirms our results that uh, we were also able to identify co-infection in this sample, and these results are being uh, positively attributed from University of Washington. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude this presentation that using real-time PCR, dengue and Zika viruses were identified. And however, due to low viral load, uh, because of co-infection, uh, the confirmation of Zika virus is uh, becoming challenging for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll appreciate if in future you follow the timeline. It's not good if you're not following the time. This cannot be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, we have to move to the next presentation uh, by Dr. Javeri Ashraf. Uh, so substitution spectra of SARS-CoV-2 genome in Pakistan depicting regional prevalence of VOCs. Uh, over to Dr. Javeria. 
You have same seven minutes, please yes. conclude. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Javeria Ashraf from Aga Khan University, and I am here to discuss the substitution spectra of SARS-CoV in Pakistan, and it will show how the prevalence of VOCs are coming in the uh, the years of the SARS-CoV. So uh, the substitution rate was calculated uh, within different regions in 2020. The next clade, uh, the most um, uh, phylogenetic analysis tool worldwide calculated the substitution rate to be 8, eight in to 10 to the power minus 4 globally. But a study was conducted in, a uh, in Africa in 2020 and the rate was between 4.113 into 10 to the power minus 4. A study from Pakistan in 2020 showed that the substitution rate in Pakistan is uh, is 5.68 tens to the power minus 4 and uh, it was uh, due to the substitution rate and the uh, mutation rate was different in different viruses uh, re representing the uh, regions. And then we calculated the entropy which is also uh, playing an important role in the molecular mortality in an important factor for mutation. So the aim of the study was to um, gain inter uh, understanding of the evolutionary patterns of the SARS-CoV genome in Pakistan and we study the, uh, we can discuss the uh, fate of the pandemic by uh, looking at the substitution uh, rates that we can uh, predict that is it going to um, change into a common cold or subside or it is going to become more threatening as it is evolving uh, with the time. So this is the methodology. We first uh, extracted the data from Gisset Hub, which is uh, dedicated for the SARS-CoV, where uh, the data is uh, uh, globally is gathered here. So, but we uh, restricted our study to Pakistan, and we uh, 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 we separated the data of uh, the SARS-CoV from 2020 to August 2022 of SARS-CoV and we separated the data and gathered into three uh, time intervals. First was, was April 20 to uh, December 20, which was showing the first wave of the SARS-CoV. Then, the, uh, then the second interval was from December 20 to December 21. It was covering the second and third, the most threatening waves we encountered in Pakistan. And then the third is from December 21 to August 2022, which was most, mostly focused on the Omicron. So we, fi we, filed the, uh, we followed the auger pipeline um, in which we uh, followed the phylogenetic analysis. We filtered the reserve, our uh, samples of SARS-CoV on the basis of time. And then we aligned the sequences to uh, get the uh, maximum likelihood and, the, the, and then generated the phylogenetic tree. And then we exported the sample, uh, the data into OSPICE for further phylogenetic substitution analysis and the positional entropy exploration. So this is the first time interval which is showing the uh, waves from the April 20 to December 20. There are 71 sequences which were gathered in this time period and these shows the, uh, the most clades which were variants were common at that time was 19A, 20B uh, and so on. And there was a substitution rate of 6.06 .06 10 to the power minus 4 in Pakistan. Then we move towards the bigger group of December 20 to December 21. Here we notice alpha, beta, delta. The most spread was of the delta variant, delta J. And there was a huge uh, substitution rate uh, uh, distribution. That is from 0.4, uh, 10 to the power minus 4, it was moved to minus 3. That there was high uh, mutation, mutation rate in the SARS-CoV of the Pakistani genome. Then we again move towards the December 20 to December uh, the August 2022, and it was basically on the Omicron. Omicron was high in, in, this, in this time, and it was showing a decrease in the mutation rate. That is, it was again moved from 5.02 to uh, raised to power minus 4. This is the brief overview. First interval I discussed, uh, and it was, the, it, it was from 6.6 .6 tens to the power minus 4. Then it moved towards the point 0.3 tens to the power minus 3. And then again to third interval, it was again suppressed. That this, uh, it shows that the virus has evolved uh, uh, in December 20 to December 21, and it was highly uh, mutated. Then the virus is suppressed, and the mutation rates are very low, which can be seen that there is low infectivity and pathogenicity in our uh, Omicron sequences. 
This is the positional entropy. Uh, the positional entropy in the first figure is from the first interval, and it shows on the basis of the genes of the uh, Omicron. That is from ORF, ORF 1A, B, E, S, the, all of the genes of the, uh, uh, the SARS-CoV. There was very low entropy, uh, lower entropy in the first region, but there was higher entropy, and randomness was found in the second B figure. And at the third, on the August, uh, on the third interval, there was uh, a stabilized form of entropy can be seen. This is that higher and more entropy was observed in second interval. And entropy is normalized in third interval. So this is the mean entropy. It is showing the same pattern that there was higher entropy in the second and interval, which was distributed into two further uh, intervals for further exploration. And third is showing there is decrease and normalized entropy. So these are the results, are the main mutational points we have gathered from S, muta S regions. And these mutations were higher. These are uh, the mutation entropy we shown in the position entropy. These were the regions and the mutations positions which were showing higher results in delta and beta. And same is the uh, mutations were observed in uh, Omicron in the third interval, and there was low or no mutation in these rates. So we concluded that higher the value of the entropy, that means there is randomness, and there is more uh, randomness, and the, the, there is higher pathogenicity in the virus. But as we move towards the low values of the entropy, it means that the, uh, the virus is random, is not so much infective or uh, randomly mutating. So we are next uh, considering to uh, look at the viral loads. That higher the viral loads maybe can be uh, related to the higher entropy regions. And the, it can help us in designing the uh, vaccines and, proper, uh, and the proper medication for the virus. So uh, we are studying a correlation between mutation rate and pathogenicity of the virus, which is the second step of the study. We are working on it. And so um, I, have con I am going to conclude on this, that the, there was more uh, uh, mutations were in the spike regions. And it, these mutations are not normalized in the third intervals. So there are potential hotspots are present. And we can look into the S regions and focus on these regions for vaccine development and the, and the further treatment of the disease. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Javeria, for uh, ending in Valentine. Uh, we have to move to next presenter. Uh, that is Dr. Sayed Ali Raza Shah Bukhari. Uh, he will be presenting on epidemiology and demographics of SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant during fifth wave of COVID-19 pandemic in Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I'll start with my presentation. I'll uh, uh, the journey which was uh, started by Dr. Zara and uh, Masab continued it, and uh, he reached till the fourth wave. Uh, so I'll be continued uh, be continuing uh, after that. So my talk and the title of the talk is Epidemiology and Demographics of uh, SARS-CoV-2 Omicron during the fifth COVID wave uh, wave in Pakistan. Moving ahead. So these are the statistics. So globally, till now, there are more than 636 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. Amongst them, uh, more than 6.6 million deaths have been reported so far. Pakistan, uh, the story is same for Pakistan. Though it is not severely impacted, but the impact, a great impact was also um, seen in Pakistan as well. So there are more than 1.5 million cases. And amongst those, the deaths, uh, there are more than, three, there are more than 30,000 deaths so far. So it's an emerging threat. Uh, proper genomic uh, surveillance is required to have a look at what variants are going on uh, in Pakistan at a particular time. So the genomic surveillance efforts were going on uh, from the day, uh, not from the day one, but I must say that uh, from the earlier pandemic. And still, the efforts are going on to see what actually are the cir circulating variants present uh, in Pakistan. So the, uh, the slide shows here that uh, in December 13, 2021, the first Omicron case was uh, reported, confirmed by the sequencing. And after that, uh, um, after maybe two to three weeks after that, we, uh, we could see a considerable spike in the cases 
which was almost equal to the first uh, wave which has occurred in Pakistan, uh, representing that it is actually a big, uh, there is a big concern and we have to be very careful about this, uh, uh, this variant which is coming and especially to know that what actually uh, the variant, circulating variant is present and what are the modalities to limit the spread of uh, viral disease uh, in that context. Okay, so uh, the objective was to identify what actually is the main uh, variant uh, that is causing the fifth wave, uh, that has triggered the fifth wave. For that, the time period was, uh, which we have selected to see, uh, to look at the sequences uh, present at that particular time in Pakistan, was from the December 2021 till the August 2022, because uh, the study when it was initiated, that was a particular a time uh, where we initiated and uh, we, we gathered the data to have a look at that and that's why that time point is set up to August 2022. And to see that whether there is a specific um, correlation or, or an association to investigate an association with a specific uh, gender or age group or a particular region of Pakistan. So that were the main objectives of the study. So. Uh, as I've already said, that uh, since the start of uh, pandemic, we have been sequencing the uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome at Aal Khan University. So we have optimized the protocol for both the Illumina and Oxford Nanopore um, for Oxford Nanopore methodology. So the methodology which we have opted is one of the most widely used. It's an Arctic net uh, network-based protocol. So it amplifies the viral genome into 450 base pair fragments, and so uh, the ideology is because if you have a human sample, the major hindrance in doing the sequencing, if the, your object of interest is uh, much lesser than the uh, uh, much lesser than the human uh, human DNA or RNA. So in that case, you have to enrich or amplify your uh, sample. So uh, using the uh, methodology, we have been able to amplify the COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus and. Uh, loaded the library on either on the Oxford Nanopore or the Illumina platform and have the adequate reads to um, and did the bioinformatic analysis to identify what the faster files and ultimately uh, do the variant analysis and so. Okay, so uh, to have a gross look at the data submitted throughout in Pakistan, we just uh, got some more data from um, Gesaid uh, having the filters. Uh, having the uh, timeline filters and the complete coverage genome so that it's uh, appropriate and we are confident in identifying that what actually are the, uh, with the high confidence that these are actually the strains present. And uh, we also divided uh, our subjects into uh, the data which we have downloaded into two parts, that is the less than 40 and more than 40 to see that whether uh, the age group, younger age group is more affected as compared to the older one. Okay, so uh, here it shows that uh, usually this was a trend which we observed throughout, that Sindh was the first province to witness the spike in cases as compared to the other, um, other provinces. So here it shows that Sindh, uh, the gray line shows that the cases which are present in Sindh and the timeline for it is from the December 2021 till 14th August 2022. So it shows that Sindh witnessed the uh, peak earlier as compared to others and then the story continued till uh, the start of April, the cases started to die down. and. So that is the story uh, for that. And so far we don't have like m many more cases, so it actually has died down. And now looking into what actually are the, uh, the effects felt by this Omicron in different province, uh, provinces, or I must say the regions of Pakistan. So there were many cases reported from the Sin, that is the uh, Sin reported the highest cases during that particular time period, which I have mentioned. But the CFR, that is the case fatality ratio was more in KPK and Balochistan. That was a different observation. That, that's the observation which was actually standing out from a general observation. Moving quickly ahead to the, uh, what strains are actually present at that particular time. So that filters, after applying those filters, we have 1,041 uh, sequences uh, submitted at the GISAID. Of those, more than 90%, uh, like 966 were, uh, of uh, the Omicron. So actually Omicron is the, a major variant which is co uh, which is causing uh, Ali, uh, which you have is the last minute please. yeah sure so um, there were like more than 90% cases of omicron and the dominant strain was ba2 and ba uh, uh, ba5 in that uh, that time period so the result showed that uh, during all these uh, in all these regions of pakistan uh, the age group less than 40 years was 
uh, impacted more as compared to the age group more than 40. So the most probable explanation, um, explanation may be that there are more individuals which are um, um, more than 40 years of age in Pakistan. So my conclusions are it's actually the Omicron which triggered the fifth, uh, fifth wave. BA2 and BA5 are the dominant strains. In each region, uh, of course, the younger age group was more, but uh, the probability is it's actually because of the more uh, people uh, less than the age of 40 years in Pakistan uh, that has contributed, and it is not actually the, uh, something related to the younger old uh, group. So uh, the sequencing efforts actually showed that there is very less data coming out from the Balochistan and KPK, so appropriate measures have to be taken in order to facilitate those to have uh, more uh, data coming out from it. That's all. These are acknowledgement for all the group and all the uh, funding authorities. Thank you so much for it. Uh, thank you very much, Ali, uh, for wonderful uh, presentation and sharing the data well in time. We have to move to the next presentation uh, by Faraz Ahmed. He will be presenting uh, entitled Saliva is a non-invasive sample for molecular detection of SARS-CoV-2. Faraz Ahmed. So, thank you, sir. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Faraz Ahmed, Registrar of Virology at Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, Rawalpindi. In this session, I shall be presenting my research title, Saliva as a Non-Invasive Sample for Molecular Detection of SARS-CoV-2. Molecular diagnostic testing has played a critical role in the global response to COVID-19 pandemic. WHO recommends reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 on nasopharyngeal swab specimen. The use of nasopharyngeal swab and saliva specimen has been studied earlier for the detection of SARS-CoV-2. Saliva specimen can be used as an alternative option for nasopharyngeal swab because saliva is non-invasive, quick, and can be self-collected. However, nasopharyngeal swab specimen collection is an invasive procedure. Trained healthcare workers are required, and it can cause discomfort to the patient, including sneezing and coughing. The objective of my study was to evaluate saliva specimen as a non-invasive sample for molecular detection of SARS-CoV-2 and in comparison with nasopharyngeal swab. Cross-sectional descriptive study was carried out in the Virology Department Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. The sample size was calculated by using WHO sample size calculator and was collected by using non-probability convenience sampling. Patients of both gender and age more than 18 years old were included in this study. Patients unable to give saliva specimen due to any medical condition were excluded from the study. Paired sample of nasopharyngeal swabs and saliva were collected simultaneously. Out of total 48 paired sample, 28 known COVID-19 positive and 20 negative known patients were included in this study. For a collection of saliva sample, patient was advised to spit the saliva in the collection pot until the amount of saliva reached the scale mark on the tube. RT-PCR was performed on nasopharyngeal swab specimen and saliva specimen simultaneously on the same day and on the same equipment. Detection of two target genes was considered as positive. Among total 28 COVID-19 positive samples, only 18 were detected on saliva specimen. Saliva specimen sensitivity was 64.3%, which was much lower than the nasopharyngeal swab specimen. However, specificity was 95%. Not only the sensitivity of the saliva specimen was less, but also median cycle threshold was observed to be lower in nasopharyngeal swab specimen. Earlier studies also shows lower sensitivity of saliva specimen, which are comparable to our study. I would like to conclude by saying that saliva specimen has much lower sensitivity as compared to nasopharyngeal swab specimen. Saliva specimen should not be used for the diagnosis of COVID-19 as it can compromise the results of highly sensitive tests like RT-PCR. These are the references that I have used. I thank you all for your patient listening. Uh, thank you for us for ending this presentation well in time, rather before time. Uh, we have to move to the next presentation uh, by Larry Bikbal. Uh, in depth analysis of SARS CoV 2 spike gene from patients infected with SARS CoV 2 during the fifth wave. Larry. Uh, 
assalamu alaikum my name is avik bal and i'm from molecular diagnostic lab of siut the topic of my today's presentation is in depth analysis of sars cov 2 spike gene in a patient infected with sars cov 2 during uh, the fifth please wave please set the timer it's during the fifth wave of covid 19 pandemic how to change it sorry how to change it <laughs> SARS CoV 2 emerged from Wuhan, China, as we all know that it has many variants of concern during different waves. In fourth waves of COVID 19, WHO announced. Please, time I limited. <laughs> Where I found the next? Next one, guys. No, first, let's go back. Okay, thank you. Objectives. To find out the genetic diversity of a spike protein encoding gene of SARS-CoV in the people infected with SARS-CoV during the specific line, line of fifth wave. This is the methodology. We have the positive sample for SARS-CoV, which we do the two things. That is, one is the real-time PCR that target the edge gene target failure, and the other is the conventional PCR by which we are using the overlapper primer of the spike gene uh, which cover the near full length of the S gene and we done the DNA sequencing that, uh, that will confirm later what is the variant. Now these are the results. All samples show the S gene target failure by real time PCR. Uh, the total number of 35 mutations we have found in our study which were in different regions that is S1, S1, S2 cleavage site or S2 domain. Uh, these are the number of mutations that are found in our study in which the S1 subunit, S1 subunit has two mutations that is N terminal domain at eight mutations and receptor binding domain has 16 mutations. In S1, S2 cleavage site there is five mutations and S2 subunit have total number of six mutations. Now these are the individual mutations that are found in the different regions of the S gene. One is the N terminal domain of S1 subunit. First column showed that these are the position at which the nucleotide sub, uh, amino acid substitution has been occurred. The second column showed that these are the amino acid substitution, insertion and deletion have been occurred. And the third column showed that these are the frequencies of the mutation that are found in the Omicron as per reported. And the fourth column showed that these mutations are also found in some other variant of concerns, but uh, most of the mutations are not found in any other variant of concerns, which means that these are the unique, these are the unique mutations that are only found in the Omicron. Now these are the mutations that are, uh, that are found in the receptor binding domain of S1 subunit. In this slide, I just want to mention the mutation that is at 346K mutation, which frequency is 33.90% only, which meant that this mutation is also a rare mutation in Omicron, but in our sample, it is found in the 60% of the samples. Now, these are the individual mutations that are found in the S1, S2 cleavage side and the mutation in S2 subunit. Now, the, what are the significance of these mutations that are found in different regions of the S gene? Uh, the significance of mutations that are found in N terminal subunit or uh, N terminal domain of S subunit, in these mutations, it causes the conformational changes and to increase viral transmission and immune escape potential. In this slide, I just want to mention the mutation at position 214 uh, that is previously not been found in any of the SARS CoV lineages, but on the other human coronavirus. This same sequence pattern was found, and it is explained the theory that it might be a template switching from that human HCoV virus. Now, these are the mutations that are found in the receptor, receptor binding domain of S1 subunit. The start form mutations are only found in the Omicron, and it causes the confirmation changes at their antigenic sites. The last four mutations I want to highlight because it is the mutation that increases the AC2 binding. What is the AC2 receptor? AC2 receptors are the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor that are found on the host cells, and it is the and this is the only entry point where the SARS-CoV-2 virus get entered into the cells. Now these are the mutations that are found in the S1, S2 cleavage site. What is S1, S2 cleavage site? Basically, S1, S2 cleavage site are also known as the furin cleavage site. Furin are the proteases that separate S1 from S2 when the membrane fusion occurs, the virus get entered into the cell. So these mutations affect the S1, S1, S2 cleavage by destabilizing the spike protein and spike protein and decreases the spike protein flexibility. 
Uh, this also help the infected cell to create new spike protein that will efficiently help them to produce resistance against different monoclonal antibodies. Now the mutations that are found in the S2 subunit are not much important than the mutations that are found in the S1 subunit because it has more uh, ability to escape from the vaccine than S2 subunit mutations. In this study, we report the sequence with analysis of SARS-CoV-19 full-length full virus spike gene. Mutations found in different domains of S gene, that is, N-terminal domain, receptor binding domain, S1, S2 cleavage size, which may contribute at higher escape immunity with trans transmittability pathogenicity, which made these variant of concern uh, unique, like Omicron, unique than other variant of concerns. Acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lared. <laughs> you will get uh, marks for finishing well in time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we have to move for uh, next presentation. Do we have Muhammad Afan? If we don't have, so we have one more uh, uh, skip uh, presentation. So it's good for us to have uh, save time. Uh, the next presentation is uh, Congo virus, our latest experience in 2022. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Sidra, you are present. Yes. Dr. Sidra will present. Forward with this. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Sidra Liakat, resident of virology at Chukhtai Institute of Pathology, Lahore. On a behalf of my respected professor, Wahidu Zaman Taik Saab, I am here to present our research and the latest experience about Congo in 2022. Yes. Abstract. Pakistan is being hit, uh, hit by various viral diseases over the times. Among these viral diseases, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is a tick-borne viral disease of humans. It is the most fatal viral infection with a case fatality up to 50%. Uh, we conducted this study at our lab in Chukhtai Institute of Pathology, Lahore, to determine about outbreaks and strategies to prevent the progression of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus and to prevent the uh, prevalence of and to uh, determine about the prevalence in different areas of Pakistan. We conducted this study over a five uh, year period, correlating it with 2022, and qualitative PCR for CCHF was performed on all the suspected cases received in the five years. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, it belongs to family narrow viridi and genus ortho a narrow virus. It is a causative agent of tick-borne zoonotic disease. It is endemic in Africa, the Balkans, the Middle East, and Asian countries. This virus is transmitted through exotics mainly belonging, belonging to Hyloma genus. Uh, CCHF is a negative standard RNA virus. It is a segmented virus which consists of three segments. It is transmitted also through direct contact with blood and other body fluids of viremic patients and animals. This is the WHO reported burden of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. About 10,000 to 15,000 cases are reported every year. Three billion people are at risk, while per year 500 mortality ratios present. Uh, these are the different clinical features of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. Muscle pain, backache, generalized body weakness, and neck pain, stiffness, main uh, important point is bleeding from other uh, body sites and openings, headache, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, sore eyes, and sensitivity to light. And uh, now introduction. In uh, case of severe form, it also leads to kidney deterioration, uh, liver failure, pulmonary failure, and incubation period is uh, very few weeks. It depends upon the mode of acquisition of virus. It was first reported in Pakistan in 1976. 11 secondary cases were hospital acquired leading to three deaths. We conducted this study at our lab in which 224 cases of suspected CCHF were taken and they were all processed for qualitative PCR for CCHF virus. Among these patients with suspected CCHF virus, there were 4% PCR confirmed cases in five years and 3.1% confirmed cases in 2022 and 0.89% were confirmed in 2019 and 2022. And this table depicts about the total samples and detected cases 
and the five years highest ratio was seen in 2022 about seven cases were detected this is the another graphical representation which shows the high uh, prevalence of Cayman Congo hemorrhagic fever virus in 2022 <coughs> among suspected cases the prevalence of positive cases were 1.3 percent in Lahore and Multan 0.9 percent in Peshawar 0.4 percent in Quetta, Rahim Yar Khan and Aptabad Pakistan has confirmed cases of CCHF in almost every years like Sin Punjab, Bochistan and KPK. These are, uh, the diff this is the different graphical representation of CCHF virus in different areas which depicts Lahore and Multan has the highest ratio of detected cases of Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. Among confirmed cases, about 63.6% cases were reported within one month of Eid al-Adha and these cases might be attributable, they may lead to the Eid al-Adha during which approximately 8 million animals including goats, sheep, cows and camels are sacrificed. Pakistan has experienced Kremen and Congo hemorrhagic fever and Eid al-Adha as a vulnerable period of outbreaks. 15 cases were confirmed in uh, November 1996 in South Africa and they uh, were all slaughterhouse related cases. This is another table which depicts about the detected cases of Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. It shows in 2022 we received maximum number of cases around the month of a uh, holy uh, event of Evil Adha. These were four as compared to other years. Among uh, positive cases of 11th, we received total seven uh, per, uh, detected cases in Eid al-Adha. <coughs> now, uh, leading to the conclusion, Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever, it is a potentially fatal yet preventable disease which has consumed many lives in different regions of Pakistan. Our study will be useful for prevention and better control of the disease, especially during the month of Eid al-Adha. Uh, these are the references and I would like to thank to my respected professor Vaidu Zaman Tariq Saab uh, with uh, uh, sharing about the lifetime story of Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever. This is the original paper which was uh, published in 2005 about Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever uh, and these are the different papers from 1990 till to date. These are the different papers which are published uh, by our respected sir and another interview recorded in 2000 was uh, published in Roznama Jung about prevalence, prevention and uh, to control the different measures about Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever uh, to prevent the chaos about the Kremen Congo hemorrhagic fever in our population. And this is another article about CCHF and thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Sidra. Uh, for finishing the presentation well in time. Uh, we have to move to the next presentation uh, by Dr. Robina Ghani. Uh, she will be presenting on diagnosis of H. pylori with qPCR technology from blood samples after diagnosis with basic hematological and biochemical parameters. Uh, Dr. Robina Ghani. Thank you for inviting me. Actually, there was too much viruses, viruses, so I think so I should go to there bacteria. As you know, it is a chronic uh, bacterial infection. The main thing is if we're having the gastric uh, gastritis without diagnosis, medications go. It is a spiral shape um, with the multiple unipolar fragments and it's three micromole long with 0 0.5 micromole in width diameter. 50% of the population is infected, 70 to 80% in developing countries. Main issue is the low socioeconomic status, sanitation, regions, ages. This is the main issue for the having H. pylori as a major cause of it. And while it's developing, it converts into the gastric carcinoma, cancer. Main objective was to see the relationship between the hematological and biochemical parameters and then investigating why these amylase lipase are elevated during this reason and to confirm when we do the ELISA whether it's a true positive or true negative with QPCR. Most of the work was done on the tissue I tried to do on the blood sample 
these were the steps which were kind of, uh, uh, taken during the methodology sampling after giving them the concern form that they should write down that they are not medicated, they have not started any treatment and they will for, come for the follow-up and all these things. The analysis was further and the data analysis was done by SPSS and further. After that, the, uh, 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 completing all the uh, streamline DNA uh, extraction was done with the following the uh, kit protocol and the QPCR was done on the positive cases. When we came over here uh, with 120 samples, 50 percent were, were the positives, 60 percent were the positive and 60 were the negatives. We consider those negatives as a negative control because following all the basic parameters hematologically and uh, biochemically, we considered them as a control. Out of them, we took the equal amount of the male and the female patients, in which 25% were the males and 25% were the females in both negative and the positive cases. When we came to for the hematological parameters, it is seen that you will note that the WBC count was not significant and the platelet count. In the patients with the positive cases, the platelets were becoming low and the hemoglobin was also low. On further analysis, we noted that the control samples with amylase, lipase, C-reactive protein were in normal conditions with RN, ferritin and TIBC. But in the uh, patients with the positive cases, the uh, amylase, lipase, both were elevated and C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. Uh, uh, CRP does not confirm that it is only for H. pylori, it is for all the inflammation which is there in the body. But in these patients, the RN profile was low. Uh, but what we do, sitting in the diagnostic, where uh, hematologists write down, put a question, and RN deficiency anemia, without knowing what was the reason. Then, this was the, these were the positive and the negative parameters which we identified that biochemical and uh, hematological parameters, the positive cases in the biochemical parameters were elevated and in hematological cases, the uh, positive cases were low. When we did the correlation coefficient analysis, we came that the hemoglobin is low with the uh, ferritin level. And this uh, 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 with the RN level. This proves that the uh, H. pylori infected patients uh, uh, cases where the hemoglobin is low, the RN also becomes lower and they are anemic in these conditions. We took some positive cases for the PCR. Those were the 20 cases. Out of which, the CT value confirmed that the six cases were false positive. And the remaining were the negative, positive cases. So we, before treatment, we gave them the treatment for the two months and they came back with us and because we had our contact numbers with them. And on the follow-up, we came across that five were still positive with showing the CT values. With this, we came to conclude that before and after starting the PCR, QPCR can help out to note what is the reason why we, the patients are RN deficiency anemia and we should follow the, the importance of the diagnosis with the QPCR in the follow. In many, in these five cases, we came across that these H. pylori strains were uh, drug resistance with the med medications. And we also recommend that the occurrence of the chronic H. pylori infection in gastric mucus impairs the absorption of vitamin B12. So I, we also recommend that the testing of vitamin B12, iron ferritin levels, and total iron binder are also import, plays an important role in identification of the H. pylori infection in these case, instead of going for the endoscopy immediately. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rabina.
for sharing your findings on H. pylori. So we have the last speaker between you and lunch. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, Dr. Gibran Khan, to be Dr. Sun, I think. So uh, he will be presenting on laboratory verification of HBV and HCV qu quantitative PCR. Assalamu alaikum. I am Gibran so. Khan from India's Hospital and Health Network. Today I am going to discuss the uh, laboratory verification of SCV and HB quantitative PCR on Roche Coba 6800 in accordance with College of American Pathologists. So uh, why basically the CAP? Because it is internationally accepted framework for laboratory performance. Then what are the requirements for CAP to verify an assay that is to determine the assay performance characteristics such as linearity, uh, reportable range, analytical sensitivity or limit of detection accuracy or trueness and the precision. These are all study in this, uh, evaluated in this study by the following uh, standards published by CLSI. The methodology of this study will be uh, studied in the next following slide. So we move to the results section of the, um, uh, we start from here the linearity experiment of the uh, HCV. In this study, high titer HCV sample concentration were pooled and analyzed on the reference method. Then this analyzed sample is serially diluted to cover the reportable range of the instrument and run in duplicate in both the uh, reference method and the test method. Uh, applying linear regression R square is found to be 0 0.9782 which is very close to a maximum of 1 indicating the equation is be best fit for the data obtained. Similar studies was also obtained for the uh, HBV in this R square is zero, uh, found to be 0 0.99. And next one is the accuracy of SCV. Uh, for accuracy, uh, 30 samples for SCV were uh, analyzed on both the reference method and the test method. And then this uh, also studied by the regression analysis in which the R square found to be 0 0.961 which is again uh, very close to the maximum of 1. In addition, the slope is found to be uh, very close to zero, uh, 1 and the intercept is close to 1. These values uh, uh, determine the accuracy. Similar results were also obtained for the HBV. Accuracy also includes the blend element plot. In this plot, the x-axis consists of the average of the two methods, while the uh, y-axis consists of the difference of the two methods. Here, the solid line shows the mean bias for the value of 10 and the dotted line above and below shows the 2SD values. Each dot here represents the data uh, obtained for each sample. Since this plot indicates our data is serially diluted, uh, serially, oh sorry, uh, equally distributed in both direction, which comes in the acceptably uh, limit. Similar plot is also uh, obtained for the HBV. The next one is the uh, probate analysis uh, for the LOD or limit of detection. Uh, for HCV, the uh, two uh, proficiency testing sample is serially diluted to the concentration close to the report, uh, uh, LOD range of instrument. Then these concentrations are run in replicates over five days. And the, this column shows the number of positive obtained from these replicates and followed by the positive percentage. Probate analysis is done on the Excel analysis software. This graph is obtained from the analysis software where x-axis consists uh, of the sample concentration, IU per ml, while the y-axis consists of the probability detection. Using 95% probability as a cutoff, uh, we, uh, LOD for the HCV was found to be 27.5 IU per ml, while the manufacturer uh, LOD is between 8.7 to 10.95. Similar protocol also followed for the HBV where the LOD found for HBV SA 4.29, while the IFU manual showed the LOD range of 2, IU per ml, 2 to 2.7 IU per ml. The next one, the last but not the least, precision is determined in terms of coefficient variation and the p-value for this NE2 sample concentration or the high and low concentration uh, is studied, uh, which also run in uh, triplicate over five days by different operators a coefficient of variation for each concentration is determined and their average is calculated. Uh, for HCV, the coefficient of variation found to be 3.1%, 3 which is below the threshold of 10%. Uh, applying ANOVA analysis or analysis of variance, an Excel tool, p-value found to be 0.99 since it is 
uh, above the 0 0.5 range. So we accept the null hypothesis, and therefore the uh, data is uh, our pro uh, our data is more precise. Similar protocol is also study for the uh, HBV. In this study, uh, we the performance of the both SCV and HBV are uh, uh, quantitative PC, uh, PCR is observed, and uh, our study verifies both tests on Roche Coba 600. While, uh, however, the LOD range for both tests found to be above the uh, manufacturer claim. Uh, in this test or in this study, one, two kits of 192 test is. Uh, used which amount of significant cost and has a budgetary implications on the laboratory uh, which are pl planning to follow the CAP accreditation standards. These are the references which I observed and these are our team. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Gibran. Uh, so this was the end of the presentation. Uh, now we can take a couple of questions before uh, we break for lunch. So the speakers are available for uh, answering any of the question from the audience. Nobody else has one. You have a question. When you start, there will be many. Uh, thank you very much, Gibran. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask you, what was your reference material for, for these validation studies? And um, secondly, uh, we also did exactly the same. We, we did validation studies. We have to do that for CAP. Um, and we found that we actually had much better um, LODs than the manufacturer. So that's why I was just wondering, maybe it's the reference material. Could you just tell us, share with us what the reference material was? No, 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 no. Joe, uh, the um, samples you were using, what samples did you use? What stand did you use standards or did you use patient samples? Samples which are used in the study are the proficiency testing samples, uh, which so are these uh, were the PT surveys. G, we, which are uh, serially diluted to the uh, close to the LOD range of instrument Roche Coba 600. And where did you get these PT samples from? Uh, these samples were uh, previously uh, we saved or uh, uh, okay. sorted. Okay. All right. So um, I'll talk to you about that later. That's not the ideal sample. So maybe if you use actual proper standards, you can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's. Yeah. Yeah. But. There's an, there's an issue with that. I, I, I I'll discuss that with you later. But okay. it's a great, this is exactly how you do it. It's excellent. You've got some great results. But just, you can go down lower. And there are lots of other groups that have been able to show lower LODs. Uh, but it's just about what material you use. Okay. So we have enough time at lunch. You can discuss that. <laughs> 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 any, uh, any other question from the other speakers? If there's none, then we need. Yes, please. I think uh, just. I'm Professor Vaidu Zuman Tariq, the oldest professor I became in 1990. I was going to ask you, that's why I asked you to stay, because I just wanted to let everybody know it's a, it's a real pleasure for us and a real honor for us that uh, Professor Vaidu Zaman Zafar is here in our session. Um, he just about started to tell you that he is perhaps, you know, um, I wouldn't say oldest, but the pioneer of virology in Pakistan. So it's a real, it's a real honor for us that he's here. And um, following up on that, what I'd like to do is ask him to request to come here to give our shields to um, our speaker and our chair. So um, our first speaker, Dr. Zara Hassan. Professor Vahidin. Thank you very much. This is, a, this is an epic picture because we've got new generation and, um, the, and one of the pioneers of virology in, in Pakistan. This is wonderful. And we have... My trainee in virology second trainee was General Ejaz Ghani, and he is the trainee of General Ejaz Ghani. So my trainee is, he was, when Ejaz met me, he was in fourth year MBBS, but he joined. And he is my direct trainee. And I used to teach uh, Congo Crimean as a professor in Liverpool University of Tropical Medicine, and invited to speak in 
Atlanta, Georgia, and this topic was very close to my heart. And having worked uh, with this virus, open even mice inoculation I've done, I've done with the cell cultures when there was no P4 thought at that time. And I must remember uh, Sufi Sharak and McCormick. Sufi Sharak, a British virologist who married to an American public health physician, worked in Aga Khan. And in 1995, when I was investigating outbreak in Quetta, Sufi Sharak helped me a lot in doing my PCRs in Aga Khan. So we had a very good uh, collaboration with that. And with PCR, we started with the in-home, in-house testing with that. So I have played with this virus so many times for, I think, uh, since 1988. I've been playing with <coughs> virus. It is a pleasure to be here and see my students' students speaking. That is the third generation, second generation, I can say. Thank you. Sir, if you replace the oldest, it will be very good for the pioneers. If you are old, 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 a Razi lecture there. So this lecture, Congo crime, and I used to be called every year by Liverpool people as a visiting professor in 1990s, I'm saying. So I'm not very young, but I'm 60, 68 year old. Uh, and old, old soldier, old soldier, I must say, thank you. Sir, I was in the lecture that there was obesity for the virus, but there was also a young virus for the young. Dr. Say, thank you so much for always ending on such a, a very um, uh, humorous <laughs> note. So may, may we ask you to come here and thank you for being the chair for this session, Professor Vahid. Please do the honors. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was a really well-chaired session, Dr. Say. You were extremely nice. precise. <laughs> That's wonderful. Are there any other questions from the audience? Because it's lunchtime and um, I hope you all are enjoying these sessions and we're so thrilled to see a packed, packed room, really. This is more than um, we could have imagined. So thank you very much for being here and please come back after lunch. Sona Jana. Thank you. Just a lunch announcement. Uh, lunch, we want to uh, come back and start at, I believe, 2 o'clock. Um, lunch is in the Zavar Hall, I think. And for speakers, it's in conference room, too. <laughs> Can we have a group pick of all the speakers? All the speakers, chairs, please. Moderators, friends, anyone, anyone, everyone can squeeze in. <laughs> Get the troops in. <laughs> कुर्सी पे खड़ी होके लेना पड़ेगा तो सीधा आप ले लें यूं
Hello, hello, hello. 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 Maybe we can move some of these closer here. That, that might be because Joe Log immediately Iangi, then they can sit down. Oh I would Oh Acha Chan and Tika. Okay, great. Thank you. I know. To come now. Let me try and see what we
हेलो हाँ जी आई थिंक वी नीड वी कैन स्टार्ट ये दरवाजे बंद कर दें I think it's 2:21. We can start. Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon to all of you. And I hope that you have eaten after eating. All of you will be because we are going to have a very interesting session. We did have fantastic sessions in the morning, as you all know, genomics in clinics, where they showed us what the available technologies are and how genomics are important and how it is important to talk between the clinicians and diagnosticians. Then there was. Uh, very important, very superb talk by Zara, followed by Masab and others on the genomics and surveillance. So you can see the importance of genomics, which is uh, not only um, you know genetics but also proteomics, epigenomics, and all that. So for this session, this is a third session uh, where I will be um, introducing a, a person that is already has made headlines in the newspapers and news. Uh, and that person is Dr. Salman Kirmani. Um, Dr. Kirmani is a clinical geneticist and pediatric endocrinologist and leads the Division of Women and Child Health at the Aga Khan University, Karachi. He has created a team of genomic literate health professionals and scientists who endeavor to make genomic medicine a reality in Pakistan, and very good luck with that. Treatment and prevention of rare genetic disorders is at the forefront of his mission. Dr. Kirmani and his team made key partnerships in academia and industry to enable the first gene therapy to be provided to a patient in Pakistan. And I'm sure you have all learned that through the videos and news channels. So I won't take more time. I invite Dr. Salman Kirmani to chair this session. Thank you so much. Uh, that is uh, an extremely kind introduction and I, I really am uh, honored uh, to be part of this session and I said part of this conference. Uh, and, and really this uh, current session three, uh, which is titled Exomes and Transcriptomes, is, is really a, a fantastic session. We've got luminaries, uh, you know, in the field who are waiting to deliver their talks and we've got an excellent audience uh, who's been engaged since the morning and we hope that the engagement continues. We're running a little bit uh, behind time, so I'm going to apologize up front that I'm going to be very strict with time. Uh, otherwise, there will be no time for a tea break and a break between the other session. Uh, so without much delay, I'm going to introduce our first speaker who will be joining us online. This is Dr. Mark Ross. Uh, greetings, Dr. Ross. I know you've been waiting for us. If I read the entire introduction that has been given to me, it will probably take another 20 minutes. Uh, so, but I'm going to be very, very brief in saying that uh, Dr. Ross is the Vice President and Distinguished Scientist in the Medical Genomics Research Group of Illumina and uh, has had a, an illustrious academic career in human genetics uh, and has uh, really, really contributed tremendously to the advancement of the field. He's been associated with all of the major institutes in the UK that you, uh, you know, that basically have taken the journey of bringing genomics 
from uh, you know the lab to the clinic and to make it really more accessible to humans. Uh, he's worked specifically on the X chromosome and sequencing of the X chromosome and uh, you know the uh, the HapMap project uh, was one of his key contributions. Uh, and uh, he's been involved in many, many initiatives as well as, uh, you know, a big, big uh, expert in cancer genomics. So that was a very short snippet. Uh, Dr. Ross, over to you uh, and your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. I hope you can hear me uh, okay. Um, so first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone in Karachi. Good morning from the UK. And thank you very much to Dr. Natasha Anwar for the invitation to, to present our work to you today. Uh, let me just start sharing the screen with you. Can you just confirm that you can hear me okay? We're hearing you loud and clear. Okay, so let me now just check with you that you can see the slides. <clears throat> yes, your slides are on. Okay, I'll go to presenter mode then and um, so once again, it's, I'm delighted to be with you today uh, to tell you about the work that we at Illumina have been doing in the last few years uh, with Genomics England uh, and with uh, with laboratories in the uh, National Health Service to uh, to work with them to advance the use of whole genome and whole transcriptome sequencing in clinical uh, oncology for diagnostic uh, uses. Um, so first of all, um, as I mentioned, as has been mentioned, I work for Illumina. So just a disclaimer there. Um, and so I'm going to touch briefly on first of all, uh, just at the scale of the genome, or the whole transcriptome. Um, and then I wanted to talk about really a couple of examples that I think illustrate the power of um, looking broadly across the genome um, into, um, uh, into, uh, in, into cancer cases. Uh, so I'm going to take examples of acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, and also work that we've been doing in, uh, with Genomics England uh, that's leading to work in the Genomic Medicine Service in the National Health Service in England. <clears throat> um, this slide is, is really just to remind me that genomics can be important, is becoming important at all stages of um, the journey of a cancer patient right from detecting uh, risk variants in the germline genome uh, through early detection of cancer before symptoms arise and so on through the through the uh, the journey to symptoms and hopefully into remission um, and but also to remind me that although genomics is important at all of these stages um, it's not the only um, it's not the only thing that's important, obviously. So uh, risk is not uh, is mostly not inherited. So risk is more due to um, exposures, or whether it be to lifestyle exposures or to to, vi uh, to viruses, for example. Um, that early detection of cancer really or detection of risk and early detection of cancer probably offers the best possibility of increasing cure rates and addressing the, the large numbers that we see predicted for cancer in the future, cancer cases in the future. Uh, and of course, that um, genomics does not stand alone in this, but um, that precision, precision therapies require both improved diagnostic tests, but also improved uh, development of, of novel treatments. Uh, and I don't need to tell this audience that um, th the kinds of um, uses for this information at, this, at these different stages uh, in the journey of a cancer patient. So I won't dwell, uh, I won't dwell on those for now. But instead, I'll move on to uh, looking into the cancer genome, just give you, obviously, there is no such single cancer genome, but I just wanted to give you some examples of what um, what we're looking at when we uh, when we look at this kind of scale of the whole genome and transcriptome sequence. Um, so, in in our view, the 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 genome obviously is the most comprehensive uh, view of the tumor um, and the germline, uh, and it's also the least biased because we're not doing any kind of selection. We're not biasing towards particular regions. 
the workflow is actually very simple when compared with uh, other other workflows such as enrichment workflows where you're targeting particular regions and it will give you information on uh, driver variants of all types but also broad information such as um, uh, tumor mutational burden and uh, deficiency in homologous recombination repair pathway and so on um, we can also, if we have the transcriptome data, we can look at the impact of variants on gene expression. Um, but we can also use the transcriptome data as, as a standalone test for stratifying patients in, in a kind of orthogonal way by looking at gene expression signatures. And I'll show an example later in the talk. And of course, um, when we do this kind of work, research findings are often described as coming along for free with the with the whole genome test. And again, I'll show you an example of that from the Genomics England project. Um, of course, you know, this is this is early uh, technology for uh, uh, routine application in healthcare. Um, and so we, often people get concerned that there'll be too much data to manage, that, that, that the genome won't provide sufficient depth and that um, it will be too costly to do this routinely. And I think those are the areas that particularly Illumina is focused on, uh, you know, redu on affecting all of these areas in a positive way uh, so that this can be used routinely. And the, the, the image on the right side shows the new uh, large-scale sequencing platform from Illumina, the Nova CKEX, that we think will help uh, in all of these areas. Okay, so what does uh, what does a cancer genome look like at a high level? This is actually a normal genome, just to give you an, an idea of what a normal um, depth of coverage looks like. You can see the black line, and that's the um, that's the depth of coverage of sequence reads across the genome. You can see this is a male individual because they have half the coverage on the X and Y. Uh, and the blue line below is just looking at the um, uh, variant allele frequencies of, of heterozygous sites in the genome. Uh, and obviously, if, if there are regions of loss in the cancer genome, then these 50% uh, these variant frequencies are distorted. And so this is an example of what a cancer genome looks like using the same approach. This is actually a breast cancer case. Um, it's a it's a triple negative breast cancer with uh, HRD, so homologous recombination repair deficiency, uh, and so many rearrangements, uh, as shown by the uh, now by the depth plot, as you can see, uh, very many amplifications and losses. Uh, the, the 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 track at the top of the image shows the structural variants in the cancer genome as arcs, uh, either intrachromosomal or interchromosomal inter events of different types. Um, and you can see this genome is very scrambled, um, as we would expect in a in a case of HRD. <clears throat> And if we look at the same genome at a different scale, this is just a research report that we produce uh, for these genome sequencing uh, projects. And what you can see here is both germline and somatic information, but also broader information about signatures. And so in this case, we can see what we think is driving uh, the HRD is this the RAD51C, um, these RAD51C mutations. Um, and you can see also down at the bottom that there is a, a signature three uh, found within the uh, within this genome. This is a, a substitution signature, uh, which is characteristic of uh, homologous recombination deficiency. When we add the uh, we integrate the whole transcriptome data. Uh, obviously, this has many uses. It confirms the impact of the variants that we see in the genomes. So, for example, we may have unknown significance that we suspect impact splicing, and we can derive. Importantly, we can also confirm the expression of fusion genes. Uh, there is an example at the bottom of, a, of an NTRAC fusion uh, with a, a gene called CDYL, and you can see in the cartoon um, the, the structures of the two reciprocal um, fusion events uh, and you can see in this track, hopefully, um, that the uh, only the only this fusion is actually expressed in the RNA. Uh, the second fusion is not. And we can also use um, the um, uh, the information on gene expression signatures to uh, to stratify 
patient samples. Um, this is an example of a case of an individual who within a very short period of time had two cancers. Uh, they had a colon cancer, sorry, uh, initially they were diagnosed with a kidney cancer, a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Um, and then uh, within a year, they, they had a, a, a diagnosis of colorectal cancer. And the question here was, were these somehow related as a primary and a secondary, or were they uh, two primary events? So we sequenced the genome and the transcriptome for this patient. And what we're seeing here is a, a principal component analysis where the patient's um, gene expression signatures are overlaid on the ICGC data for different cancer types. And what we see is that the colon cancer sample, uh, these red triangles, hope you can see, um, overlay the colon cancer group from ICGC, whereas the kidney, uh, the, the pink uh, triangles for the kidney um, samples from this individual overlay the ICGC kidney cancer expression group. So this, this along with the genomic information, confirmed that this is a case with two primary events rather than a, met a primary and a secondary. Can I just... Are you still there, uh, Dr. Ross? Yeah. Is, is there a video you're trying to play? Yes, can you hear me okay? Uh, we Sorry, you're breaking just up. begun to hear you now. We're at slide number 10. We can see slide number 10. We can see you on the screen now. We've lost uh, your screen share. Do we have connectivity? Yes, I can hear you fine. Are you, are you able to hear me properly now? We're hearing you properly now. Yeah, and were you able to see the slides I was showing? Uh, we were. Uh, we stopped. Uh, I think you were slide number 10 uh, when okay. the screen right. share stopped. Um, okay. So maybe yeah, okay, good. I, I, I'm just gonna, I've got a, a slightly dodgy connection today, so I've, I've reconnected to a, hopefully a stronger signal, so I'll continue. Um, please do tell me when to stop talking. I know you're on a tight time schedule. Okay, so I want to move on to an example which I think demonstrates the power of uh, the, whole, the whole genome approach, particularly, and that's in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Whereas, where as you know, um, the standard clinical tests are based on cytogenetics, uh, so karyotyping and fish, but also on. Um, Excuse uh, me, Doctor Ross. I'm just going to interrupt. Yes. We, we don't have a share. Uh, we can't see your screen. We can see. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, it should be coming now. Probably yes, is. it's there. Yes, please resume. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, so uh, B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, about 70% of uh, cases uh, can be classified using the uh, standard uh, testing, the cytogenetic testing uh, uh, and PCR and so on. And that those are shown in the kind of the right hand side, the right hand two thirds of this uh, pie chart. Um, and so we first of all ask the question, will whole genome sequencing do a good job of capturing all of those events? So we looked at um, uh, we looked at um, about four we looked at 38 of those, uh, relatively small numbers, of course, but um, what we found was that with a tumor normal approach, where we're subtracting the normal information from the tumor information, we found um, all of so some types of events. But um, in the case of BCR-ABLE1, we missed one of those. And then in the EBF1 PDGFRB 
events, we missed all three of those. And the reason was that there was tumor contamination in the normal there. So we were subtracting those away. And so what we then did was a tumor only analysis. And we were able to find then all of these events, apart from one of the uh, BCR able one events, uh, we were able to call all of those. When we looked into the, ge the genomic reads, we were able to see the evidence of the BCR able one event, but it had a complex rearrangement. Um, and so it hadn't been called by the software. So that one requires more work. Then in the next phase of the work, we looked at these other cases, the B other cases, uh, these can be classified with a plethora of other uh, genetic tests, but it is a very large number of tests. So the question we wanted to ask will, was, will whole genome sequencing provide a single test to classify all of these? And you see the results of that on the left-hand side. So we looked at 173 genomes uh, from B other ALL cases. Um, and first of all, we saw that there were a number, so there were 19 that should have been captured by the standard test, but had been missed. Um, and then there was a whole, a whole series of other um, subtypes that could be uh, typed using the genomic information. And the biggest single group was the DOX4 rearranged category, um, which are important to detect because they're associated with good prognosis, um, but they're very difficult to detect by um, other tests because of the repetitive nature of the genome that's involved. So we had to develop a specific targeting, uh, targeted um, calling uh, algorithm from the genomic information. Uh, so actually, we only uh, looking at this group, we ended up with only eight that we couldn't classify by whole genome sequencing. And even in those in those group in, in sorry, even in this group, there were gen there were uh, genetic um, there, were, there were impacts on no, genes known to be involved in BALL, uh, as well as um, s similar information across the uh, uh, some of the members of the group of eight. So in the last part of the talk, I just wanted to uh, mention some work that we've been doing uh, with Genomics England, which has led uh, into the Genomic Medicine Service, which is now running in the UK. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the Genomics England partnership um, was designed uh, to, first and foremost, to bring benefit to patients in the National Health Service, but also to provide other benefits, such as uh, establishing the network for future testing, uh, as well as enabling new uh, discoveries and insights, um, and to develop, uh, to kickstart development of the genomics industry in the UK. Uh, the target was 100,000 genomes from cancer and rare genetic disease cases uh, delivered using an accredited workflow. Um, so there is a sequencing facility uh, on the genome campus uh, at Hinkston in the UK, uh, which, which has done all of the whole genome sequencing work. Uh, the data are delivered to a secure uh, storage location where, where they can be accessed by uh, researchers and clinicians uh, to, to both address their, their particular patient needs, but also for research uh, analysis. Okay, so in terms of cancer, there was a very high failure rate initially um, in cancer whole genome sequencing, and this was because FFPE samples uh, present particular challenges. So the, fa the pre-sequencing failure rate for these was about 30%, compared with only about 1.4% for fresh frozen and germline samples. So we have, and, and the reason for this, of course, is that the, the genome is very fragmented. Um, you get very high uh, false positive rates, and also um, it's very difficult to call copy number changes. You can see on the right hand side the same patient, um, uh, a fresh frozen sample at the top, and, a, and an FFP sample, and you can see the coverage in the FFP sample is very, very. Uh, uh, very, very non-uniform, and you'd, you'd struggle to find, uh, to, to call copy numbers accurately from this information. We did um, a pilot project with uh, Anna Shu and Pauline Robb and other members of the uh, Genomics England Consortium, um, and we um, compared fresh frozen and FFP pairs in this way from, um, from uh, different uh, patients, and we were able to call um, the, the actionable small variants quite well uh, with FFP, um, but calling copy number changes was a particular problem. Um, and it turned out there were many variables between the clinical labs in the way they were treating their samples. So uh, FFP samples are very different in their quality between different hospitals. 
Um, but the most damaging practices were F uh, for treating FFP samples were identified and recommendations made for reducing the, um, the variability, but also improving the quality. But the key recommendation was to use a fresh frozen sample wherever possible. Um, and that actually became the norm in the Genomics England project. And as a consequence, at the end of the program, uh, at the end of 2018, about 30,000 samples have been sequenced from cancer patients. Uh, and about 50% of those uh, had actionable, uh, about 50% of the patients had actionable information uh, just using the whole genome sequence. There was no whole transcriptome uh, sequencing uh, for these patients. And as I mentioned, um, the research findings come along uh, with this information, of course, and the largest, um, the, the first analysis of the whole cohort um, uh, of 12,222 cancers in this case uh, was done by Serena Nick Zainal's team. So Serena, as you, as you, I'm sure you know, is one of the luminaries in the field of mutational signatures. And what this, the scale of the cohort in this case allowed her uh, to see in the different cancer types, not just common signatures, which are, uh, are frequently seen in a particular type of cancer, but also there were sufficient individuals that she started to be able to identify signatures that occur only rarely within a particular uh, subtype of cancer. So having this kind of scale really gives you um, much more power to detect such events. The, uh, the project, the Genomics England project is completed, um, but the, the work has now stimulated the NHS England Genomic Medicine Service, which is designed to deliver um, equitable access to genomic testing across the country in rare disease and cancer. There is a network of seven genomic laboratory hubs that are tasked with delivering this. Um, and there's still this single facility near Cambridge, uh, which is run by Illumina, uh, to perform the whole genome sequencing for a growing list of indications, both in rare disease and cancer. And the target is to sequence about 500,000 whole genomes by uh, 2023 or 2024. Um, in cancer, the initial indications are acute leukemias, sarcomas, and all pediatric cancers. Um, but soon to be added to this list are high-grade serous ovarian cancer, triple negative breast cancer, uh, and gliomas. Um, and we are continuing our work with Genomics England to improve the recruitment, because recruitment hasn't gone as quickly as it ought to have. Uh, and one of the problems is, is going back to the, the sample type, is the, the, the problem of moving away from FFP, uh, which is a, a huge and daunting problem. Um, and so rather than... Uh, so we've been doing some additional work with Genomics England on alternative fixatives, not to, dis not to displace the use of FFP, uh, but actually to displace the use of a fresh frozen sample, because um, collecting fresh frozen samples is fine within the, um, for certain cancer types, within the large, uh, large clinical centers, but for smaller centers, they may not have access to liquid nitrogen or to minus 80 freezers. And so for them, having a solution that they can drop a piece of, uh, drop a biopsy into um, for transportation to one of the other major centers, it would be a game changing thing. And what I'm showing here for, from one patient, we have a fresh frozen sample at the top, an FFP Dr. sample Ross, in the we middle. We may have to ask yeah. you to just finish up in about a minute. Okay, yeah, I'm, I think I've only got one more slide after this. so. Thank you. Um, the FFP sample in the middle with all the usual problems of overcalling structural variants and uh, very choppy coverage. And at the bottom is a, an example of the, using the PAX gene fixative, which uh, to our eyes gives results which are as good as a fresh frozen sample. So PAX gene may be an alternative to, uh, to having a fresh frozen pathway needed uh, within the NHS. So in summary then, um, I hope I've uh, been able to demonstrate genomics has a potential to provide information at each stage of patient's disease, um, that it, the, the information can be used both for early detection, but also for treatment, for prognostication and detecting resurgence of the cancer, 
And also genomics can be used to avoid unnecessary treatments. And this is a story which has been uh, very, uh, very widespread in the, in the media in the UK. This was a, a baby uh, that was born with what appeared to be a cancer on his leg. Um, it turned out when they did genetic testing with whole genome sequencing, that this was actually a myofibroma and therefore the treatment uh, using uh, uh, chemotherapy was abo avoided for uh, baby Oliver. And this has been a very uh, important story, I think, about whole genome sequencing. So I'm gonna end there and thank you for your time. And apologies if I've run over slightly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Now, this was a fantastic talk, and I think just the, uh, the lessons that you have taught us with regards to how to practically actually get a, a sequencing project off the ground and then to actually bring it back to the patients is, is phenomenal, and the fact that it's part of the NHS is, is truly remarkable. Um, so if you can Thank be you kind much. enough to stay till the end of the session, then we may have questions and answers, but we do understand that we've already started late, so if you can't, we will understand, but uh, we'll move on to our, our next talk. Uh, Dr. Alison uh, Coffey is online with us. Uh, she is a senior curation scientist at Illumina Cambridge. Uh, she obtained her PhD in human and medical genetics from the University of London and holds a BA in biochemistry and molecular biology uh, from the University of Oxford and has extensive experience in sequencing technologies and genomics that spans over a decade. Uh, she has worked as a staff scientist at the Wellcome Sanger Institute and as a research assistant at Guy's Hospital, London. Uh, so Dr. Coffey, over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm sorry, just trying to sort out my slide sharing. Uh, can you see me and hear me? We can see and hear you. We don't have a screen share yet. Yes, no, that's coming. I'm just trying to work out the, the sharing. Uh, sorry. Yes, uh, it's that... just begun, uh, and we, we can see your screen now. Great. Can you see me and see the screen? Yes, we're good. We're good to go. Perfect. Thank you so much. So first of all, um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, my name is Alison Coffey, and I'm a clinical genetics scientist at the Illumina Clinical Services Lab in San Diego. And I will be speaking to you today about the application and impact of whole genome sequencing for rare and undiagnosed disease. So this is a picture of the Illumina Clinical Services Lab based at Illumina HQ in San Diego. So we are a clear certified and CAP accredited clinical lab offering a physician ordered um, clinical whole genome sequencing tests for patients with suspected rare and undiagnosed genetic disorders. And we support multiple projects and clinical trials aimed at demonstrating the clinical utility of genome sequencing, two of which I'm going to talk to you about today. So this slide is just to remind me to, 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 to sort of, for us to just take a minute to realize that the power of whole genome sequencing is in its ability to detect a broad range of variant types with a high degree of sensitivity and specificity in a single test. This can significantly reduce costs and the diagnostic odyssey of the patient by allowing for testing of multiple loci in one test. So our current test definition includes detection of SNVs and indels, CNVs greater than 10 KB, some structural variants, SNVs in the mitochondrial genome. We have solutions for clinically relevant paralogs, such as distinguishing the SMN1 gene from SMN2, the diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy and detection of short tandem repeat expansions using Expansion Hunter. So moving on to one of the, 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 uh, the first of the two studies I want to talk to you about with our Nikki seq clinical trial. So the background to the study, um, so critically ill infants are admitted to the ICU um, are at high risk for high levels of morbidity and mortality. So in the US, these neonatal hospitalizations cost at least $17 billion annually. Um, and genetic disorders are a leading cause of ICU admission. So studies in the literature, many studies using either whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, have reported between a 20 to 50 percent diagnostic efficacy, but the variability is usually attributed to the different inclusion criteria and the comprehensiveness of the genomic test. So the highest diagnostic yields are observed in cohorts of critically ill infants who have clinical features that are strongly suggesting a genetic diagnosis. But observational investigations of clinical utility have shown two-thirds of molecularly diagnosed infants will receive an alter, alteration in care, 
and that genomic testing is perceived as having a high utility in this acute care setting. But the widespread adoption of WGS in the ICU has been hampered by the fact that these are observational and there's been a lack of control studies investigating change of management. So the NICU seq study was designed from the outset to look at clinical utility of whole genome sequencing in this acute care population. So during the ideation for this study, we saw a lot of evidence for the diagnostic efficacy of WGH in acute care, its ability to deliver precision diagnoses that surpasses usual care, but this evidence gap in showing that those diagnoses led to clinical utility. So this study, we have designed this study to use changing clinical management as a proxy for clinical utility. So we looked at two groups to see if we can see a difference in change of management between them. The two groups are based on a randomised time delay trial design where patients were either randomised to the early arm or the delayed arm. If they're randomised to the early arm, they receive their results within 15 days. If they're randomised to the delayed arm, they receive their results approximately 60 days. And we use that 45 day window to compare between the two groups. So the overall study window was extended to 90 days to allow us to do an in-arm comparison in the delayed arm in that 60 to 90 day window. The study involved five sites across the US shown here on this map. So while all the sequencing was performed at our lab in Nixel, the samples came from these sites across the US, including Choc Children's or the Radies Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine in San Diego. The University of Nebraska Medical Center, Washington University in St. Louis, Le Bonheur Children's Hospital in Memphis, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in Philadelphia. So one of the advantages of working with this number of sites across the country is that we were able to enroll a diverse patient population that was nearly identical to the makeup of the general US population in terms of race and ethnicity. Our inclusion and exclusion criteria were designed to be intentionally broad to make this study as real world as possible and also to be as simple as possible and they're given on the, the left hand uh, side uh, of this slide. On the right hand side, I'm sorry that there's, there's you tend, tend to read all numbers but that was just to show our enrollment approach so overall 546 infants were approached to take part, 192 declined or not eligible, uh, that's approximately 35%, so which is consistent with previous studies and reflects the challenges of recruitment in the acute care setting. So a total of 354 infants were randomised to either the early arm, 176, or the delayed arm, 178, but the characteristics of both groups are similar. The majority were enrolled as trios, with 83% coming from the neonatal ICU, 7% from the paediatric ICU, and 10% from cardiovascular ICU. Um, unfortunately, there were a significant number of deaths through the study, 32, which is about 9% of the population. This is consistent with the literature and highlights the severity of disease of the enrolled patient population. So taking into account other participants lost to follow up, there were 161 and 165 infants available for investigation in the early and delayed groups respectively before the analysis of the primary outcome at day 60. Looking at the literature and having identified, oh, sorry, looking at the literature and having identified the fact that there was a gap in terms of how clinical utility is assessed, we designed this rubric of care classification shown at the top table to assess clinical management and use this to form a state change analysis. So in all cases, the site's principal investigator made the final decisions about the patient change of management based on this rubric. And change of management was assessed by comparing patient categorization at sequential visits. And you could have single or combinations of codes could be attributed to each case at each study point. And the table at the bottom of the slide shows a very high level hypothetical modelling of how we would do this analysis. We used four broad categories shown here as clinical indications for testing. So an isolated major anomaly, multiple congenital anomalies, neurological disorders or a single major clinical feature. And in this chart, the five sites have been anonymized and color coded. So you can see every site enrolled the most patients with multiple congenital anomalies, although there are significant numbers across the other clinical indications. At the time of the primary outcome, which is day 60, looking at the diagnostic efficacy, we see that 31% of patients in the early arm on the left received a diagnosis compared to 15% of those in the delayed arm on the right. This is a statistically significant difference and indicates that the systematic deployment of whole genome sequencing led to a twofold increased diagnostic efficacy compared with the aggregate usual care testing. If we look at day 90 in the charts on the right, 
the delayed arm received their WGS at day 60 and now assessing at day 90, you can see they catch up. And now both the early arm and the delayed arm have an overall, overall diagnostic efficacy of 31%. If we look at the stratification of diagnosis, we see that the highest number of patients receiving a diagnosis were those with the multiple congenital anomalies category, with 33% of those receiving a diagnosis, but the highest overall proportion within a category were those with a single major, major clinical feature, with 54% receiving a diagnosis. If we look at the distribution of variant types and inheritance patterns, whole genome sequencing, as predicted, revealed a wide range of causal variant types, including terminal and interstitial chromosomal copy number variants, complex compound heterozygous variants, mitochondrial variants, and SMN1 copy loss, leading to spinal muscular atrophy. The majority of the resolved cases were de novo variants associated with autosomal dominant disorders. None of the findings could only have been found by WGS, but you would need more than one test to cover many of them, which as we've alluded to before, is, is increased in time and more money. Our primary most important outcome for this study was looking at the change of management. So in the graph on the left, you can see at day 60, patients in the early arm did in fact receive a greater number of change of, change of management compared to those in delayed arm. We see that 21% of patients in the early arm received a change of management compared to 10% in the delayed arm, eight, two times higher. If we look again at day 90 and do an in-arm analysis, you can see that delayed arm catches up and 28% of those patients received a change of management. So it's not shown on this slide, but patients with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic WGS finding were at least threefold more likely to receive a change of management compared to those with uncertain or negative findings. So overall, 83 of 326 patients, or two thirds of those who received a genetic diagnosis by any means had a change of management. If we look at the types of change in management in this graph, the darker colours are the outcomes at day 60 and the lighter colours are the outcomes at day 90. So the most frequent changes in management at day 60 were associated with condition supportive care and included subspecialty referrals and changes to medication, followed by condition specific management, which included therapeutics specific to the primary genetic etiology and surgical interventions. All changes in management more frequent in the yearly cohort at day 60 and increase in the laid, delayed arm after the return of the WGS findings. And again, the delayed arm catches up with the early arm. Um, and unfortunately, minority of patients were redirected palliative or other supportive care. So the key findings from this study are that the clinical diagnostic efficacy was twofold higher with WGS compared to usual care testing. Receiving WGS leads to change in management twofold more frequently compared to usual care. Approximately two thirds of patients with molecular diagnosis experience a change in management, and that these can occur if the results are returned outside of the acute care setting. So, even though most of these patients would have been discharged by day 90, they were still, the genome was still acting as a health report card, continuing to inform care long term. So, the, one of the sort of conclusions is that the systematic deployment of WGS could improve overall diagnostic equity and may reduce some of these healthcare disparities. Um, and have significant benefit to these infants. So I want to move on to the second of the studies I want to talk to you about today, which is our IHOPE project. So the IHOPE program is a philanthropic program that um, aims to bring the power of genomics to patients and undeserved families around the globe. There are two aims here on the right. So to provide clinical genomic testing to resource limited patients, and to investigate the impact of whole genome sequencing on patients across different geographies and local income levels. So this map shows uh, the 24 clinical sites that, it, that I hope has supported over a thousand patients in over the last six years. We have sites in eight different countries, 34% um, of which are from lower middle income countries according to the designations from the World Health Organization. We have sent out 694 clinical utility surveys, of which we've had 693 responses um, split between the high income countries and the low middle income countries. We have a diverse set of patients, so we have a diverse set of ancestries and phenotypes. In this chart, the patient phenotypes are divided into those from um, high 
uh, high and then low middle income countries with the color density down the chart shows the rank amongst the income level. Yes, and the, the, so these are, these are the phenotypes of the patients mapped into the high level phenotype classes. And as expected, the most common referrals are from nervous system, skeletal system, head or neck and musculature. This is borne out time and time again in studies on rare disease, disease being the most frequently observed phenotypes. Um, but you can see that the phenotypes are broadly similar between the um, different income levels. But this is just to illustrate the range that we are looking at. This slide is looking at the diagnostic efficacy and uh, diagnostic thinking in this project. So again, the results are divided into those from high income countries and those from low middle income countries. So the chart on the left represents the status of the report returned, where positive, which is a darker blue, means return of a report with a diagnostic variant. C below, which is the, the small, uh, the very small line, are those that were returned with a non-diagnostic candidate variant and then negative reports are those returned and they could be returned with or without. So they're, they're returned without any findings that relating to the indication for testing, but they could be returned with or without a secondary finding. And the, 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 the blue chart shows the patients in the lower middle, middle income countries are more likely to receive a diagnostic finding. The chart on the right is looking at the change in clinical diagnosis. And again, it shows um, an increased likelihood of a change in clinical diagnosis in those from lower middle income countries. So um, and this is most, both of these results are most likely to the increased odds of there having been some prior testing in high income countries. If we look at the change of management across the cohort as a result of the clinical whole genome sequencing and using the definition given on the left of, of change of management, we see um, a change of management in 58% of the cohort overall, um, this, this, um, in this chart on the left. Um, but the CWGS does lead to a change of management in both the high income countries and the low middle income countries, with no significant difference between them. On this slide, I just wanted to talk about the impact of one of the diagnoses from this project, which I think really illustrates the power of the whole genome sequencing um, in a family with no prior testing. So this is a 22-year-old female from Peru with early onset spastic paraplegia with muscle weakness, lower limb hyperreflexia, lower limb spasticity, spastic gait and hypotonia. So this is a true analysis. And the family history was significant. Her father had Parkinsonian symptoms. After the WGS, we detected um, a paternally inherited 12 base insertion affecting the GCH1 gene, which is um, this uh, variant was classified as pathogenic. And this gene is associated with dopa responsive dystonia. So based on these results, both the patient and father received a change in management and they were treated with levodopa. And this is the comment from the uh, referring clinician. So this case was initially diagnosed without the whole genome sequencing as a spastic paraplegia syndrome. And the WGS was quite surprising. And after reviewing the literature, they found that some of these dopa responsive dystonias, which was the new diagnosis, can present the spastic paraplegia syndrome. So after the WGS starting the family on levodopa, almost, they have almost complete control of symptoms. So the patient and family are very grateful um, and the father has also started to respond well to the levodopa. So I have just two slides on the future directions for, for um, so one is for the IHOPE program. So there's very much the plans are to expand this program into other geographical areas, so into Southern Europe, to Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific and Africa, and to really increase the equity and improve outcomes for families, um, particularly um, in the low and middle income communities. And Illumina recently made a $120 million in-kind donation to the Genetic Alliance, um, with more than a third of the funds being allocated to patients in Africa. And lastly, I just wanted to, uh, to, to talk a little bit about a research project we have ongoing. So um, this is called INO, and this is a pilot study to look at the value of multi-omics in rare and undiagnosed disease diagnosis. So whilst, um, whilst obviously we've seen that the genome, and as Mark illustrated, the transcriptome is really powerful in providing diagnosis, there are all sorts of 
other other information out there, um, these, these multi-amates, uh, that could potentially increase diagnostic rates and help us to understand some of the diagnoses or confirm some of the diagnoses that we already have. So we have a cohort of 29 families who are mostly trios. They've uh, been negative on WGS testing, and we are looking at a whole range of these techniques to see to see what, what patterns we can find and see diagnosis we can confirm. So from proteomics to um, mass spec, to looking at methylation, the immune repertoire, looking at long read WGS, high depth WGS, and looking at the metabolomics. Um, so this is very much work in progress. We have some promising results where, um, particularly from the transcriptomics, where we are able to uh, confirm potential spice variants. And in one case, uh, the transcriptomics actually led us back to a potential finding of a gene and we haven't noticed there's going to be significant in this family because there wasn't as yet um, much information about the gene the disease. So I think watch this space. I think multiomics is a, a very exciting uh, part of the future of whole genome sequencing. And that's all. And I just wanted to thank all of the people. There are so many people involved in the things that I've been talking about each day. Um, uh, and thank you. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coffey. That was really a phenomenal talk and uh, really uh, interesting. And we're really excited about the IHOPE project and hoping that uh, some of our people here uh, can benefit from that collaboration. So we'll definitely uh, contact you about that in the future. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, talk, uh, which is from Dr. Najia Ganchi. She is going to be giving an online talk. Uh, uh, Dr. Ganchi is, uh, oh, she's here. Okay, oh, great, perfect. Thank you very much, I'm glad. Okay, so it says, uh, I, I misread, sorry. So Dr. Uh, Ganchi is an associate professor in section of molecular pathology and microbiology at AKU Karachi. Uh, her scholarly interest and experience focus on genetic diversity and drug resistance in malaria, parasites, and emerging infections and applications of NGS in diagnostics and research. Uh, um, uh, all over. Uh, she has extensive expertise in molecular biology and focuses on identification of the genetic characteristics of pathogens and integration of acquired knowledge into clinical diagnostics. Uh, she's been uh, a great uh, uh, partner to multiple colleagues in the AKU lab during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and has published extensively uh, on that. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ganchi, over to you. This is off. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Um, uh, so, uh, what I have seen. Okay. So, actually, Dr. Ross and Allison actually set the st stage for me that I'm going to share what we have been doing in the lab here in EKU. So, I'm going to share our experience regarding the how we have started with the NGS di diagnostic service capacity at EKU, how we did our validation studies, and what are the problems and issues we face and how we overcome those. I do not have anything to declare. There is no uh, conflict of interest. So we all know that through research and several studies that a lot of genomic data is available online and availability of this data has made us to, uh, so it, it has put pressure on all the diagnostic labs to come up with the assays which can uh, detect the, uh, the mutations in the, in the cancers or inherited diseases and then so on to look for the pathogens in the outbreak situations as well. So all the diagnostics labs are actually facing the uh, huge pressure, especially in developing countries like us, to, to come up with more uh, affordable and robust diagnostic testing. Uh, there is a high, high throughput sequencing facilities are available and uh, however they are a little bit difficult to maintain in the, in the, in the areas like uh, developing countries but however during the, uh, what we can see that during the pandemic period, the pandemic period we have learned a lot and we have achieved several milestones. So uh, why do we need uh, NGS for the clinical diagnosis? Because those are high throughput. We can monitor several mutations within a few runs. Uh, we can look at the several mutation types, which can be single nucleotide, ranges from SNPs to the deletions and various copy number changes. Uh, the availability of data in the digital form, the way we can get, we can visualize it on the, and the availability 
on the different digital platform has made things super easy for us to compare. And then they, they are co most effect, cost effective if we are doing it in a larger batches as well. Uh, as also we know that this is a time of precision medicine, which means that we need a right drug at the right time for the right person. So uh, when, we, when we bring in, and especially in case of the cancer diagnostics, we all know that um, it is very effective, it provides deep coverage, it can give you more reliable data compared to the Sanger-based uh, sequencing assays where we're looking at the only 1x coverage of those highly mutable regions. However, in, when it comes to the NGS, you can see the multiple huge uh, deep coverage to look at that how reliable your change in and which is very important but however when we start implementing NGS based testing in our clinical labs we do face d different issues which includes infrastructure cost um, if we are not planning to outsource uh, facilities there is a human resource issues the bioinformatics bar barriers what we see most of the time is the barriers with the bioinformatics and then cost to the patient. Here the system is such that there's a huge cost to the patient when it comes to the treatment options as well as the diagnostic options. So what do we deal with? If we feel that analysis is a problem, we may, uh, you know, we can anchor upon the people who have experience in research and we can collaborate with them for the analysis of our data. So when we start implementing, implementing the NGS-based diagnostics in the lab, uh, I would suggest that, and it has been proven in several guidelines that you start with the already you know, optimized panel, already tested panels to start and start small. You may go for the commercially available kit and later on when you have established you have expertise available to do your own, uh, to design your own panel, you may go towards that. Especially the labs which do not have their own research core linked to the diagnostic labs. And they, those are only available with the universities. The standard all diagnostic labs do not have that. So it's, it's a good way to start, to start with the commercially available kits. And then, however, when we start doing the NGS, uh, um, you know, validation in our labs, it is very important that you look at all type of samples which you are going to test. So when you plan to validate anything, you have to test a wide array of samples. You have to confirm the wide array of all the mutations which you are going to report. That means that you have to validate all those targets which you are going to report. So there is, uh, that's a very important point when we start implementing the, uh, implementing the NGS in the clinical labs. The, um, we have to look at the testing samples from, uh, from the range of the sample types we are going to work with. So it's very important that we look, when, we, when we plan on something, we have to plan very, very thoroughly. We cannot directly jump on doing something, uh, which means that if you have a sequencer, you can just start, jump, you start doing it. No, you have to plan ahead. It takes some time, but when you start doing it, things become more smoother for you. So why there are challenges in implementing NGS for clinical diagnosis? A lot has been talked about it, that human genome is complex. We have to decide what we want to do. Do we need, do we need a targeted genome sequencing or we need to go for a whole genome sequencing? So if we want to go for a cost effective ways, we need to decide between how would we go for the targeted versus whole genome sequencing, where the whole genome sequencing is required and where the targeted genome sequencing is required. So, uh, and, and we all know that there are, uh, when it comes to the diagnostic, there are cancer specific issues. There are problems with the sample types, the sample quality. We, most of the time we start with FFP. However, there are reports that you can go with the frozen samples. But what we have seen that whatever we have been reporting based are based on FFP. So the, the quality of the DNA effects when you try to extract it through the, uh, through the paraffin embedded tissue. So there are failure, you may see the failures in quality of, uh, quality of DNA. Uh, the, uh, and it is not, uh, the sample type when it comes to FFP, it is not good for whole genome sequencing. That means that if you want to, so it's like 
fresh, fresh versus frozen. So if you want to do a targeted sequencing, maybe frozen samples are very good. If you want to do a whole genome sequencing, you may go for the fresh frozen samples. Fresh frozen samples are more effective for the whole genome sequencing. So, um, so as I again said, the quality of the sample works really important for, the, for your uh, testing. And then there is a lot of within cancer changes. There are multiple clones, and you see multiple mutations within it. Sometimes, as Dr. And in the morning, Dr. Salman has rightly pointed out that variant, variants of unknown significance are the huge problem to us because we don't have local data. So, um, so first, the most important issue when we face. Uh, everybody heard about when we say NGS is like what data, whatever DNA you provide to a system, you, the data you get is, the, uh, is proportional to the quality of the sample. So it's like if you put in garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. That means when you start working with any NGS work, in, in NGS sequencing, you need to make sure that your sample is of a good quality. And they, those are the things we face. We face when we work with FFPE, we see a lot of uh, the issues with the old samples, old cassettes. Uh, the, the way we process samples and then, uh, as I said, that for the targeted sam samples, uh, if we go for the fresh tissues, of course, we will have problems to identify the cancer types. When we work with, that means that the laboratory diagnosis, the histopathological diagnosis has to go side by side with us if we start planning to work with the fresh, fresh samples. However, for FFPs, it's easier to work with the targeted genomes. So, um, and then there are other options such as fresh tissues and the fine needle biopsies, but that needs to be worked out. There are a lot of studies going on which are basically trying to optimize the fine needle uh, biopsies for, to bring in into the clinical diagnosis. So our experience, um, I'm going to share our experience that how we, when we started uh, the optimization or bringing in the NGS based testing in the lab, what we have noted that, um, um, well, well, all our mentors in the lab, Dr. Zara and our group, have decided to start with the smaller panel so that we try to make our validation as thorough as possible. So we started with the smaller panel of the 15 genes, which looked at the hotspot mutations. Those are the targeted sequencing gene panel compared of the 15 genes has multiple mutations and are associated with the solid tumors. So with the before, but before implementation of all the uh, testing within the lab, we have trained the personnel. There was a lot of investment in the faculty and the techni technical team to prepare for before doing the testing in the lab. We have prepared our backups when we went into the field to start our testing and when we start off offering the test in the, to the country. We have had our uh, group, our, our, our human resource trained. We had made sure that we have uh, technical services are available and then availability of the reagents. That is something which we all face while being part of the LMICs. Then a uh, major hindrance when it comes, comes is the computational capacities. We do have worked really hard to have a a very good robust computational team, but um, I would suggest that when you start, you may go for pre-available computational facilities provided by several companies, however those are expensive, but you may come up with the easier, easier options. And then it's data storage capacity. So the, before you start with any uh, any NGS facility, you also it's it's you also need to look at all these dif different supplemental uh, you know preparations when you go on to start the NGS work in your laboratory for the diagnosis. So um, this is the details of the panel which we have started in our lab and we have been doing it for past two and a, two and a half years. It looks at uh, s several uh, hotspot genes and which have hotspot mutations translated to the treatment of the patient. This is a Illumina Tumor 15 panel. Uh, so um, how we started, how we went for the validation process of the whole um, a whole essay that we started with the so it's uh, the the validation essay means that you have to analyze we have to assess all the parameters within the essays within your target types which should contain the reliability which confirms the reliability of the essay there uh, the procedure must uh, be fully documented 
your validation process should be fully documented and if there is any um, problems you see you should try to uh, troubleshoot those within within the process um, that is because this is already uh, you know commercial essay so we went for the certain performance characteristic evaluations we did the analytical sensitivity specificity reprodu repeatability and the reprodu reproducibility of the essay we looked at the LODs robustness and then before that uh, we need to the, and all these things should be measured for sample types as well as different mutations which we are going to report in our essays so if we look at 10 different mutations in NRAS gene I need to confirm all those mutations repeatedly using a control material or within its other uh, modalities such as sequ Sanger sequences or other methods and then based on all these um, uh, test we come up with a certain cutoffs that what kind of samples we are going to use for our testing what kind of depth read is required to have a reliable data reporting and then also how what samples needs re requires to be repeated what samples requires to be and you need to be very honest when you start working with your patient samples if you if you do not trust that if you feel that this data is not good enough you need to say it out loud you cannot be uh, more um, you cannot go for um, unreliable data when it comes to to the patient testing so when we started doing our performance uh, analytic performances work we we try to co to get the controls and reference materials which are available those includes uh, samples from the cap accredited lab for the from the cap as well as several commercially available um, controls which has wide array of those mutations which we need to validate for our essays so uh, we went for those and then we have tested this is um, this is a very busy slide but if you look at the right side it basically uh, provides the the uh, frequency of certain mutation of present in those controls and the data on the left side of the screen shows the reproducibility within our lab so we have done we have repeated the same sample for different runs and we have successfully produced the similar uh, frequency within within all those runs so that shows that how robust are validation studies the validation still are still for some mutation these studies are still ongoing we need to still confirm few more mutations which becomes in so it is an ongoing process however we have started uh, testing but this is an ongoing process for all NGS based testing whether it is a commercial essay or it is your in-house essay so this is a data which is generated and this is unpublished data we have so far uh, tested more than 100 samples from the different patient population and you can see that a significant number of mutations has been reported in different hotspot mutation and uh, you can see that in KRAS we have seen we have seen 8.2 and 14.6 mutation percent mutations has been noted 21.5% uh, of our samples were negative for any mutation and that can be because we have a very small panel so from here we can decide to go on for a larger panel and they may require 500 gene panel or we can go for a whole genome sequencing con considering on so it's more like a screening if you can say but however all these things are translated by the cost as well so what are the ground realities while working in the developing countries so it's the most important thing it was pandemic and we don't know what's next is coming like every few days we had this new pathogen is coming in the and it's been there's new outbreak happening so we don't know what we are going to face next but this pandemic has made us learn a lot of things and actually uh, increased our access to these new technologies um, the storage of shortage of supplies that was the biggest issue we have faced we had to stop several times just because of the shortage of supplies and that has also contributed and that has also maybe because of the pandemic that at that time a lot of sequencing happening for the viruses uh, there's a lack of local R&D capacity within the country so everything we need to get we need to we need to get it from the outside and that may that take longer time 
uh, there's a lag time from procurement to the delivery in the lab. So if you order something today, I, I, there is a chance that I'm, I'll get it after three months or maybe six months. So I don't know when I'm going to get the supplies. So we have to plan very, very, very meticulously to, to see that what I need to do within next six months. And that is one of the issues we see here in Pakistan. And then limited availability of the service, equipment maintenance, we are vendor dependent. Uh, most of the time, uh, all the advanced technologies, it's very, very, uh, you know, a single person is handling your problems. So you, often it is that you are stuck with few things. You won't be able to resolve your issues. It may take more time to get your problems. Sometimes you don't have the several machines available, so you wait for a certain part to arrive in your country and it, it delays your services as well. And then the cost. Cost is a major issue if we look at if something costs $200 somewhere else, it may cost us $500 here. So the cost is a major issue. Again, lack of the R&D in country. We are not producing our own, our own consumables within our country. And then the shortage of trained staff. So we train people and then uh, we tend to lose them because it's a new technique, people come in and then they get better opportunities. So we, that is something which we face every time in the lab. So what are the next? We need to come up with something cost effective. And this is one of the data which I have seen that um, major hindrance in, this is uh, the slide shows the graphs from the study which has been conducted in Asia Pacific. And uh, the 40% the of the physicians were facing problems when it comes to the cost only. So they were not going for the NGS based testing because of the cost. And they were going for, they were starting with the smaller test where the cost is less. And ultimately, you know, when you do array of tests, it ends up into the same cost which we go for the NGS based testing. But that is one important uh, factor which is making um, clinicians not to go for these wide array testing. And then the second is, how to interpret those data how to so sometimes they go for the data but they don't know how to what to, how to deal with that data so that is these are the two important points which comes up in this survey where they talked about the uh, what are the issues which make them not to go for ngs based testing in the in with their patients uh, the more we do ngs based testing the more whole genome data comes the more uh, patient uh, privacy will be affected. So when we start implementing this, we need to look at that as well. We need to look at the ethics of your, your whatever um, NGS-based data we p produce. We have to be very, very careful with those data, when, especially when it comes to inherited diseases and whole genome sequencing. You stumble upon many interesting things. So what are next? So uh, there's this study I come across where they look at the highly scalable uh, method where they were screening 500 solid tumor genes and using a, um, a NovoSeq, uh, they were able to screen about uh, 70 cases within a few minute. hours. Okay, I can do it really fast. So there's one more, uh, the, the, what, what new things are coming in is that basically they're using organoids to look at the, explore all the clones within the cancer and then treat them with different chemotherapies and then before the patient, when, before the patient become resistant, there is a new treatment available for this is part of a precision medicine which is coming in uh, and that has been um, in practice for renal cancers in US. Uh, that's again another uh, new mechanism which Dr. Zara also talked about this morning in TB for the drugs. So there's pharmacogenes people are looking at. So uh, now that rather than uh, for when it comes to treatment, don't go for the NGS, just look for the pharmacogenes of the whole genome and translate the, what different treatments are available for the patient. So these are the new things which are coming in. But however, before we start, we still need to bring in those techniques to our um, to our country. So this is the one last slide I just wanted to all the people who work in the lab go to the site and see it has a lot of data about the available um, testing kits, methods available which you can use in your lab and which can be more robust if you, if you want to implement. So you can have your own custom based assays as well as the already validated assays for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ratanchi, and uh, 
Uh, wonderful how you showed uh, your experience in the real world over here, which I think was phenomenal. Thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, so we're about half an hour ahead, uh, sorry, behind time. Uh, and so we're moving, going to move on very quickly to the free papers. I'm going to hold the speakers uh, to the seven minute uh, uh, time limit that we have. Our sp first speaker is Dr. Naila Sheikh, uh, who will be talking to us about the association of single nucleotide polymorphisms of the OAS1 gene with COVID-19 infection in the Pakistani population. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh. No. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Naila Sheikh from Liaquat University of Medical and Health Sciences, Jamshoro. My topic is that the association of single nucleotide polymersible of OS1 gene with COVID-19 in Pakistan population. As we all know that COVID-19 uh, is caused by SARS-CoV-2 and uh, it was first reported in the Wuhan, China in December 19. The World uh, Health Organization or WHO reported it as a pandemic in 2020, uh, March 2020. Now, the coronavirus, it is a single stranded positive sense enveloped virus belong to family coronaviridae. Now, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, it stimulates the host immune system to release the cytokines and leading to inflammation and immunological dysfunction. And the host genetic play an important role in the susceptibility of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, the genetic uh, differences are known to modulate the uh, individual susceptibility for severity of infection. Now this uh, OS gene, it is located on chromosome 12 and it encodes three antiviral OS enzyme, OS1, 2 and 3. Now this uh, the antiviral protein 2,5-oligoadenylate synthetase 1, that is the OS1, it has been linked to COVID-19 susceptibility. Two functional SNPs in the OS1 gene, RS2660 and 1133154 have been linked to the inhibition of viral replication in various or the several viral diseases. The role of interferon system against SARS-CoV-2 infection are important not only to understand the mechanism of viral pathogenesis but also to adopt effective therapeutic uh, strategy against SARS-CoV-2. Now the aim of this study is to investigate the single nucleotide po polymorphism of AOS1 gene with uh, disease susceptibility of SARS-CoV-2 in Pakistani population. Now this study is conducted at the Molecular Biology and Genetics Department and the Pathology Department of Liaquat University of Medical Health Sciences, Jamshoro. Now the mo both mole, uh, male and the female confirmed COVID positive cases are included in this study along with the healthy controls. And the uh, COVID uh, patient which are RT-PCR negative or with other viral illness, we are uh, the excluded from the study. Now this case control study, uh, it is uh, uh, approved by the uh, ethical review committee of the university and it contains 50 confirmed cases of COVID-19, 50 healthy controls and 10 ml of the whole blood is collected which is used for DNA extraction. Now in the material method, the genomic DNA is extracted and the PCR reaction are performed with the 20 microliter reaction and the PCR product is run on 2% agarose gel. Now MBOL1 restriction enzyme is used uh, for the digestion of the PCR product and the digestion reaction is incubated at 37 degrees centigrade for 1 hour. Agarose gel electrophoresis, the 2% uh, uh, on agarose gel, the digestive fragments are resolved or run and these are the uh, bands or the res uh, results you can say that we have uh, three uh, AA genotype, DG genotype and AG genotype. AA has 309 single band, it is a single band at 309 base pair, DG has two bands whereas the AG genotype uh, has uh, three bands. So uh, these are the gel pictures, then the results. Now there is uh, no, uh, the, no significance in the cases and control in the demographic variable, p-value is more than 0 0.05. These are the clinical characteristics of the patient, majority of the patient 88 percent 
are with the shortness of the breath along with the comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, some have more than one comorbidity like ischemic heart disease along with this diabetes and there is uh, lower than 93% saturation in 64% of the cases. Now these are the allele and the genotypic frequency. Uh, the A allele shows uh, high risk of COVID-19 infection in the patient with the odd ratio 2.52 and the significant p-value. Uh, in the genotypes, the AG genotypes have for more than four-fold risk of infection uh, with the odd ratio 4.8 and the AA have further raised uh, risk or the uh, more than 15.6 uh, uh, odd ratio with the significance p-value 0.006. Now to our knowledge this study is the first to investigate this uh, SNP of OS1 gene and its association with COVID-19 among Pakistani patient and in our population the A allele and the AA genotype showed increased risk to COVID-19 uh, infection. Now this study may help the researcher to understand the genetic purpose uh, pre disposition to COVID-19 infection and to identify the patient at risk. Now these are the references. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much Dr. Sheikh. Uh, really appreciate it and really appreciate you staying on time. We'll do questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Ume Kulsum. Uh, she will be talking about the pathogenesis of exonic and intronic variants in the vitamin D receptor gene with risk of susceptibility to coronary artery disease. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone. I'm Umme Kulsum, PhD research fellow at Dr. A.Q. Khan Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering, University of Karachi. And today I will be presenting the part of my PhD research work focusing on exonic and intronic variation in the vitamin D receptor gene and its association with the susceptibility to the coronary artery disease. Uh, in 2018, WHO released the country profile for non-communicable diseases of Pakistan, which stated that 58% of the deaths were uh, reported due to uh, non-communicable diseases and out of those 29 percent were accounted for cardiovascular diseases. Coronary artery disease which uh, is caused by a disease condition called atherosclerosis which reduces the blood flow towards heart. There are different uh, risk factors that are involved in the development of cor coronary artery disease. These are classified as um, non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable risk factors that include age, gender, and family history of a disease condition. On the other hand, 70% of the risk factors attributed with the coronary artery disease are potentially modifiable. For example, hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, uh, smoking, and one of the risk factors that has gained uh, recently attention are the reduced level of uh, serum vitamin D levels. Vitamin D play an uh, uh, important role uh, towards uh, maintaining the normal physiology of cardiomyocytes and it uh, also enhances the uh, production of uh, cardiac protein uh, myotrophin. It plays its anti-inflammatory role by reducing the uh, level of pro-inflammatory cytokines by enhancing the expression of anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it is important to know how the mechanism of action works. It actually requires the active form of vitamin D to bind with its receptor, vitamin D receptor, in order to uh, proceed the transcriptional regulation of different genes. However, if there is either an insufficient level of vitamin D or any uh, alteration into the receptor, the binding will not take place and it may involve in causing the risk susceptibility to different disease conditions. There are different genetic variations found in vitamin D receptor gene, while the focus of uh, this study is on uh, type 1 polymorphism, which is present in exon 9, while the intronic variation BSM1, it is found between uh, the exon 8 and exon 9. And uh, these variations have been found to be involved in causing destability to the mRNA, which later has to code for vitamin D receptor. And studies suggest that it already has been reported to found um, associated with causing a different disease condition like different types of um, infectious diseases, cancers, and um, diabetes. Based on the available information, the aim of the study was designed to find possible association of um, vitamin D levels and uh, genetic variation in vitamin D receptor DNA uh, in causing the uh, susceptibility to coronary artery disease. 
For this purpose, uh, before commencing the study, the study was ethically approved from KFG and uh, NICVD and it is a case control study which involved 516 cases and uh, 500 controls. A methodology involved biochemical analysis which were per for performed uh, using ELISA and then for the genetic analysis, uh, the DNA extraction was performed using sorting out method and which was followed by quantitative and qualitative analysis in order to check the integrity and the concentration of DNA. The targeted sequence was uh, amplified using allele specific PCR which was genotype on 2% agarose gel electrophoresis than the result were sequenced in order to confirm the sequence uh, variations and uh, results were then analyzed using bioinformatics and uh, statistical tools. Uh, the clinical parameters were found significantly different among cases as compared to control, especially serum vitamin D levels. The genotyping uh, successful amplification resulted in 148 base pair of exonic variation, which was uh, confirmed by using uh, sequencing. And uh, while performing multiple sequence alignment against ancestral wild uh, sequence, we found the presence of both variant mismatch and uh, wild match. Here, the presence of uh, red peak representing the white allele and the presence of blue peak representing the variant C allele. The uh, uh, genotype and allelic frequency uh, were uh, heterozygosity was found more common in our cases as compared to control while the presence of wild allele and genotype was more common in our controls. The odds ratio or the risk association analysis shows that the variant C allele in TAC1 polymorphism increases two times more risk with the variant C allele as compared to wild type. Similar pattern was followed in order to analyze the intronic variation. The successful amplification result in 534 base pair band and the results were similarly sequenced and matched against wild ancestral sequence and we found the presence of both wild and the variant um, variations. Uh, however, in case of uh, intronic variation, we did not found any significant difference in our genotype and allele and similarly, no significant association was found with the disease risk. For um, haplotype and uh, linkage, this equilibrium analysis was calculated in order to uh, find the um, inheritance patterns. And for a uh, linkage, this equilibrium plot, it represents that the uh, intronic and exonic variation were found 32% uh, in linkage. While for the haplotype analysis, the haplotype TC combination, which is representing the variant allele of both intronic and exonic, it uh, increases the risk of uh, coronary artery disease more as compared to their other haplotypic combinations. So on the basis of these results, we can conclude that the serum vitamin D levels were found significantly lower in our subjects with a coronary artery disease as compared to controls. The exonic variation was found more uh, associated with the disease risk as compared to our, uh, sorry, exonic variation was found associated with the disease risk as compared to the intronic variation. The LD plot suggested that the correlation of linkage between uh, these polymorphism was found 32%, while the haplotype combination of both uh, variant allele from intron and exon uh, is found uh, significantly associated with the disease risk. These uh, were the references that were used to prepare this presentation. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mikulsoon, and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, we have Dr. Sara Sajid as our uh, final speaker. She will be talking about a novel homozygous complex deletion in CFTR causing cystic fibrosis in a Pakistani patient. Dr. Sajid. Assalamu My name is Sana Sajid. I'm a technologist working as a technologist in Aga Khan University Hospital Molecular Pathology Department. Today I'm going to here to present a topic that multiple exon deletion in the CFTR gene of patients suspected for cystic fibrosis in Pakistan population. Next. Sorry. Introduction. First, first of all, I would like to give you a short introduction about the cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder caused by mutation in CFTR gene, that is cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductor regulator gene. It's a genetic disease that affects lungs, pancreas, digestive systems, and other organs. Mostly, point mutation in CFTR gene produce an abnormal CFTR protein. Dysfunctional CFTR protein channel results in production of a sticky and thick mucus, 
particularly in lungs and digestive system. CFTR exists in chromosome number seven in long arm Q. Objective, uh, the objective of my study is uh, the aim of the study to identify possible molecular aberration in patients who have failed to show their PCR amplification with Delta 508 primers, both in normal and the mutant allele. Now moving toward method and materials. Total 50 patients who were suspected for cystic fibrosis disease, cystic fibrosis disease were analyzed. DNA from peripheral blood samples was extracted by a Kaijen DNA extraction mini kit. Quality and quantity of DNA specimen were confirmed by nanodrop. Specimens, all of the specimen were tested first for, with Delta 508 arms PCR. Those specimen who were failed to, uh, to show their amplification, who didn't show their amplification with the primers of arms PCR were proceeded toward the MLPA assay. MLPA is a multiplex ligation pro ligation depress uh, by, by the principle of capillary electrophoresis. In capillary electrophoresis, when moving uh, uh, cathode anode to cathode, a sc screen and detector system will uh, detect uh, all the uh, uh, labeled fluorescent labeled dye probe and uh, uh, and generate a peak. For data analysis, we use covalizer software created by MRC Holland. Here's the representative image for an electrophorogram produced by Kofflizer software. Now moving toward the result of my study. Uh, with Delta 508 mutation in uh, ARMS PCR, we got 36 patients concluded as negative because they have normal allele. They show amplification with normal allele, but the mutant allele was not present in them. Seven patients were concluded, uh, concluded as heterozygous for Delta 508 mutation because they have both the normal and the mutant allele. Three patients were concluded as the homozygous because they don't have normal allele, but they have mutation allele. While rest four uh, results were inconclusive because uh, with the check of QC, okay, they didn't show any amplifications with the normal allele or the, and the mutant allele. The rest four samples were uh, private proceeded with MLPA PCR and MLPA pr revealed that they have multiple exon deletions. Uh, that is homozygous multiple uh, exon deletion from exon four to an exon 11, including the primer binding site of CFTR gene that, is, that exists in exon 10. So I'm going to conclude my study. Our study concludes that, similar to Caucasians, Delta 508 point mutation is frequently associated with the cystic fibrosis in Pakistani population. In addition, large deletion encompassing more than one exon of the CFTR gene also exists in our population. Beside point mutation, exon deletion should also be looked in case of uh, abnormal PCR amplification patterns. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Sarah. So I think uh, with that, we've concluded our session, but we are open for questions now. Our uh, two online speakers are still with us. Uh, can you please confirm that uh, uh, for me? And then we'll uh, have the audience uh, please ask questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, still here. I have a question for Alison, if she's still there. Is, is, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, I'm still here. Okay. My apologies. Uh, Alison, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding the ICU whole genome sequencing that you were talking about. And, and it's phenomenal if, you know, the sequencing early on can help these um, babies. Um, what kind of turnaround time is required, you think, to make an impact? That is a really good question um, because um, I think there's a difference of opinion in the field as to what the appropriate turnaround time is in these situations. Um, we do have we have a turnaround time of less than 15 days for these cases to make it as rapid as possible. There are institutes, um, Radies in particular, who's in San Diego are offering more like a 24 hour turnaround time, but there's some thought that that is. Uh, possibly too quick in terms of um, the time of taking the sample, but also in, in going on to make decisions. It's, this is a very sensitive time. So I think the time, 
the timing of when the tests are done um, also perhaps has an impact. But I think in terms of certainly delivering within sort of within the 30 days seems to have a significant effect. So I'm not quite sure if I kind of tried to answer two questions there because I think there are two parts that answer is the turnaround time for the sequencing return of the results, but also the appropriate time to do the testing. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I seem to have lost the room. Am I still there? We can hear you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions uh, from the audience? I have a question for Dr. Ross while the audience uh, gathers their thoughts uh, to ask more questions. So thank you so much for staying, Dr. Ross. Uh, uh, you know, we have um, very little experience in the clinic of actually uh, getting whole genome sequencing uh, on, on tumor tissue, uh, and the few that have been done have been sent uh, to the U.S. Uh, to either the foundation or some, some of the other labs. And uh, the problem we've had in uh, getting those results back uh, in a meaningful way is that some of the interventions that are then suggested are just not available in our part of the world very challenging to get and also that uh, you know by the time that uh, results are received and uh, you know the the tumor biology may have changed further and uh, you know that especially with the aggressive tumors so uh, with the NHS uh, and, and your collaboration uh, with them uh, have they been able to show uh, that within a, a health system uh, like the NHS that uh, these meaningful results can be actually uh, you know, used to change outcomes in a, in a really meaningful way? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And I'm, I'm not, probably not the best person to answer that question because get involved beyond, in the Genomics England project, we don't get involved really beyond generating the data, which are then passed on, passed back to the clinicians and researchers. So we, we hear about uh, high profile anecdote cases, but I haven't heard what the overall um, kind of uh, what the overall meaningful um, intervention rates have been uh, based on the, on the information. I think particularly within the 100,000 Genomes Project uh, and going back to the previous question about um, turnaround times, uh, I think that in the early stages of the project, particularly, um, it was a lengthy process to get information, uh, to get access to the data, to analyze the data and to come up with the meaningful conclusions. I think that's become more streamlined um, and through the genomic medicine service, that's improving. But I still think there are some delays um, in being able to uh, being able to have the information in a very rapid fashion and then to intervene. But I don't know what the overall statistics are on the interventions based on the data. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear from that uh, group as uh, they publish their outcomes uh, in the near future. Yeah. Um, any yeah. other questions? I think we have more from yeah. the audience. Yeah, hi. Okay, so I was just wondering uh, about, you mentioned the genomic and transcriptomic sequencing in clinical um, oncology. Um, mm -hmm. Since, uh, as uh, Dr. Salman Kirmani just said, whole genome sequencing is very expensive and we send them mostly abroad. Uh, do you find any transcriptomic standalone markers that one can use as targeted sequencing? Yeah, it, it's a very good question, actually, and it's one that we do debate internally. My own personal view, based on being able to access both types of information, is that um, is that the uh, the combination is best. If you, in some cases we only have access to an RNA sample from a patient, and that can still be very valuable, um, both for calling variants such as gene fusions. Uh, but also, you know, small uh, point mutations can be detected as long as they're expressed in the tissue. Um, so it's, it, it is a very valuable standalone assay. You can obviously run more samples in parallel and it's cheaper to run uh, those samples. And also it's been shown in certain cancer types, such as uh, in ALL, that having um, those kinds of gene expression profiles I showed earlier, um, is a very powerful tool to be able to stratify patients and onto different into different risk uh, categories, and that's particularly been shown by the Saint Jude uh, group. 
Um, so each, I think each, um, each method has its own strengths and weaknesses, but bringing them together, you really get the benefits of both. Thank you. So I have one question more. For, yeah. So we, we, we usually do the more known phenotypic uh, cases for, for genetic testing and uh, sequencing. Do you have experience about the carcinoma of primary unknown? Um, we we haven't done a project. Is, is that that's for me? Presumably, is it the um, cancer of unknown primary? Um, so, we personally don't have experience of looking into that. But this, this is a very interesting area, I think, and it's one of those. Um, if you were thinking about okay, we can't afford to maybe do everything by whole genome sequencing at, at the, uh, from the outset which are the indications that might be the most valuable to address initially? And cancer of unknown primary is, is one of those groups, I think, um, where whole genome could be very powerful as a, as a way of determining the primary cancer. And I think groups like Edwin Kuppen's group in, in the Netherlands at the Hartwig Medical Foundation, they are definitely taking that approach. Um, they started off, I think, with patients with metastatic disease, in other words, patients of last resort and trying to use whole genome to, uh, to repurpose drugs from other, uh, from other cancers, maybe. But they've now moved on to cancer of unknown primary. And they, I think I'm right in saying that they actually have uh, reimbursement now in the Netherlands for that group of patients to do whole genome sequencing for cancer of unknown primary. So I think it's a really good target uh, group. Wonderful. With that, uh, thank, I think with that, we'll formally end our session. I'd really like to thank all of our speakers, including our online speakers, as well as uh, our speakers here. And uh, we, I think we had a fantastic session. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Just very quickly, we have a, a, a token of thanks for um, our speaker and sorry, apologies. We have a small token of thanks for our speakers today and our chair. So if we'd have the speakers today, Dr. Nadia, Dr. Romina, would you be kind enough to thank you. And Dr. Salman, take it. Okay. And Dr. Salman Gurmani, thank you very much for chairing this session. It's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're taking just a 15 minute break. We are very behind. Please just stretch your legs and try and come back as quickly as possible. Okay? Thank you.
Um, hi, good morning. David, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm so sorry. We, we are just running a little bit behind. We, we're going to be about 10 minutes. Um, is it okay for me to ask you to wait for 10 minutes before you start your presentation? Ab absolutely. I just saw your email. Okay, thank you. And I'm so sorry that it's really early in the morning. But, no problem. Uh, we're, thrilled. we're thrilled that you're here and uh, looking forward to your presentation. So I will, um, I will just connect again. Well, we're already connected, but I will speak to you again in about 10 minutes. I'll, I'll just be, I'll be right here. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Bye. Perfect. You're welcome. Bye-bye.
Assalamualaikum everyone. Um, we're passing on a piece of paper um, and we would like, you know, in our effort to make a AMPP community, for those who are interested, please leave your name, designation and email address on this paper because we'll be putting it together at the end of a conference um, and we can use it to get in touch with you. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back, everyone. So we are starting our next session, uh, session number four. Um, I'll be the moderator for the next two sessions. Um, and um, we have very exciting talks planned, um, starting with a talk from Dr. Miller, who um, I believe is already online and waiting. So uh, Dr. Miller, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. So um, it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Miller. Um, I, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a student of Dr. Miller. I recently completed a course from uh, Harvard Medical School online, and it was an absolute honor to be taught by Dr. Miller. So I'm so happy and thankful that uh, you are here today and you're going to enlighten us about your research work. So um, uh, Dr. Miller, um, he's at the, um, uh, yeah, Dr. Miller is an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard, Harvard Medical School and director of the multidisciplinary neurofibromatosis clinic at Boston Children's Hospital. He received his MD and PhD from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, completed his residency in pediatrics at Yale and a residency fellowship in clinical genetics and clinical molecular genetics at Harvard Medical School. He's a board certified clinical genetics, uh, geneticist and clinical molecular geneticist. Do Dr. Miller created the neurofibromatosis research initiative at Boston Children's Hospital in order to um, uh, order to advance and preclinical research towards effective treatment. So over to you, Dr. Miller, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, sharing my screen so that uh, hopefully you can see my slides now. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Very good. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today, and I hope to be able to visit sometime. Um, I'm, I'm going to just give you a uh, very brief overview of the context of why I uh, started this research project. So I take care of a lot of patients that have neurofibromatosis, and uh, among those patients, 
sometime in their lifetime, they may develop a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor and uh, that we don't have currently any effective treatments for those tumors and they're very aggressive soft tissue sarcomas. And the story revolves around the RAS pathway. So all of the symptoms related to neurofibromatosis happen due to problems in the RAS pathway. And there's a germline loss of function variant in the NF1 gene. NF1 is a, a RAS GTPase, so loss of function of NF results in overactivation or dysregulation of the RAS pathway. And then all of the individual symptoms related to NF, all the physical differences are related to somatic mutations that result in loss of heterozygosity just within a particular cell type at a particular time in development. And depending on which cell type it is and when it happens, it will cause different problems. So for example, early loss of heterozygosity for NF1 in oligodendrocytes results in the optic pathway gliomas. Um, if it happens in astrocytes, it may cause low-grade gliomas. And if it happens in Schwann cells, it causes a plexiform neurofibroma, which is in this picture here on the next slide. Uh, and this is a, a benign tumor that happens along the peripheral nerves, either internally or externally, um, but related to the peripheral nerves. And uh, these can be asymptomatic for long periods of time, but they also can grow quite large. They can be located in uh, areas that cause problems such as the airway. And also within this tumor that has loss of heterozygosity for NF1, it may acquire additional genetic changes that result in malignant transformation. And our goal was really to understand what were these additional genetic events that would cause the malignant transformation with the hopes that it would identify treatment targets. So um, if we don't have the ability to, um, uh, if we have these patients who have the, uh, the benign tumor, we sometimes don't have the ability to detect the malignant transformation until it's quite advanced. But some of the things that might lead us to believe that the patient has a malignant tumor are a pain that is in a previously painless tumor, or if the tumor has changed in terms of its physical characteristics, either the size of it, if it's enlarging on, over a short period of time, or if it has developed, for example, a hard mass within a previously soft benign tumor. If we have those types of things happen, we may do a uh, another imaging test called a PET CT scan, uh, that's positron emission tomography, and that's a way of identifying metabolically active tissues. And uh, so over a certain threshold, it would lead us to believe the tumor is malignant. But by then, it's often difficult to remove the tumor surgically or it has already started to metastasize. So I'm very interested in the idea of using genomic technology to diagnose the presence of a malignant transformation as early as possible. Um, the treatment of these tumors involves surgical resection, and I, I'll kind of skip ahead over this slide, but uh, the, uh, the main issue is that we don't really have currently any tumor or any treatment that will, um, treat, will cure this tumor. Basically, the, the only curative therapy is complete surgical resection, which often involves damaging the nerves that are associated with the tumor. So in this effort to, uh, to better understand the genomics of this tumor, I've, I've div I had some uh, philanthropy money and started a group called the Genomics of MPNST or GEM Consortium, uh, which was several sites uh, primarily in the US and Europe, but we really made an effort to find people all around the world. And it was a sort of a select group because they had to have already been uh, collecting tumors that were fresh frozen samples that had been consented for genomic analysis. 
Uh, and then what we did is we uh, collected a lot of clinical information about the, it, the people who had these tumors. Uh, we were mainly trying to find patients who had NF1, but uh, a significant proportion of our cohort are people who had a sporadic MPNST, not in the setting of a germline NF1 mutation. We collected all this clinical information in a clinical registry that had been started by Angela Herbie at Washington University in St. Louis. She's a medical oncologist and NF researcher. And her trainee, Vanessa Yulo, who is now at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, uh, they, um, they developed this red cap registry for storing the clinical information. And then once we got the clinical samples, my research coordinator, a pictured there, Catherine Piccolo, um, she coordinated with me the, um, the aggregation of all the samples and the processing of the tissues. And we had uh, deep whole genome sequencing done in a bulk format on um, almost 90 tumors, five low-grade MPNSTs and 85 high-grade MPNSTs in addition to uh, a few precursor lesions. And we did uh, 60X whole genome sequencing as well as RNA sequencing, uh, methylation profiling, and uh, most, perhaps most importantly for what I'm gonna show you, uh, we did a, a, a ploidy analysis through flow cytometry sordering of the cells um, because uh, it was very difficult to determine the true ploidy based on the genomic information that we had. We also did a, um, a coordinated pathology review of these tumors. So for those of you as pathologists who are familiar with these types of sarcomas, they can be difficult to come to an accurate diagnosis. Um, in addition, we collected multiple sites within individual tumors in order to do intratumor heterogeneity studies with deep exome sequencing. And what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is related to the fact that we found that uh, the tumors, when we did methylation profiling, they broadly fell into two categories, those that had lost global methylation or trimethylation of uh, H3K27, the lysine 27, and uh, whereas other tumors had retained that methylation signature. And we had hoped that that um, information would be useful that the methylation classification would help us to coordinate that with the histological classification. So Alia Al Abrahimi, who is here in this picture, is a young uh, pathologist who's at Boston Children's and she coordinated the pathology review among expert sarcoma pathologists. And we had, it, we had suspected that perhaps the um, the artificial intelligence methylation classifiers that have been developed at Heidelberg University in Germany would be useful in coordinating with the tissue classification. Um, and the, the picture that's on the right hand of this slide here is rather complicated. Um, but what it basically shows is that if we think of the tumors as either those that have a germline NF mutation, that are either of conventional or non-conventional histology. So that's the left side of that diagram. Um, or if they are the sporadic MPNSTs with either conventional or non-conventional histology. Um, on the, it shows basically that um, when we look on the right-hand side of that, we see what the methylation classifier called those tumors. And maybe about half the time, the ones that were conventional MPNSTs were classified that way by the methylation classifier, but many times they were classified as other types of tumors. Um, and so it, I think it basically points out the fact that as the pathologist, uh, knowing the clinical information about the patient and more of the, the clinical context is very important as well as knowing the genomic information is important in arriving at the correct diagnosis. Um, and there's uh, Dr. Ibrahimi is, is going to be writing up a paper about that separately as well. So uh, I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, this is uh, the 
to discuss the genomic data that we identified. So I mentioned that the tumors that start as uh, NF germline loss of heterozygosity then acquire additional genetic changes. Uh, the first of which seems to be inactivation, at least in most cases, inactivation of CDK and 2A, which is another tumor suppressor gene, and, um, and also loss of the genes that involve the PRC2 or polycomb repressor, repressor complex. Um, that happens in the majority of both NF1-related and sporadic MPNSTs. Um, in the, in the, uh, the histogram that you see in the picture here, um, basically what that's showing you is that the, the, two, the ones that are red are the ones with loss of H3K27 trimethylation. The ones with blue are those that have retained that trimethylation signature. And then the black dots at the bottom of each column are indicating the status for NF germline versus sporadic or whether there was a CDKN2A or PRC2 mutation identified. Basically what you can see there is that there's, um, there's a lot of um, heterogeneity in terms of whether or not the um, tumors of a different category end up having loss or retention of H3K27. So it happens in both the NF germline and in the sporadic mutations that you get a mixture of, of tumors. Um, and so, in other words, to say it's not possible to know exactly what the um, characteristics of the tumor will be without doing the testing. But we think that it could be important to know these things. Um, so, for example, knowing the H3K27 status may have some clinical relevance for the oncologists who are caring for the patient. Uh, in our patients who have NF1, we see that the uh, loss of H3K27 results in worse long-term uh, survival over the course of five years um, by this Kaplan-Meier curve. In other words, the ones with retention of H3K27 show uh, a better survival profile. And we, um, we wanted to then see, were there any biological differences of the tumors that might correlate with that different clinical behavior? I, I should mention, I guess, that in, we didn't see this uh, reach statistical significance among the people who had the sporadic tumors, but um, part of the problem there is that we had fewer of those individuals in the cohort, so we may have just lacked the statistical significance to identify that. So in terms of looking at biological differences between these tumor categories, um, we found differences in the genomic profiles. Um, I mentioned that the ploidy analysis was very important, and that's because we found that for these tumors, a large proportion of them have uh, an initial event where they have haploidization of most of the chromosomes in the genome well, to where they only have one copy of each of those chromosomes in the tumor cells. And then that's followed by genomic doubling events, which maintain then a diploid state. Uh, but in many cases, it's through copying of one chromosome so that the the two copies of the chromosome are identical and they have absence of heterozygosity. And so what this um, diagram is showing here is uh, the black traces of each chromosome are the copy number and the gold uh, traces are the uh, indication of the proportion of, of tumors in the cohort that have loss of heterozygosity for a particular chromosome. And so a couple things stand out. The tumors that are the, the ones that have, say, a worse prognosis with the loss of H3K27 trimethylation have a higher degree of absence of heterozygosity. They also have gains of chromosome 8, and um, they, the, even when they go through this haploidization process, they tend to remain diploid at chromosome 8, and then when the genomic doubling events happen, they end up with three or four copies of chromosome 8. Um, and that happens in a large proportion of tumors. I also have a couple of uh, arrows there showing the chromosomes that include CDK and 2A and the NF1 gene uh, to highlight the fact that there are often 
uh, genomic loss of heterozygosity events for those two genes. Um, so the summary of this is that the tumors are genomically complex. There are a lot of chromosome changes. Um, and also, I don't have a diagram of it, but we, we looked very carefully for a single nucleotide variants and really didn't find any recurrent single nucleotide variants that were drivers. So really the drivers of these tumors are massive changes in uh, whole chromosome arms or whole chromosomes. We also saw some, some trends in terms of this whole genome doubling event. Um, they do occur, the whole genome doubling occurs in the majority of tumors and uh, even more so in the tumors with the loss of trimethylation. And it seems to happen at different time points. So it seems to happen earlier in tumor uh, evolution in the ones that retain H3K27 as opposed to the ones that lose it. What the biological relevance, relevance of that is, we're not sure. But it has allowed us to create a couple of um, pathway diagrams of these two tumor types. And um, I won't go describing this in great detail, uh, but we do, I have a link at the end to the preprint of this. It's currently in peer review right now for the publication. Um, but basically the tumors that have retention of H3K27, um, they have the biallelic loss of the NF1 and CDK and 2A. They undergo a number of uh, chromosomal loss of heterozygosity events and whole genome doubling, or they undergo mitotic errors. And, uh, and then they become very unstable and have uh, this chromosome instability causes the loss and gain of particular chromosome arms. Uh, one of the key things that we noticed from the RNA sequencing data is that these tumors that have retention of H3K27 have a lot more markers of immune cell infiltration. And we're hoping that that might indicate that they might be amenable to some form of immunotherapy, but that's going to need further work to study that. In comparison, and again, I don't expect you to digest this whole diagram in a, in a very short period of time, uh, but in comparison, the, the uh, tumors with loss of H3K27, they start through a similar pathway, but there seem to be some differences in the chromosome events that happen, particularly the retention of chromosome 8 and the later uh, whole genome doubling. So, so the main take home from this slide is, one, there seems to be something important about chromosome eight, and there's ongoing work now to try to understand what that might be. Uh, we've looked at the RNA sequencing data and there's not any particular clue that's jumping out from that. Um, but the other thing we see from the RNA sequencing data is that these tumors show um, not very much representation of immune cell infiltration in these tumors. So there seems to be that biological um, connection to this, the tumor classification. What I'm perhaps most excited about is that we are able to identify this complex uh, chromosome copy number pattern in cell-free DNA from patients with an MPNST. Um, and so basically what we're seeing here is a, similar to the slide that I showed earlier that shows the chromosome copy number. Um, this is a slightly different representation of chromosome copy number, but what it's showing is in the, uh, in the top sample here, in the top of the diagram, this is the chromosome copy number profile for the tumor sample of MPNST. In the bottom is in the cell-free DNA. And you can see that the, the copy number signature is easily identified in the cell-free DNA. So we're now undertaking some um, uh, investigations to look into the possibility that we can use this liquid biopsy as an early detection mechanism so that we could, uh, at a very early stage, identify this malignant transformation. Uh, there are other signatures where we could look for just the CDK and 2A, for example, at a very early stage, and then hopefully be able to have the tumors surgically removed before they become the more aggressive um, tumor. 
I, I did mention that there's a preprint available. It's on our NF Research Initiative uh, website. So that's just at the NF Research Initiative at uh, Boston Children's. We have a website and the, the link to the preprint is there. It's also available on BioArchive uh, with my name. And we also created a, a CBIO portal uh, instance in order to look at the data. And we've deposited all the data at the European Genome Phenome Archive. I want to end by thanking all my collaborators. These are the co-leaders of the consortium uh, who were really heavily involved in the strategic planning and execution of the project. And um, I, there are many more people to thank, all the people who helped us by uh, the clinicians who collected samples and the, the pathologists at different sites and so forth. Um, and then most importantly, I want to thank all of the people who uh, the people who funded it, which was an, a family that gave a generous philanthropic gift to our our uh, research program. And then I want to thank all of you for your attention and, and your warm welcome. And um, again, I hope I will get a chance to meet some of you someday. Thank you, Dr. Miller. <clears throat> that was absolutely fascinating, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know it's really early in the morning, and I also believe it's the Thanksgiving weekend. So if you can, no problem. Uh, if you can um, uh, stay with us till the end of the session, so we will be taking some question and answers then. I sure will. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So um, we move on to the next speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, invite Dr. Ahmed Gilani. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Gilani um, graduated from Aga Khan University Medical College in 2004 and holds a PhD in neurosciences from the Graduate School of Arts and Science at Columbia University. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Pathology, and um, he uh, qualifications in neuropathology and pediatrics pathology. Dr. Emma trained at uh, SUNY and Mount Sinai and has uh, been an assistant professor at the University of Colorado uh, and was the only pediatric neuropathologist serving the seven-state uh, Rocky Mountain area for several years. He's the author on, uh, he's the author and co-author of close to 50 peer-reviewed publications in the field of pathology and neurosciences. His current research interests uh, include development, uh, developmental disorders of CNS and the correlation between histologic and molecular findings in brain tumors. So uh, I'm most pleased to invite Dr. Ahmed Gilani. And I would also like to introduce the chair for the session. Uh, Dr. Romina Kazi, who's the uh, section head of molecular pathology at uh, Shakat Khanna Memorial Hospital. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction, and I'm always surprised by how far you can get without uh, actually knowing anything. Um, okay, so my um, job today is to convince you that molecular uh, Techniques have a role in diagnosis of uh, diagnosis and treatment of brain tumors. Uh, that is actually a hard sell for the histopathologist. I uh, recently hopped over from the um, histopathology site, and they were telling me, you know, the morphology is the main thing. Um, okay, so um, that's exactly where we start from. So here in 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 this figure, you can see that uh, uh, normal cells. Um, so our diagnostic criteria is based upon how uh, closely a tumor resembles with the normal cells um, of, of a particular type. For example, if, if a tumor re resembles oligodendroglia, it would be called an olig olig oligodendroglioma. Um, if it resembles an ependymal cell, it would be called um, ependymoma and so on. Uh, but in the past, uh, so that criteria has been there for almost 100 years. We started uh, um, uh, more um, uniform, uniformity in uh, diagnosis with the launch of uh, WHO classification system in 1979, and we're uh, currently on the fifth edition in uh, launch last year. Um, so um, between 1979 and today, there has been all, 
a lot of work in the field of um, molecular biology, biology of tumors, and we have uh, found out molecular drivers of many uh, different tumors, including uh, brain tumors. Um, in the field of brain tumors, the um, idea that uh, molecular features of a tumor play a very important role in clinical behavior uh, really came to light with the identification of IDH1 uh, gene, um, which was uh, found in a large cohort of uh, uh, tumor, um, the cancer genome atlas. So when people um, reanalyzed the exomes present on TCGA, they found out that uh, this gene, uh, uh, IDH1, correlated very well with tumor prognosis. So you can see uh, overall survival here, and, uh, and the, um, the, the ones in, um, in orange are the, um, are the IDH uh, mutants, which behaved much better than the one, uh, the uh, IDH wild types. Um, and uh, so that was early, uh, in mid-2200s uh, or uh, in, in 2007, I think. And um, between that time when our um, WHO classification of fourth edition was launched in 2007, and now, and, uh, and the Next edition was launched in 2016. So between that that time, the cost of NGS was reduced by about 10,000 fold, um, as you can see here. So um, that really enabled us to start carrying out uh, sequencing targeted as well as whole genome and whole exome, exome on large uh, numbers of samples of uh, brain tumors. So uh, in 2000. Um, 16, uh, the WHO came up with the idea that each tumor type has to be uh, classified according to its uh, histologic pattern, uh, which includes the grade of the tumor, but should also include uh, any molecular alterations that are known to be associated with that histologic type. Um, and that concept is called the, uh, in the layered or integrated diagnosis. Um, so, um, um, in 2022, uh, what, what has uh, changed is that a lot of those tumors um, are, can now be diagnosed um, um, exclusively on the presence of molecular alterations. And um, for many tumor types, including the ones listed here, uh, you have to find out the <coughs> molecular alterations before you can diagnose that uh, tumor type. Um, so um, um, I started my, my independent practice in Colorado in 2017, and over the past five or six years, uh, these are the tools that I've used uh, to routinely diagnose tumors, uh, including uh, classical tools like histology and immunohistochemistry. Uh, followed by FISH, NGS, and DNA methylation. So I um, uh, diagnosed about 500 or 600 pediatric tumors over the course of that time. When I came to AKU, I found out that that's a number which I would easily surpass in the first six months. So <laughs> this country is just on a different scale. Um, so based on uh, my experience with all those tools, uh, we were able to correlate uh, histologic diagnosis with molecular uh, techniques, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so a uh, little bit about our NGS panel. We used a 50-gene DNA and 50-gene um, RNA panel uh, for the first few years, uh, which was from uh, Archer DX, a company based in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and the list of genes are shown here. So um, um, in 2019, we moved on to a larger 500 plus gene panel for both mutations and, and fusions. And in the past uh, couple of years, we have started using uh, DNA methylation. Um, so um, if um, people are not familiar with that, I will give a 
very brief overview. So that, uh, so we use an an um, um, Illumina um, array which looks at the global CPG methylation patterns uh, in in tumors. So uh, when people did that on uh, brain tumors, they found out that uh, histologically uh, defined brain tumors clustered into uh, into groups um, on DNA methylation, which you can see on this uh, clustering T-SNE plot. So each of those cluster uh, correlates with a particular histologic type. So once you have this, you can now use uh, this to uh, to take uh, novel samples or new uh, tumors and then see how how much it uh, they resemble these tumors on um, whether they cluster with those or not and that that can help you diagnose them um, so uh, these are the lessons I've learned over uh, doing this exercise and I would have about eight of them that I would uh, will uh, go through very quickly. So, f first of uh, all, uh, regardless, uh, irrespective of what the histopathologists tell you, histology cannot predict the fusions or mutations in a large number of uh, pediatric brain tumors. Um, we reviewed our our uh, experience with low grade. Uh, tumors and uh, found out that we were not able to, to predict exactly what, what fusion would be present in a particular histologic type. Um, so uh, um, how we did that was we did histology review, then it would go to, onto our in-house NGS, and if we were not able to find an oncogenic driver, we would give it out, uh, send it out for a larger pellet panel at Foundation Medicine or uh, Boston Children's or St. Jude. But um, well we found out that, so, it's, so one important I, um, um, lesson is that we were not able to find the fusions. For example, in this case in which uh, the fusion found uh, or the SA found an MIP-QKI uh, fusion which is diagnostic for an angiocentric glioma. But based on histology, we were calling it a more uh, commonplace pilocytic astrocytoma. So NGS can, can definitely add uh, to the diagnosis in that way. Um, the other lesson was that uh, a well-designed panel, uh, which is relatively small, can was able to capture most of the, the uh, cases or was able to find the alterations in most cases. For example, um, only 15% of cases we were not able to come up with a diagnosis and, f and uh, moved it on to to, to larger panel. Um, all right, next. Um, so this is a large study of about 1,000 uh, low-grade gliomas, not ours study, uh, we showed that three uh, genetic alterations uh, were uh, accounted for the oncogenic, uh, dry, uh, were the oncogenic drivers in about two-thirds of all low-grade tumors. So if, if you have, if you test for those three, you would be able to catch, you know, at least two-thirds of your uh, cases. Um, the other um, lesson was that uh, not every tumor followed the um, well-defined, you know, uh, the criteria. For example, we were able to find many cases in which the histology did not match the reported fusions or mutations report, uh, for that uh, histologic type. So new pairings were found, uh, new locations were found for different tumors. So these papers showed a novel uh, location for this tumor, MGMT, uh, which is classically in the um, septal region, but we re reported it in the brainstem and in the temporal region. So you would find new, new, new tumors, essentially, if, if you do multiple techniques. Um, um, also, this novel um, 
um, no, novel fusion uh, was found. Um, and so the next lesson was that uh, the uh, molecular findings are good, but they still need a histologic correlate. For example, you can see the same um, molecular alteration, for example, FGFR um, fusion in this case, or BRAF, in multiple different types of tumors with, with, with very little uh, or very different clinical behavior. Part of that is, is, in this case, would be explained by this CDKN2A deletion, which Dr. Miller also um, referred to. Um, so um, histology is still needed. Um, and so, um, um, and then histology in, uh, or molecular findings in some cases can trump the histologic diagnosis. And I w would give the example of CDKN2A, similar to, the, to its, its role in MPNST, uh, is able to um, upgrade a tumor to a higher WHO grade irrespective of its molecular, of, of its morphologic features. Um, this case uh, turned out to be a uh, turned out to be a low grade glioma on histology. And you can see the the uh, MRI there, which shows like a infiltrated gli uh, glioma. So we predicted it to to um, to uh, behave uh, less aggressively, but in about eight months, it turned out in, into a GBM, and uh, we found out that uh, many other people were reporting that, and the underlying uh, biological uh, factor was the loss of, of uh, chromosome 10 or gain of chromosome 7, which has now been uh, introduced as, as, as a diagnostic criteria for GBM. So irrespective of histology, if you find these features, you can call it a GBM and expect it to behave badly. Um, lastly, I guess uh, the DNA methylation is a very powerful tool. Um, Dr. Miller referred to, to um, as some cases in which it was helpful, some cases in which it was not. But for brain tumors, um, the, the, uh, in our experience, it's very, very reliable. Definitely not, has to be used uh, in the, uh, along with other information. Um, and um, the important thing about this tool is that it's able to subclassify tumors into, into clinically important uh, groups. For example, in uh, ATRTs, it's able to, uh, to predict good behavior and bad behaving tumors. Um, and so this is a, is a, is a report from, a, from um, Washington Post which, in which a, a tumor was histologically high grade, and then uh, the patient was treated with radiation and chemo. And 20 years later, uh, when it was reanalyzed by molecular, it was turned out to be a low-grade tumor. So uh, this is one of the cases in which if, if you make a wrong diagnosis, not taking into account molecular features and histologic features, you can, be, you can have very bad consequences. Uh, this is one of my cases in which um, I um, unfortunately called it uh, a pendemoma. And uh, it turned out to have uh, this very novel uh, or very rarely reported uh, fusion, which, had, which by that time was only reported in, in a peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Uh, but on methylation, um, it turned out to be a schwannoma. And then many other people reported this same finding, and the patient's clinical behavior was, uh, was according to a low-grade uh, nerve sheet tumor. Um, also, the treatment of brain tumors is a little bit above my uh, pay grade, but uh, what I understand is that uh, the, the low grades and high grades are treated differently, and then if, if you find a molecular alteration, it can help you with uh, targeted therapy. Uh, these genes um, and uh, there's a list of, of uh, drugs can be used in, with particular genetic alterations. Um, and uh, 
They can be seen in low grade or high grade, but if you, so, if you see those alterations, you can use those targeted uh, agents. Uh, we have limited um, experience with that, but in definitely some cases, the use of targeted agents has helped our, helped our patients. Um, and the same is also true for uh, the mismatch repair uh, deficient tumors. Um, all right, so one sentence about the challenges and opportunities. Uh, the, so the challenge for us, obviously, is that these are costly tests. Uh, I think the opportunity is that we have a huge population, and uh, we, we can uh, um, uh, leverage that for clinical trials or like research uh, and, and uh, test our tumors that way. Uh, we also have individual or uh, unique patient populations which can be useful for the, the medical community at large. And so here I'm showing you the uh, population distributions of U.S. and Pakistan. So the, the, in spite of, of, of the U.S. population being about twice, uh, we actually have more uh, pediatric or uh, children as opposed to uh, as compared to the U.S. Um, um, all right, and finally, um, I think multiple uh, complementary techniques are uses to uh, are uh, necessary to come up with uh, accurate diagnosis. Thanks very much, and appreciate your patience. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, the next speaker. So the next speaker is Dr. M. Israr Nasser. He earned his PhD qualifications in 2009 from the Department of Genetics, University of Karachi. He is the leading molecular pathologist in the, in the country and holds 15 plus years of experience in genetic testing and molecular diagnostics. Dr. Nasser has earned various international competencies in molecular diagnostic and genetic testing. He is the first and only Pakistani who is European Board of Medical Genetics affiliated and registered as clinical laboratory uh, geneticist. He has established diagnostic molecular pathology services at various prestigious institutions in Karachi and has served in AKU, DU, I think this is Dow Medical, NNH and MC, Dr. Ziauddin Hospital, University of Karachi, BUMDC, JPMC, South City Hospital and probably all the hospitals in Karachi. At present, he is serving as Associate Professor and Deputy Director Research and Consultant Molecular Pathologist at Fazia Ruth PFU Medical College, PF Base, Faisal, Karachi. I invite Dr. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, scientific Committee AMPP for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, give my uh, views on this very interesting but challenging topic of uh, uh, variant uh, classification. Uh, uh, we have a workshop as well yesterday and uh, I can see few participants from that workshop. So to make the session more interesting and more informative, so I have uh, picked few slides from the workshop which I conducted yesterday along with uh, Azhar Nasir and I hope you will find it uh, uh, informative and useful. Okay, so uh, there are few slides which I have used in almost in my every class. This is one of them that think about uh, if alien comes to this planet and they take a snapshot of human mankind, what they get? So they get a picture like that or they will get a snapshot like this. So what's the difference? So if you just go back, so you see that were identical clones and what you see here is genetics and genetics is about variations. So that is very bad that what we teach in the classroom is, uh, is very, very rigid 
You never open the things that you should enjoy genetics. It's everywhere. It's variation. And look at these faces. So you never get bored because every face is different. You find something interesting. And uh, what we know about uh, simple genetics, so there are two types of uh, population on Earth. Uh, if you look at humans, uh, they are males and they are females. And we know what is the reason of variation. And what we have learned that, oh, they are chromosomes. So every human has 46 chromosomes, but there is uh, two special chromosomes we call sex chromosomes. And female have two X, that's why they are female. And male has just one and one Y. They are quite different. So that is our theory. And uh, this is not limited to us. It's everywhere. When we, look about, when we talk about variations, look at every living form we have on Earth. So, we have 46 chromosomes, you know. So, that is something unique with us. No, there are other organisms. Look at uh, mangoes. Oh, they also have 46 chromosomes. But I say they are always sweet. <laughs> and, and look at us. When we become sweet, when we have some... When we have some sweet, we sweet. Otherwise, we ignore people. And uh, look about uh, what if we have 47 chromosomes. Is it good or bad? So, that is bad. You will not become a superman. Okay? That's a variation which is uh, not good for you. So, we have experienced variations and we know they are good and they are bad. And look at, uh, again, look at your faces and the, the person sitting uh, behind you and, or in front of you that we have features. And these features, again, uh, show us variations. Look at, uh, we have a hair patterns, we have uh, this uh, uh, trait of rolling the tongue, we have some, some people have blonde hairs and that air, uh, eye color. These are all variation. So, how we rate these uh, variations? So, every variation does not cause a disease. But every disease is due to some variation. That we need to remember. And the simple thing, having a blue eye is not a disease. But if you are 190 centimeter tall, I would guess uh, maybe you are suffering with a klein infantry syndrome. There are things we know, we remember. But again, we never make conclusion like that. We always prefer to go for testing if something we think is not good or is troublemaking. Going back to this again, ba very basics of uh, gene structure and most of us now remember very well that, oh, we, we are eukaryotes and we have genes, many genes and uh, they have structures like uh, regulatory elements, they are structure like intron, exon and we know how these genes works. So there is a central dogma, transcription and translation and that's the uh, end of any most of the genes that we have a protein for those genes. Now looking at genetic testing potential, we use genetic test for various reasons. And the most common four reasons why we use genetic testing, like we use it for screening purpose, we use genetic test for diagnostics. Now we are living in an era of personalized medicine where we test first and then make a conclusion whether the person in question, our patient is eligible for that therapy or not. And obviously prognosis is the most promising area for genetic testing. Now, the people who are working in this field, they, they are quite uh, familiar how, and they still remember how we were reporting uh, genetic tests, especially when we were doing uh, single sequencing. Okay, for single gene disorders or maybe for single exons or some unknown mutations. And uh, we were also following some guidelines. So mostly we were just using HGVS and we were telling, oh, this is a change and at protein level this might be the consequence of this change. And something happened in 2015. And I think we were in need of that as well because, you know, uh, if we just look at who is the person who is going to read that report, a general physician. 
And again, they are struggling somewhere. Oh, what does it mean? Uh, if I write a report, they will be struggling. What does it mean? What should I do? What is the next step? And this ACMG guidelines, which are made in, uh, in the collaboration with AMP, uh, did some wonderful things. And they gave an idea, okay, you should report variants, and this should be your uh, guide to uh, report those variants which you get after testing. So no matter, no matter you are doing NGS or you are doing even Sanger, you have to now follow these guidelines to report what you get at the end of the testing. And uh, I'm not sure, but how many of you are using ACMG guideline? Can you please just raise your hand? So there are few. So still people are adopting these guidelines because they are necessary. If our patient, which is tested in Pakistan, for example, if he's traveling to USA or UK, he needs a report and that report should be in a language which is understandable anywhere if that patient goes. And you have to adopt, this is not a mandatory requirement if you are doing a genetic testing on this NGS tools or you are doing Sanger. So the good thing with this that they establish a criteria and they establish a workflow. Now you know which steps to follow and what is the, uh, what is the end product of this if you, uh, uh, allow, uh, if you uh, use these guidelines. So now you will produce a report, not only the nomenclature but also you have to say what is the prediction. You may end up in any one, maybe you say the variant which I discovered in patient is benign or it could be likely benign or the variant is pathogenic or likely pathogenic and there are scenarios which is like a challenge, still challenge for us that uh, variant of unknown significance, that a real challenge when we apply these guidelines. If you look at the <coughs> workflow, so you can see, I'm not sure uh, the resolution is good or bad, but uh, you have to look, if you find a, a variant, so I'm used to say it on an everyday basis when we have sessions like these. So imagine you, you, you got sleep in night and in the morning you wake up and you find yourself on the moon. Now you are excited, oh I'm on the moon and you get more excited, I, I think I'm the first human on the moon. And when you are, and you are thinking about making that, that uh, sharing this information to everybody that I'm the first human which is on the moon, suddenly something happened, you say, well, I'm, sh I, I, I'm sure that I'm the first person, then you start searching it, that whether you Google it and you find, oh no, I'm not the first person on the moon, there's someone who already uh, be, been there some 50 years ago. So same thing happened with us when you are doing uh, this genetic testing using these tools like NGS and Sanger, you came up with a finding, you came up with a variant and there's always an excitement and that excitement may be, oh I, I made a discovery or maybe this is a mutation which is, I'm the first person who, is, who have found this mutation and now you may, may make wrong claims as well if you are uh, looking at a mutation. Now the first thing what you do, you, you find a change, you find a variant. Now you start looking, before making a claim, I should see what is known about this variant. So what is the first step? You will Google, you will use browsers, databases and the most popular we can see here like uh, you may go for Genomit, DBSNP, there are many and you start looking at that variant and it is possible you will find it and still it is possible you may not find it. Then you start looking at literature, you go, maybe you go on OMIM, or you go, go on the different uh, journal websites to look at that somebody with the same phenotype have got the same genotype, you look at the literature and then you look at other data you may use some uh, prediction tools okay, to learn whether this is, uh, what is, are the consequences. Now be very careful, when you are doing something like this NGS type or Sanger 
and you have got a mutation which is never reported now you are making going to make a claim which actually you never did you say i am predicting that this is the consequence which is not which not might be true you have you did testing on dna and you are making claim at protein level this might be this might be a guess this you, it's not uh, necessary you are uh, authentic in your claim so there are steps and you have to follow those steps before making any claim now we uh, we are blessed we are really blessed that we are living in a era where we have access to databases and uh, you may most of them are open uh, and you can search there are databases which like omim or ncbi uh, there are genome datas there are exome datas there are variant datas uh, uh, gene specific databases disease specific databases and they are asset for us to uh, begin with now what you are looking at is like it's a browser you can use the browser and the most good browsers have links to the other resources you can see you can learn about that variant which you have find and uh, uh, like uh, ncbi there are many links in that database from where you can learn about that condition that phenotype and looking at your genotype and dbsnp very very old still useful still helping us in of uh, finalizing and writing these reports and uh, the most the most popular still valid uh, hgmd database there are two different uh, 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 software version one is the free and now we have a, a professional version which is for uh, professional users sorry so this is a free version and uh, there are other uh, uh, gene specific like cftr we have a specific database we have a burka exchange which is really good uh, good for uh, challenging uh, mutations and now when we look at this uh, when we start using applying this criteria now we have uh, some tools which are freely available online and you start applying you just make a check and then you will get a end result like this is these are the steps which where your your variant falls you say i got i got a variant which is which is never reported in the database in any database so rare so rare so you check it and you make apply more checks and finally when you uh, applied maybe you have done functional studies for that variant or maybe you have segregation data so finally you make a calculation and you can see at the end it end up with a pathogenic that your variant seems to be a pathogenic variant so and you can see this criteria now we have ps and pm these uh, 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 codes which we have to uh, submit uh, in some some reports some uh, labs are uh, providing this criteria what criteria they have applied and what are their findings so this is like a case you have a phenotype you have some uh, information of patient information you start with the googling maybe from you get some information for that uh, condition on omim and you not have noted the features and then you uh, visited uh, this uh, genomic uh, database and you find the prevalence and the good thing about genomic database is that you can still see uh, uh, on the population basis specific population you can uh, hit at that uh, level as well and then you can see uh, now the most common database is clinvar you can find you can look at the uh, clinvar whether your your variant of interest which you have find in the patient is there or not and maybe you in that you can you, you see that oh it's already reported and uh, finally you feel you find what type of studies has done maybe that is uh, functional studies and finally what you got at the end is maybe you find it benign maybe if clinvar saying it's pathogenic but what you get at the end is benign so which you trust so this is your responsibility you should check you should check and i say still we are learning this acmg guidelines and i always say that it's it's better to learn it's better to get trained and then start applying to your patient 
So this is what we get uh, that the Klinvar was saying that was pathogenic, but when we uh, struggled, when we verified, it appeared to be benign. So this will happen. Now, as I said, that the most the challenges we are facing after this ACMG when it come up. So we were thinking that this uh, variant of insignificance is the only challenge we have, but things are changing. Look at this. So I have tried to give you a snapshot of Clinvar with Barka one, and you can see now we have some, not just five categories of variant, but we have another category of variant which we say conflicting results. Okay, there are three groups. One group is saying that this is variant which is of uncertain significance. The other group saying that this is benign and the third group is saying it's likely benign. Which one you will follow? So you need to have your own workup. So what I will say, the good thing is that ACMG is still improving. It's still, it's still evolving. They are looking at publication. Now we are in a habit of proficiency testing. We are, look, we are using different tools. And uh, uh, what service is now 50, 95% uh, of people have adapted it. But performance is, 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 is varying uh, at every region. And I think the, the next version we are expecting soon will be on point systems, which will be better in judging the, these variants. Look at, there are other variant classification systems which are coming up. And I hope that with the consensus of all this classification, we will be having better findings which will help patients. Now, I, I'm, I want to introduce just few slides. I think I have time. That it's always better to adopt for trainings when you are, when you are switching to this NGS interpretation or variant interpretation. I will strongly recommend you this uh, CAP. Uh, schemes now they have I am using these, these schemes from last five years they are equally applied because they are providing you a variant and now you have to submit what is your understanding about that variant so I got training and uh, I can show you that I showed this uh, yesterday in the in my uh, workshop that I am uh, from last five years I am contributing in this Gen QA very uh, interesting a proficiency scheme and the good thing is free of cost so that way you will you get training you start applying your knowledge and you are not harming any patient okay you are not harming which is which we need to uh, yeah, see and uh, there are variations and uh, I think uh, we are still on the learning process with this I will say uh, this is a I will re highly recommend you this web tech uh, uh, training sessions which are actually uh, initiated by Human Barium Project and they are very helpful and I, I have got a good uh, feedback and my performance is improving by, uh, by attending these uh, conferences and workshops. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Dr. Estrar for such a nice pictorial and colorful presentation to keep everybody alive, al alive actually. <laughs> Uh, now we uh, go to our oral presentations. Uh, the first presenter is Samra Naz, who will be talking about distribution of myeloproliferative neoplasm mutations among Pakistani population. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Samra Naz and I am uh, working as a molecular pathology technologist in Al Khan University Hospital, Karachi. Okay. Okay. Myeloproliferative neoplasms are characterized by excessive uh, proliferation of one or more uh, hematopoietic cell lines. The WHO uh, World Health Organization provides diagnostic criteria for following MPNs, chronic myelogenous leukemia, BCR ABL1 positive, uh, polycythemia vera, thrombocytopenia, uh, uh, essential thrombocytopenia, primary myelofibrosis, chronic neutrophilic leukemia, chronic eosinophilic leukemia, and MPN unclassifiable. Uh, there are some common driver mutation that involves in myeloproliferative neoplasms are JAK2, calreticulin, and MPL genes. Uh, they, are, uh, they are not MPN subtype specific. They can also be, find, uh, they can also be found in uh, myeloid uh, diseases such as myeloid dysplastic syndrome. 
and uh, myelo uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. Objective, the um, aim of this study is to uh, examine the driver mutations among uh, patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms in Pakistan over a period of six months from November 2021 to April 2022. Methods, 222 cases of MPN were included in this study. RNA from blood samples was extracted by RNA isolation kit according to the manufacturer's guidelines. The purity and the concentration of RNA was assessed by using nanodrop BCR ABL transcripts were detected by multiplex PCR uh, then followed by gel electrophoresis. Methods again JAG2, exon 12 and 14 mutations, MPL, calreticulin, C kit mutations were detected by using SALSA MLPA uh, MPN kit. Uh, PCR, uh, PCR amplicons were fluorescently labeled and separated by ABI 3500 genetic analyzers. Data analysis was done by Cofilizers MRC Holland software. Um, here's the steps of MLPA, the first hybridization, denaturation, hybridization and the ligation followed by amplification and fragment separation and data analysis by software. Uh, results out of the tested 2000, uh, uh, 222 patients, male comprised 73% of the total while females were 27. Uh, included in the full analysis. The uh, um, age uh, range was 80, uh, 16 to 87 years and the median age was 46. 56 patients were reported to have BCR ABL transcript respectively while 166 patients were reported to non-BCR ABL MPN mutations. Here's the tabular uh, form of uh, results. Uh, no, total number of samples, 222. Positive for BCR, ABL, uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms are 56. And uh, rest of the uh, 166 uh, were positive for non-BCR, ABL, MPN, uh, which is subclassified in JAG2, exon 12, 14, about 65 persons, cal reticulin, frame shift 46 and 47 mutation, that is 27 percent, MPL mutation, that is 4 percent, CKED for person, and no mutation detected in JAG2 exon 12 during the study period. Conclusion, the prevalence and the incidence of MPN in Pakistan were derived using the number of patients visiting hospitals. Currently, there is no data in percentage of polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytopenia, and pi uh, primary myelofibrosis. JAG2 V617F uh, exon 14 mutations found significantly in Philadelphia negative non BCR ABL myeloproliferative neoplasms. Thank you. Thank you, Samra, for finishing on time rather before time. Thank you for that. Now I invite uh, Ms. Anam Ujala. She will be talking on mutational analysis of non-small cell lung carcinoma specimens to demonstrate the prevalence of EGFR in ELK mutations at retrospective hospital-based study. Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Anna Mujala from Akhan University Hospital working as a medical technologist in molecular pathology section. The study I'm going to present is analysis of non-small cell lung carcinoma to demonstrate the prevalence of EGFR and ELK mutation among Pakistani population, a retrospective hospital-based study. Introduction and purpose of a study. As lung cancer is one of the most common cause of that worldwide, approximately 18.4% of total cancer death is because of lung cancer. NSCLC being the most common cause of lung cancer, 85% of all diagnosed cases is because of NSCLC. Some of the most common driver mutation that has been observed in NSCLC patients are BRAF, KRAF, sorry, KRAS, EGFR, and ELK. Identification of mutation is important for effective TKI therapy. Epidermal growth factor. Epidermal growth factor stands for EGFR. 
as EGFR is one of the transmembrane kinase receptor helping in cellular division, cell proliferation, and cell development. Elk. Elk is one elk, elf, uh, elk anaplastic lymphoma kinase. Is, uh, a is also the receptor of tyrosine kinase. And the change in elk gene is called as break apart rearrangement or elk fusion. Methodology. Uh, the present study is conducted on formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues from patients of NSCLC. These are already diagnosed cases of NSCLC. Total 156 patients were analyzed uh, from the period of January to October 2021. Uh, relevant clinical and laboratory data was collected by uh, ILMS, EGFR mutation detection. Uh, is achieved through real-time PCR. As uh, uh, we, uh, we extract DNA from FFP by following a step, as you see in the picture. Uh, first, this is the paraffinized embedded tissue after, after a review of HNE slide by histopathologist of, of desirable tumor content. We, ext uh, we uh, section the tissue and uh, deparaffinize it, and then we concentrate the, and quantify the tissue after quantification, we set up PCR. Uh, after uh, PCR automated and uh, amplification and detection is, de is detected through uh, Kuba Z480 analyzer. Uh, in a, uh, by using Kuba's EGFR V2 mutation kit, following mutations are covered. The rate of EGFR mutation was or has been observed in. 53 rate of EGFR mutation was or has been observed in 53 patients. Frequency uh, of EGFR mutation. These, uh, these are the distribution of mutation uh, that we analyze in 156 patients out of positive ratio that are th uh, 56. We have a uh, rare mutation that are found are compound mutations and the most common mutation that we found is l 5 r the ratio is 18% and EGF and exon 19 deletion, the ratio is 40, uh, 46%. Published extensively in reputable peer review journals and he has many book uh, chapters to his credit. So welcome Dr. Farooq Ghani. Thank you. Uh, next I would like to introduce uh, and welcome the panel for the discussion, uh, Dr. Zara Hassan. Sure. So I would uh, like to uh, invite and um, the panelists, uh, Dr. Zara Hassan, Dr. Israr Nasser, Dr. Arshi Naz, Dr. Javeria Ejaz. Dr. Salma Batul, Dr. Romina Kazi, and Dr. Said Khan. And I would also like to introduce um, Dr. Natasha Anwar, who will be moderating this session. She is also the chair of the scientific committee. Thank you. Can we just have some mics for the, just two mics for the panel? Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry. Thank you very much for everybody who's still here. I know we're running late. Um, if you want to just move up a little bit, this is a really important discussion that we actually had planned after Dr. Rizwan's talk and after Israr um, was going to talk about his career and his journey through molecular pathology in Pakistan. But uh, because we've got Dr. Ghani here um, as the CAP director, and his insights into quality assurance. We've seen since this morning, um, you know, we started with genomics in the clinic and we looked at how, uh, it's, how so it's so important to have a good dialogue between physicians and people in the laboratory and the pathologists. Moving on, 
throughout the day we've heard fantastic talks, not only from eminent speakers, but also from young scientists presenting their research, young molecular pathologists coming into, you know, into this field. So it's really important. We've, I think for the first time, I, maybe one of the panelists can correct me, but this is perhaps the first time that the AMPP has brought together people of different disciplines in terms of you know, a PhD track molecular pathologist, a clin you know, uh, an MBBS track pathologist who's now doing molecular work, technologists who are doing molecular work. Um, so it's really nice to be able to have this conversation and this panel discussion, having heard all of these people throughout the day. So I think what I'm hoping that Dr. Rizvan is going to be online soon because we actually wanted him to start off by sharing with us. Can we, can we come back later? Okay, sorry. So we'll start, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll start with um, Zara. Can, can you just um, share with us what's, what is right now in terms of um, certification and accreditation of molecular pathologists and their role um, in, in, a clinical, in a clinical laboratory? How is that, how is that changing and what, what's the future? Thank you, Natasha, for that introduction. Um, it's unfortunate we've lost most of our audience. And, and I really think that we should consider doing it again tomorrow. Um, because this is really important. But, uh, but if Dr. Izvan does come, with all due respect, I want, to, I want to actually recap for those who don't know the story and bring it back to Dr. Farooq Ghani in 2014 when I first became section head, and we first connected with Dr. Rizwan Naim. Um, and he came to our lab, and he shook his head, and he um, pointed out, was it dozens of pages of, of things that we needed to look at? And um, all we saw, in fact, was, oh, Dr. Ghani knows, was uh, a big budget, right? the first thing we saw was huge costs. And it seemed almost impossible at that time. So I think that um, there are a couple of things. And I think that it's, it's moved so much, it's phenomenal. So at one extreme, I have next to me Dr. Javeria Jaz at the Indus Hospital. She is um, um, the most recent member of our fraternity. She heads the molecular section there. And she has been working very hard with uh, Dr. Sabah Jamal to try and get... Salaikum, Dr. Izvan. Salaikum, Ibiwan. Great to see you. So I, you. I was just saying that we, we first met you when you came and you evaluated our lab. And I'm now going to hang over to Dr. Farugani. I think perhaps you can, you can, we can restart and you can tell everyone about... Yes, Dr. Izvan. So, yes. if I tell you when I visited Al Khan first time, you know, I should have been dead by now. It's been a long, long time. <laughs> I, was, I was in Al Khan in 1993 as a faculty. 93 or 94, something like that. Okay. Assalamu yeah. alaikum, Rizwan. Assalamu alaikum. Farooq here. So, Rizwan and I go back. <laughs> I don't even want to put numbers. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to say these Yeah, so a while, you know. And. Um, we went to medical school together and then we were in Boston together for a uh, number of years and then in Connecticut. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, I think as Zara was saying that you know, the, the journey uh, that we've been through for the quality assurance and maintaining the high quality uh, has been you know, uh, extremely uh, challenging and, and, and I must say that uh, the section of uh, 
molecular pathology uh, at AKU did really a phenomenal job uh, in, in, uh, in, in coming up to speed with the international standards. And you know, they've passed three CAP uh, inspections uh, without a single deficiency. Uh, and and uh, you know, uh, and having a considerably large menu. So I think Zara, you know, Zishan, Azgar, uh, you know, uh, Natasha. I think you know, it's a, the whole team has done <clears throat> just a wonderful job and made my job as a cab director much easier. Uh, but. Uh, you know, and, and, and we saw this, we, we saw this, this whole thing in the forefront in the COVID epidemic. Uh, how uh, within, you know, just in a matter of weeks, they were able to develop an in-house assay of, of, of an absolute, uh, you know, wonder, that had wonderful sensitivity. They could detect up to, if I'm not wrong, like about 15 to 20 copies you know, for a home brewed assay, that was really amazing. So, um, <clears throat> so the point is that it really pays off, uh, you know, good quality. So coming back to Rizwan, Mr. Rizwan, thank you very much for, for being at uh, early morning there. Um, so, um, so just a, you know, a word about, just to introduce Rizwan, uh, He's, Rizwan is currently the professor of pathology and uh, director of molecular pathology and genetic services uh, at, at uh, Albert Einstein in Montefiore in New York. Uh, he's also the founding program director for the lab genetics and genomics and molecular genetics pathology fellowship program at Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Um, is board, dual board certified, uh, both in cl clinical molecular genetics and clinical cytogenetics, uh, and has experience of a uh, number of years. Uh, he served many leadership positions at the American College of Medical Genetics and, and AMP, currently serving as the president for the core council of the program director uh, at uh, Association for Molecular Pathology. Uh, in U.S. Uh, he also represents uh, the American College of Medical Genetics at Undergraduate Training and Genomics Committee under Association of uh, Pathology Chairs. Uh, recently, he was selected a member of the Association of Molecular Pathology Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Workshop Group. Uh, so, pleasure to have you, Rizwan. So, over to you. Uh, and I uh, would love to uh, hear from you about uh, uh, your input in this field. Uh, can I just quickly add um, one thing that's missing from there? I think Dr. Rizwan forgot to tell everybody. He's also the patron of the Association of Molecular Pathology Pakistan. Uh, yeah. I, I think one of the best things I remember for PAP and EMPP is in 2014, we brought AMP to Pakistan with PAP meeting in Lahore. If you all remember, that's where we officially formed Association of Molecular Pathology Pakistan. And I am amazed to see what a wonderful program put together today and very high quality uh, court talks. I've been up for a little while. I've watched at least two or three and they're all amazing. So I think I need to, uh, is this a, to uh, topic about fellowships uh, or training? Or yes, sorry, is it Dr. Naim, because we were running short of time, what we'd like to do is have your uh, experience and expertise and just a, a panel discussion about where, you know, where we are with molecular pathology, where you are, and what, what it is that we're doing here in Pakistan right now and how, because I, I believe there's a lot of uh, initiative right now to try and, again, build up a good educational foundation for molecular pathology in Pakistan. So we would love to hear your thoughts on that. And I think Zara um, and, and may, maybe um, Dr. Javeria might also add to that once you're, once you're finished. 
Right. So what, what I would tell you that uh, uh, I think the training and teaching in molecular pathology, I would call it molecular pathology and genomics because initially when uh, genetics and genomics came as a training program, there was no molecular pathology training. It started all with germline chromosome studies, cytogenetic was the first, and then FISH came on the way, and then RACGH came on, and then Sanger sequencing, and now NGS. And application of those things are initially started with uh, inheritable diseases. So that's, uh, and, and in those days, I'm talking about in 1993 and 94, when we, uh, we were going into training and teaching programs for uh, molecular technologies and uh, genomics, it's all started with the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics, which uh, at that time it was only American Board of Medical Genetics. And it was not an ACGME accredited program. Some universities like Boston University where I was and Fawu Ghadi was, that they, they started training uh, uh, fellows for, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, clinical cytogenetics and clinical molecular genetics. Then evolution happened, things change, and uh, more, more and more somatic mutations, somatic variants were also becoming very, very important, especially with the, with the transition into what you recall as uh, 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 diagnostics where you have a medicine involved with it, a uh, uh, couple diagnoses or, or uh, there's a specific name I'm missing. But so... But uh, with that said, pathology programs throughout country realize that there is a need for training molecular pathology to pathology residents. And, uh, but, but American Board of Medical Genomics and Genetics at that time, combined with the uh, 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 American Board of Pathology, ABP, and brought up a new program. This was, I think it's in 2000 or 2002, and that program we called as MGP, Molecular Genetics Pathology. But remember, pathology residency itself is a very long process in US. It takes five years to do pathology residency. And then most of the pathology residents do not end there after residency. It's not like a pediatric residency or OBGYN residency where you do a residency and go into practice. In the United States, 99% of the pathology uh, residents go to a fellowship. Sometimes they go for hemopath fellowship, sometimes go to cytology, sometimes anatomic pathology, blood banking, and so on. So they thought that two years or three years of training is not possible for EMP, but they, they, so they, they started doing uh, they, they proposed a one-year fellowship for molecular pathology and genetics. And one-year fellowship is uh, for pathologists actually is not enough to in cover both cytogenetics and molecular and inheritance and somatic for any pathologist, and that, that you can tell. So they, 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 they made a provision that all these pathology residents who are going to a molecular pathology fellowship, they have to go through a genomic course, inherited genomic or germline genotic co genomic course to understand the basics of, uh, of inheritance and som uh, somatic, they are very good at pathology, uh, deals with somatic variants and variations and changes throughout their career. But genomic changes are very rarely they see and uh, have a limited exposure to. So there was, a, there was an agreement between the BMGG, which is American Board of Medical Genetic and Genomics, and ABP, American Board of Pathology, that there will be a dedicated uh, course in genomics or genetics, which every pathology fellow who is going for MGP fellowship need to take. So that just tells you the reason I'm telling you that it is very important part of pathologists also to have a firm knowledge of genomics and genetics uh, in addition to what they are very good at, which is somatic variations and somatic changes in, in phenotype, in genotype, in slides, in, uh, in gross specimen, 
or in autopsies. All these things are they're very good at it, but they, there has to be a component for genomics and genetics, which what, the, the reason I'm telling you is that you at Pakistan, there is an initial stage of see, to see how to certify these people, how to give some type of uh, license or a stamp event that yes, you can do uh, molecular pathology in addition to what you're doing uh, in surgical pathology or hematopathology. And for that, I'm saying, of course, somatic uh, genomic, genomic changes, uh, uh, the, the, the application of these changes into clinical practice, and also the uh, uh, role of those changes as we evolve, new and new variants have been uh, discovered and their, uh, their, their relationship with the disease is being sought out. These are all very important things, but there has to be a course or some type of dedicated time for these Yes, so absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And so you, you've actually really very, very nicely outlined one pathway, which is the pathway of a currently already qualified pathologist who's gone through medical school. They, they've, they've completed their training. They've done their residency. Now they're moving on to a fellowship and specializing. There is another track. There's another track, which is the PhD track. And one of the things is that, you know, as we're getting you know, I think we're all, all of us in this room do understand that molecular um, pathology or molecular biology is, is, is a tool that's actually applied across so many disciplines. Um, and how I, you know, I mean, maybe this question can go to um, uh, Zara, do you want to take this one? Think, um, because it's, it's so, so, so I think we can break it up okay. because we've sure. opened up two different streams. Yeah. I would like to respond to Dr. Iswan, and okay. what you have started, I would hand over to Dr. Israr, because that's linked to the talk that he was going to give. Thank you. Um, Dr. Iswan, you are spot on, um, and I would, uh, I would like to share with you some of the thoughts that are now in place where we are trying to get molecular pathology um, fellowship certified by submitting a curriculum to CPSP. And uh, the curriculum's not in yet. It's in a form that I think that it would be great to have your insight on it, as it's been considered as a two-year program that, cited, uh, that has a cyto, um, you know, cytogenetics component and then a molecular pathology component, including genomics. It's not the curriculum that I am concerned about because all the important things that you've said have been put in there and for Pakistan, residents through their four years of residency or five years of general pathology training don't actually have much exposure to basic molecular biology. So a one-year fellowship really cannot cut it. The gap is too large. The issue I raise is that how would we standardize something like this across the country? Because um, capacities for teaching the curricula vary. And um, we can put that in place. But what we can do with our strong scientific and undergrad academic teams in Karachi, at AKU, at Dow, you know, the big universities, um, is very different from what other people can do elsewhere. So that's just, you know, putting it out there. That is one of my concerns. And then I'll pass, I think, the mic around the room. So because we are representing different institutions. Um, so Arshi. Okay. And uh, my, the, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Arshi, working as an assistant professor in uh, Liaquat University Medical and Health Sciences, Jamsharo. And I started my career in 2004 from ARMS VCR, and that time um, established thalassemia on the PCR. And now is the era of the genomics and a uh, lots of omics. So my concern is due to uh, regarding the um, uh, molecular pathology uh, in the discipline because it is just to bench site. Uh, I'm concerned to bench to bedside and bed to cure or clinics. So this is the gap. So how would we translate um, uh, uh, what strategy should be follow to translate this report first concern to understanding of the report for standardization of the report 
uh, which technique uh, for the regulatory point of view and second one is the uh, uh, how much uh, uh, we uh, translate this information into the clinicians third one is uh, um, what is the treatment because a uh, lots of uh, queries uh, uh, regarding the expensive testing we are um, uh, providing in different institutes or different platforms but uh, understanding cure treatment so the, this is on the clinician point of view that, that is the much bigger gap so you know, how would we uh, insert in the curriculum to uh, give in the practicing? Uh, I am Dr. Salma Batul working at SIOT Molecular Pathology Lab. And I agreed with the Dr. Zahra and Dr. Arshi that the uh, curriculum which is uh, required to fill that gap is huge. So we need a very comprehensive curriculum uh, to be in place to cover that gap and then we can uh, talk about all that uh, uh, combining two different uh, uh, discipline uh, together to put up a program. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Rizwan. This is Dr. Saeed. I'm professor of pathology at the uh, University of Health Sciences. Uh, molecular pathology, of course, has a uh, number of challenges as well as opportunities as we witness in particularly in this pandemic. So every corner of the country as well as the rest of the globe uh, the response from the molecular pathologist was, uh, I think, was the first to, as you mentioned that, and uh, rightly mentioned uh, the chair of the session, that uh, uh, providing the diagnostic services was the first response for the, the COVID. So this is very much important, very much necessary uh, globally as well as in our local condition in Pakistan that we need to find out of uh, some track to, oh, there is, as uh, Dr. Natasha mentioned, that we need to cross to uh, talk to each other. There is a lot of overlapping of uh, the, the sciences and disciplines. So there need to, and the, the AMPP are, of course, providing the, the, pla the platform uh, locally, and as well as you are guiding us uh, from uh, your experience uh, globally. Uh, we need to, uh, discuss this as we are doing uh, now and we should keep on discussing because it's not an easy thing uh, uh, to do and there's a lot of uh, inhibition from different corners uh, until unless we, we talk with each other, we convince each other and we need to find out uh, like this is the futuristic thing. So a lot of uh, discussion that was going on in uh, yesterday's opening session, then even pathologists are concerned that they might lose uh, their jobs or because of the artificial intelligence coming uh, uh, so fastly. So we should not be afraid of uh, discussion. We should move forward and there is al always a way forward that we can find out uh, with your guidance and the, ex the experienced person we have here. Uh, but locally in Pakistan, of course, uh, the, 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 there are too many uh, legislations and there are too many bodies going on. Uh, there need to be a very good talk between the MBBS, the medics, and the uh, PED uh, researchers. They cannot replace each other. They can uh, complement and they can support each other if they work together. Uh, but professionally, we would also like to have some career uh, choice and selection for the upcoming graduate and scientists uh, that they should have. And this is our uh, duty and responsibility that we, ha we have too many experts and great minds uh, with us. So we should uh, provide some opportunity to the, our future that they should choose. And this is one of the futuristic career that would be very much important for uh, medical science for di as in, in terms of diagnosis as well as treatment of the patient. So this was uh, my point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Izvant, for giving us uh, time uh, to discuss this very important uh, topic which was uh, neglected and now it's again raised up because thanks to FC, uh, CPSP and my AMPP colleagues that uh, we are discussing it and opening a discussion. It's not like we are concluding today, but there may be more ideas. So, you know, uh, how I see things. So my name is Dr. Israr Nasser. Um, I, uh, I did PhD in genetics and uh, uh, I call myself, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really blessed, I can say. I'm really blessed in a way that uh, I got very good mentorship from my day one of the uh, career. Uh, I started from AKU. Uh, that was my first uh, 
job. I got very good mentors, Dr. Tariq Bhattar, Dr. Shahid Parvez, and they groomed me. And, uh, and finally, I came to diagnostics and from Ziauddin to Dow to Liaquat National to uh, many other positions I have worked. Now, we have to restart uh, thinking like, uh, there were days when we were doing PCRs. Almost uh, most of the labs in Pakistan started from a PCR lab uh, who were doing infectious disease screening and diagnostics. Most of them, most of the labs or centers. And then we suddenly uh, heard about new technologies coming and there were worries that the old technology get, will get obsoleted. And then we find, oh, now we have uh, cytogenetic, now we have fish and now we have uh, uh, microarray and now we have uh, NGS and then 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 and nothing was obsoleted. Nothing obsoleted. There were fears. The person who were doing PCR, they have fear. Oh, where I will go for the job because new things are coming. And I think in a, in this part of country there are more fears because nobody owns this discipline still. Uh, there are no recognitions. There are no certifications, and uh, that makes uh, a challenge that the the people from clinical side and when people from this uh, uh, basic sciences, when they sit, they, they, they have fears from each other. Molecular pathology is a very broad business, you know. Now, we never use, a, molecular pathology is a broad, and we say, oh, uh, the, we have a section of the infectious diseases, we have a section of oncology, we have a section of the histocompatibility, we have a section of uh, cytogenetics. So it's a teamwork. I never say one man cannot claim that I can do each and everything. We need more people in this discipline and we need team-based approach that a center should understand that we need uh, equal weightage, we need people for the PhD background and we also need people from clinical week who can do better phenotyping. You know, genetic testing is incomplete. If you don't have a phenotype, how you can conclude, how you can guide your patient. So phenotyping, I think nobody can do phenotyping best uh, uh, than a clinical uh, 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 person. And we, uh, as we have evolved uh, looking at technologies, we know the limitations, we know what, uh, what are the things arriving. So I see there are two or three challenges. It's, just, it's not just crisis at the pathologist level. There's a, there's a crisis at lower level, technologist level. There are no courses at any university that are producing people or uh, these technologists who are well, uh, uh, well, uh, good in the concepts or skills. So uh, we are fighting at, at many levels. We are training these guys who will own our bench work. And then we have uh, nobody who, uh, we have to deal each and every administration to convince this technology, why we need this technology, why need quality indicators, why need, why need proficiency, and then still we unsecure that uh, no, nothing is here. So I think this is the best time to start, and we should start from recognition. The person who are already uh, giving their service for a very long time, we should also think about recognizing those people who are in the field from a very long time, and they have competencies. And the person who don't have, somehow they don't, uh, were, they were not able to do that, we have to give them a ground. You can see that in the UK what happened that uh, most of the uh, uh, cases, I have read most cases that where they have judged people by taking exams, they are, they are able, they are, they, are comp they are competent and they are allowed to practice, although they don't have the right credentials. So we have to start from a point how we can, uh, we can have more people in this uh, discipline. Yes, there's a shortage of people. We need more people. We need people with uh, uh, better understanding. We, we, we start from people from zero and develop them in a complete molecular pathologist. And meanwhile, the people who are already struggling, who are working, we need to own them as well. And uh, we need to certify that they are as good as uh, the other new one appearing in the industry. So that was my concern, and I wish you will take care of this point as well. Sorry, Dr. Amina, can I just pass it to Dr. Ghani as chair? He, he'd like to say something. Thank you. Okay, so here's, uh, I mean, even though I've been part of molecular uh, in my professional career, uh, you know, I've worked uh, during my pathology career, so, uh, but as someone, uh, you know, professionally looking into this field from, uh, from the outside, uh, A, I, 
I really don't think that there's any reason for people in this field, molecular pathology, to be insecure. I mean, I, I just, I, I mean, I don't know how you say that. Uh, because if anything, this is, this molecular has the most promise for the future. Technology is developing fast is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I mean, I have been around I mean, confessing that, you know, when started off with doing southern blots, you know, uh, for, for, for DNA identification. Okay, and, and, and then came PCR and we thought, oh God, you know, and now it's NGS and God knows, you know, what. So, so, so this is a good thing. I mean, look at the, uh, you know, uh, amount of people at 6.30 in this room. I bet you, you know, I mean, you won't see. I mean, I still remember when, we, when the, the society was launched, the first meeting that we had in which Rizwan was there and I and Rizwan sat in the front row and, you know, we had hardly five people sitting there and, you know, and, and, and we elected Zahra as the first president and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. I mean, look at where, you know, we are uh, just, you know, six, seven years from, from there. So, so, so we have, so first of all, there's nothing to be, you know, uh, yes, there are challenges like anything else, there are op but there are opportunities. Uh, look at the number of people coming in. I mean, to me, when I look in, the, the, the brightest of the lot wants to do molecular. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I witnessed some of the presentations by the technologists. I mean, it was wonderful. You know, I mean, they are spot on, very articulate, confident. You know, so it is attracting, you know, very good people, because there is a promise. So, so, so please get this out of your mind that there is anything to be insecure about. Now, yes, uh, specifically about Pakistan, you know, because obviously we are, it's, uh, we have unique sets of challenges and and, and needs. So I, I divide uh, molecular into, uh, into two here, where, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, one is uh, infectious disease based, and then the non-infectious. Non-infectious is everything now. It's a long list. Now because, the, uh, uh, you know, infectious disease is very, you know, endemic in this region. Uh, if you look at the uh, the if any any lab, our lab, any lab, the majority of the tests that we well we used to do a few years ago till a few years ago were hepatitis and uh, you know other you know, hepatitis from the major the lion's share. The rest you would have a 50 test menu. 80% of them were infectious, 90% maybe. Look at, you know, I just gave an example for COVID. You know, if, if it was not for molecular, I mean, you know, to be very honest, I mean, molecular test came earlier than the antibodies test. I forget about the treatment and the, you know, vaccination came much later. What we had, you know, I mean, how would we have dealt with if this was not available? You know, this would have been a real catastrophe. So, so, so anyway, so coming back to, you know, the challenge now that you guys really have to think about is, is that post-hepatitis now, th that the test of hepatitis treatment is less than the cost of the hepatitis PCR. And therefore, that is fast becoming redundant, if it not already has. You know, the good old days of COVID are gone. <laughs> okay. 
and I, you know, I don't know where Zishan, but Zishan, whenever he talks about COVID reappearing, there's a, you know, his his eyes light, light up. <laughs> so he's becoming a, a you know, a, a, a sadist. Uh, so. So I think, you know, now that you don't have COVID, now that you don't have hepatitis, you know, TB, yeah, a little bit, you know, what are we going to do now? I think that is, is what really you need to figure out. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that is where, you know, Rizwan can probably, you know, articulate better than anyone else. Um, that, that how, how we go about. Now with NGS, from my point of view, has huge amount of promise, um, but the cost is prohibitive. You know, it's, it's, it's 200,000 dollars, 200,000 rupees, which is, you know, becomes, but it will become more accessible and, and more. But I think, you know, so, so you will have to figure out you know, ways of, of doing it. One of the things that is really, really important in, 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 in our part of the world is that the, uh, you know, molecular has to, the acceptance for molecular, it, the test might be expensive, but it is cost effective. I think that concept has to be, done. that yes, the cost of the test is high, but in the large scheme of things, when it comes to managing the patient, the patient outcome, if you, you know, that really is a small part of it. So educating, educating the clinicians, educating the general public is really incumbent upon, you know, this fraternity. You know, and how you position that is, is, is really what should be up for discussion and, and, and that is really where, uh, you know, people can chip in. All right, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Izwan. This is Dr. Ramina. Uh, remember uh, meeting Dr. Izwan, taking him to my lab, and very um, excited to, you know, get guidance from him for CAP accreditation. Um, unfortunately, yet we haven't uh, done that, but we are in the process of doing, but happy that AKU Ha is cap grid now and it made life easier for us because for you know cross uh, validations we can get samples to AKU or get from AKU so that's the best thing that we have somebody uh, someone in cap grid in Pakistan um, from the last three days um, what I have concluded is that the best thing that came up is that we have to open open communication with the clinicians. That is the best thing that has come up. Clinicians realize that, we realize that. This is that time where we have to sit on the table, take our genomic data, explain to them what this means, and they correlate that with their clinical um, you know, scenarios and come up with the results. The only issue that I see here is that we are talking about all because we have um, uh, worked a lot, especially Dr. Arshi, about this. Um, we are doing CPSP uh, uh, molecular pathology course. That before going into uh, developing that, we need to really have courses in universities, hospitals, to get acquainted with the basics of molecular, and then we can build upon that, step on that, and then we can take our. Uh, clinicians to do this molecular pathology. We cannot really start directly molecular pathology to the clinicians where they do not have any idea of what molecular, the, the basis of molecular. So I won't take more time because we need to uh, listen from Dr. Rizwan. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Javeria Jaz, and uh, you know, there's a lot has been uh, already said. I don't have much to add. Uh, I just want to add uh, two small things. Uh, you know, we were talking about the development of this field, and I've been associated with hematology for a long time. I did my FCPS um, in hematopathology, and then um, I was a consultant for 10 years. But then eventually I felt a need. There was uh, something lacking in that field, uh, and uh, that, 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 uh, what was lacking, I felt, was
was this uh, molecular. I mean, I, I think it was it's severely lacking in our fellowship curricula, and so I um, enrolled in uh, a PhD program in human and molecular genetics in the U.S. And after returning from the U.S., um, I joined uh, Indus Hospital. Um, as a, a molecular pathologist. So, you know, our, our, our section is a, a fledgling um, department. It just started um, two years ago, but we have had our first um, ISO 15189 accreditation, and now we are going towards CAP accreditation um, next year. So we, uh, the other thing um, I want to say is about, we were talking, um, there was some uh, comment about cost effectiveness. So I really think, um, you know, I agree with Dr. Ghani. I, if we go, if we include, for example, let's, um, this morning Dr. Zara presented a very nice lecture on TB. So if we talk about TB uh, and compare NGS to traditional diagnostics, we really have to include all of those additional BSL-3 costs and, you know, everything else, all of the expertise and all of uh, the modular testing that goes into um, these traditional tests. And, you know, uh, I mean, I foresee at least a day when all of these modular testing will probably be replaced by NGS as such. I mean, I, I see this as the future. Similarly, for hematopathology, um, you know, like for acute leukemia, it might be a day when, you know, you don't need a flow cytometry and cytogenetics and all, all of these complex testing, and you might be just doing NGS to get an accurate lineage specification as well as um, all of the genetic mutations. So that is just my, I mean, I just feel it's a very exciting time for molecular, and I'm very happy um, to be in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Javeria. So this is wonderful. We've done full circle. We've gone from starting right at the beginning, which is training and education and raising concerns about that, moving on to role of molecular pathologists. What is right now, the role is very dynamic. It's changing. Okay? Coming up to the idea of actually engagement and, and having conversations, not only with clinicians, but maybe also patients, and increasing awareness about this type of testing and the importance of it. Um, so we've gone all the way around now back to, back to Zara. So I want to make a comment in response to what Dr. Israr said, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Isvan. Um, and it was your comment about um, accreditation, I believe. And I just want to share that what has really um, helped us um, develop as a section, uh, get our accreditations, expand, deal with, go from hepatitis to NGS, is the AKU system of competency-based accreditation mm. for consultants. And there's a process uh, by which there's training, uh, people are certified uh, under supervision, uh, there's documentation for it. So there's a formal process for people who have the educational credentials. And um, just like other people are, um, you know, going for ISO and JCIA and CAP, uh, they should be considering, institutions should be considering a formal process mm -hmm. so that they can have their own internal approvals also, but it needs to be a very robust process. So, Dr. Rizman, we're, we're now, well, you've heard I, so I'm, much, I'm you've heard so much. <laughs> no, <laughs> you've been so this, patient. This is really, really enlightening for me and learning experience for me also. And I, uh, to hear from the brightest and the best in Pakistan who are involved with this testing and training. So this is wonderful. And I'm a very practical person. So I want uh, Natasha, what you to do, or Farooq, is, is have a pencil and a page ready and write down some things. I think what uh, one comment before I you know, conclude my comments is this, the cost. Farooq said very well. You know how much the cost was for first human genome sequencing? It was $3 billion. $3 billion. First human genome was sequenced with, exp uh, with, with the expense of about $3 billion. And you know now what is the cost, average cost for human genome sequencing, well, human genome sequencing is not more than $3,000. So the cost has really, really decreased. And as technology develops, cost will continue to decline. So don't worry about cost at the present. I think the impact of molecular genetics and molecular pathology in human life is more important. 
I will also give you another example, which is my favorite uh, pitch in for any genetic stock is this, that is screening for genetic disorders. Pakistan is a prime example of autosomal recessive, uh, 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 you know, cesspool of genetic disorder in a sense that so many of autosomal recessive disorders are, uh, are, are, are common in Pakistan. And by sequencing three common genetic disorders, which is not cost, costly at all, uh, include uh, cystic fibrosis, fragile X, and SMA, for example, you can decrease the disease burden in our society. And I think that is what is needed for, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for, for molecular pathologists and geneticists to work on. I'm not sure if I'm still online or I'm off. Can someone say something? Okay, okay, because I lost my screen. So what I want to do is I want you to all to please go and see a website called PSMG, Pakistani Society of Medical Genetics and Genomics dot org, PSMG dot org. And this is a group of geneticists and molecular pathologists in US of Pakistani origin, which Zara and Dr. Kirmani are also very much part of it is to develop awareness or teach things which are important for genetics in common in patients, in uh, social groups, in doctors, in students, and with broad spectrum of people. And our next talk actually is on cardiac genetic basically. We have an expert from US who will be talking about how genetics is helping with the most common disease in Pakistan, let's say, uh, 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 cardiac uh, uh, genetic and how genetic is uh, contributing towards that. So another comment before I finish is that apply a artificial intelligence, someone mentioned that. So I think for molecular pathology part of it, without artificial intelligence, believe me, the cost of doing this business is exponentially increased. So we should encourage artificial intelligence. We should uh, we should learn and it doesn't cost human time. So it is in US, for, for example, human time is the most cost, costly uh, 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 not denominator. So in Pakistan, it, it's good that it's not, but still artificial intelligence will help tremendously in pathology field, as I see. But yes, it's coming, yeah, it's there and it should be adopted. So with that said, I think someone can what, what I suggest is this, with this elite group of people, what we can say that today we met and we should write a letter to the editor or white paper or whatever we call it and publish in, in Pakistani journal, Pakistan Medical Association journal, that as a group we get together, we discuss these ideas and this is what we think. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing you, so I just want you to, you know, speak up and disagree with me. I think it's very important. So if you don't want, if you don't think that is a right thing or there's another approach for that, come and say that. What I suggest is this, we as a group, that we should have a training program for technologists. There is no doubt. Without good technologists, this field or this discipline will not grow or will not be a popular thing. I think we, the, the good university like Afghan or Dao or any other universities, they should adopt a technologist training program and it should be both for infectious disease and inherited genetics. Number two, if anyone disagree, uh, no. you know, please. We, we have training, Dr. Yes. Rizwan, we, 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 we have training for uh, training programs for technologists. They are not formal qualifications, but it is, it is we have a yeah it is, a, it is yeah we we do uh, we do have a training program it's a one year training program but you know i think what rizwan is trying to say and and I, and I think i agree that you know it is um, i think that i mean we can't be speaking from both ends of our mouth i mean we already said that there is so many different technologies Okay, and, and there, it is so it is so intricate, and and yet we we you know we say that one year is is enough to do the training. I think that is so. 
yes, we do have a training program, but I'm a part of AKU, and I am the first to admit that at least in the field of molecular pathology, I don't think that that training is, is enough. You know, right, so that's what my point was, that having a master's program type of thing in or bachelor's program type of thing in university in the U.S., this is very common that you have to have a bachelor's or master's to get into a good technology. And some of the presentation I saw from technologists, they were excellent. They are very, very bright people. It's just a matter of structuring that and, and teaching them both inherited and genetic. The second point, I, I, I would, as a white paper, I would say we need to think about is medical school, school curriculum, right? I know there are not medical school leadership present with us, but we have, we, uh, as a society, as I mentioned, PSMG, we are just, uh, we're just submitting a paper about status of genetics and genomics training in medical schools from medical students' point of view. So we conducted a survey of over 600 medical students, and we asked them multiple questions about genetics, genomics, molecular pathology, and try to assess that what their, what their perspective is for the training and teaching. You will be, you will be seeing that paper soon in, in US uh, 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 for Pakistani, uh, from PSMG. We will, we will publish, we will let you know that also. So, but that, that need to go to that, that uh, uh, pitch need to go to medical school curriculum uh, training directors that yes, from starting from medical students, they need to be taught genetics and molecular pathology. Second thing is that there are good PhD programs in Pakistan. I have evaluated some of the PhDs students in different curriculums, but what is missing in genetics, for example, is as Farooq has said very well, that there is two, two sides, two coins of, the, uh, of molecular pathology in genetics. You cannot just do molecular uh, of infectious disease or with, uh, with inherited disease. They, these trainees have to be uh, balanced between the two. Actually, I would say three is ID is one, somatic disorder is the second one, and inherited disorder is the third one. Right, so that is that is that that type of structure need to be there in PhD training. Number four thing is this: residents and fellowships. There are many programs uh, where you uh, universities or hospitals they train residents, residency in pathology, and train fellowships in hematopathology and blood banking and so on. So all these residencies and pathology pathology fellowship. Uh, molecular pathology should be part of their training as a rotation, as a curriculum. And uh, as I said, the last thing was that really the comprehensive part of genetics, which is needed, includes include ID, somatic, and inherited disorders. And with that, if everyone agrees, if everyone, anyone has a difference of opinion, please say so. If not, I would say anyone from your Natasha or Zara or Farooq can take a lead or anyone else that yes, let's write a group consensus, a yes. white paper, a letter to the editor, saying that this is what we think is needed. Unless the power to be in, they'll know what we think, they will keep doing what they think is right. Thank you so that, much. I, Dr. Rizwan, you've just actually given us a, a brilliant idea and I think that's exactly what we need to do. We need to actually now put down this discussion in a little bit of a formal document and share it amongst all of us and, 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 um, and move forward on that. Um, I think we're running really late, uh, but I will give you an opportunity yeah. to just say, but just very, very quickly, um, the audience has been so amazing and listening. Anyone want to make a quick comment? Quick comment. Because this was all for all of you. This discussion is because we think it's important for you. Dr. Zuhair from uh, Dalai University of Health Sciences. Uh, quick comment on the Dr. Farooq Ghani statement that yes, we have seen the uh, end of uh, pandemic. We are seeing the uh, low number of uh, CV samples in lab. But yes, we have a silent pandemic in Pakistan in the, in the form of the genetic disorders. We are really seeing number of patients coming to, uh, to the clinics 
for different unusual and new disorders. So we need a, a excellent genomics lab here in Pakistan, and we need trained people to run that lab to report that disease from our own. Okay, do you want to respond? Yeah. So, um, so today, uh, or actually since yesterday, one of the main themes of this uh, PAP uh, symposium is the uh, metabolomics. You heard about metabolomics, okay? And I, I also spoke earlier at the metabol metabolomics section in chemical pathology. And we have president of, you know, International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and secretary who's over here. So, and I mean, you know, to, to give you some kind of perspective, how big this whole thing, and when I say proteomics, it is, uh, sorry, uh, metabolomics, it is really the omics. And um, if you look at the, the, the last 100 or 150 years, the, the events that has changed, you know, the humankind is, you know, first the Industrial Revolution and then the advent of automobile and, and aeroplane that changed us. And then the 70s and 80s saw the information, uh, you know, um, uh, era uh, and, uh, where with the advent of computers and internet and the cell phone, it really changed the way we work and live. There's a wide consensus that this century, from 2000 to 2050, will be the omics re revolution. Omics is the genomics at the top, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. That's the whole story. Starts from the genome, the transcription, the translation, and then the byproducts, okay? And, and this whole information is going to require. So metabolomics has taken off, okay? Genomics has already quite mature. I mean, now with the mapping of the human genome, I mean, that has already, you know, is, is there. So genomics has taken the lead, and you guys are a part of it. And there is going to be an explosion in the metabolomics. And that, uh, you know, uh, synchronization and collaboration between, you know, the top and the byproduct is going to, you know, you, you, you will have, need to have that. So that is, is, is I think, where there is another area yeah, that I think that you should be focusing, focusing on. And part of what the paper that I think is one was excellent idea of putting together white paper because I think it will put it in black and white, mm. and you know of of how and give a give us a roadmap act, actually, and and a consensus document as to how we are going to move on, uh, you know, the post uh, hepatitis and pandemic era. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Very last one minute, Dr. Israr. I'm sorry, we, we, we have to wrap up. We have to thank everybody. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, that was actually an idea we were just uh, discussing uh, that, uh, and I, thanks to Dr. Sabir and Dr. Jamal for the who actually pointed out and uh, provide the, this opportunity to start discussing this all matter. So I was thinking of uh, giving a reply to Dr. Sabah Jamal's editorial, who, which appeared recently. And I discussed with my teammate, I, this was my wish that the, there should be something in writing from AMPP rather than just me alone. That was again my wish to response to that editorial. So just coming to th uh, commits on two things, you mentioned that uh, the, our medical school should uh, uh, include. So the curriculum is there. I, I have to, because th that's a blessing that uh, I, I have a, uh, I'm surviving like I'm teaching medical students as well genetics portion of genetics and this oncology. So the b bad thing is their curriculum is updated, but the weightage is too less. They are they were asked just two questions from the whole Robbins about genetics, and most of the, what I have seen the attitude is they mostly they left those questions. So we need to uh, add more weightage rather than 
the curriculum is good i can see we need to add more things but weightage should be more because uh, then they they start thinking that this is really uh, in, in the need to excel this uh, discipline as well thank you very much everybody um dr rizwan as always it is just such a pleasure to uh, have you be part of any conversation uh, related to molecular pathology and we know it was very very early in new york so extremely grateful that you that you joined us at that time and okay. i apologize thank for the you. delay thank you everyone and the good thing about covid is that i can still be in my pajamas and do my talk <laughs> that is well that we, is, should we ask you to stand up part. and give a, give us a, can we ask you to stand up please <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank you so much, panelists, Dr. Javeria, Dr. Zara, Dr. Arshi, Dr. Salma, Dr. Saeed, Dr. Star, and Dr. Romina. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you, and I think that this is a fantastic idea that Dr. Rizwan has proposed. Dr. Ghani, thank you so much for chairing this session. We changed it a little bit last minute because we were running sh short of time. Um, we're going to try and fit in some of these talks tomorrow if we can. But thank you so much, and as a token of our appreciation for chairing this session, Dr. Hani. Um, Dr. Said, would you do the honors, please? Thank you very much. And audience, thank you so much, really. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow morning, nice, nine o'clock, please. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> nine o'clock, yeah, our session starts at nine. Please, please. <laughs>